Hello and welcome to this course on Hadoop. We are going to take a look at the, the Hadoop definition, so help tight and don't skip any videos. Hadoop is an open source software framework used for storing and processing large data sets. In this video, we are going to explore what Hadoop is and we are going to see how it works and its components and its applications. First, let's talk about what is Hadoop. Hadoop, as I told you is an open source software framework designed to store and process large amount of data in a distributed computing environment. It was initially developed by Dong Cutting and Mike Caffarella in 2005 and is maintained by Apache Software Foundation. The primary goal of Hadoop is to enable the business and organization to manage and analyze massive amount of data. It achieves this by distributing data across a cluster of common commodity hardware, making it scalable and fault tolerant. So how Hadoop works? Hadoop works by breaking down large data set into a smaller, more manageable chunks and distributing them on across a cluster of computers. Each node in the cluster can be processed the data in a parallel, allowing for faster processing time and increases the scalability. The heart of Hadoop is the distributed file system or HDFS, which stands for Hadoop Distributed File System, which is responsible for storing and managing data across the cluster. HDFS is designed to handle large files and can distribute data across across hundreds of even nodes, hundreds or even thousands of nodes. In addition to HDFS, Hadoop also includes the MapReduce Redu programming model, which is used to process the data in a parallel across the nodes in a cr cluster. MapReduce is based on two functions, Map and Reduce, which allows for data to, which allows us for data processing and aggregation. Hadoop is made up of several components including the HDFS as mentioned earlier which is a primary storage system used by Hadoop in it is responsible for breaking down data into a smaller one and MapReduce which is a programming model used by Hadoop for processing large data set in a parallel across the cluster and it works by dividing data into a smaller chunks and processing them in parallel across nodes. We also have Yarn which is yet another the resource navigator and it is responsible for managing resources in a Hadoop cluster. It all allocates resources into different applications running on the cluster and monitors their usage. Hadoop Common uh, contains common libraries and utilities used by other Hadoop components. So and one of the use cases of Hadoop is um, in the applications such as business intelligent area which can be used to store and analyze large amount of data making it ideal for business intelligent application. Fraud detection use cases is going to be analyzing financial data to delete fraud and other anomalies. Also the healthcare which is used to analyze medical record into a useful data and of Obviously, social media, which can use to be used to analyze, store, and gain insight into the user behavior and preferences. So, in conclusion, Hadoop is a pretty powerful tool for managing and processing large amount of data. It works by breaking down into a smaller chunks and distributes them into a cluster and across computers for faster processing time. And Hadoop is made of several components, including HDFS, MapReduce, Yarn and Hadoop Common and it is used for a wide range of applications from business intelligence to healthcare up to social media companies they all use Hadoop. So that's it for this video I hope you learned what Hadoop is and we will move on to other videos to learn about Hadoop in detail.
hello and welcome to this video in this video we are going to take a look at Hadoop ecosystem and its component and how they work together to manage and process big data Hadoop uh, is a framework that provides an efficient and a scalable way to store and process large data sets making it essential for data driven companies so let's dive into this ecosystem in detail the Hadoop uh, ecosystem is made of, of several co core components. Each plays a critical role in processing and management of large datasets. These components include HDFS, which stands for Hadoop Distributed File System that is designed to storage large data files across multiple machines. It provides a fault tolerance by replicating data across multiple nodes, ensuring that the data is not lost in the case of a node failure. HDFS is a critical component of the Hadoop system and it is responsible for storing and managing massive amount of data that Hadoop processes. Yet another resource navigator or YARN, it's a resource management system that is responsible for managing resources in a Hadoop cluster. It provides a way of managing resources required by by different applications running on the Hadoop cluster and YARN allows multiple applications to run on the same cluster making it efficient making it an efficient way to manage resources in Hadoop environment we also have the map readers which is a programming model used to progress large data set in parallel across multiple machines in a Hadoop cluster it is responsible for breaking down large data sets into a smaller chunks and processing them in parallel and then combining the result into a final output. We also have the Hadoop ecosystem components in addition to core components. The Hadoop ecosystem has several additional components that are designed to work seamlessly with Hadoop providing additional functionality and management for processing big data. These include Apache Hive which is a data warehousing tool that that provides a SQL like interface to Hadoop it designed to enable users easily query and al analyze large data sets and store their data and making it an essential tool for data analysis we also have the Apache pig and Apache pig is a high level scripting language used to process large data sets in a Hadoop and it provides a simple and efficient way to write MapReduce program making it an ideal tool for data scientists and developers. We also have Apache Spark which is an open source distributed computing computing system used to process large data sets. It provides a fast and efficient way to process data making it an essential tool for big data processing. We also have the Apache HBase which is a distributed X scalable highly available no SQL database that runs on top of the Hadoop. It's designed to provide real-time read and write access to large data sets making an essential tool for big data applications. We also have the Apache Storm which is a distributed real-time computing system used to process streams of data in a real time. It provides a way to process real-time data streams making it pretty essential for data driven companies. We also have the Apache Kefka which is a distributed managing system. It is used to handle large stream of data in a real time. It provides a way of processing and managing data streams in real time making it again pretty essential for data driven companies which nowadays are thriving. And we can deploy several different models depending on the requirements of the organization using Hadoop. These deployment models include one price deployment, 
and one promise deployment on one prize deployment in installing Hadoop on the organization on one premise deployment. One premise deployment involves installing Hadoop on the organization's own servers and managing the infrastructure in a house. This deployment model provides maximum control and customization but requires a significant upfront investment in hardware and IT resources. We also have the cloud deployment which involves running Hadoop in the cloud environment such as Amazon Web Service which is for short we can call it AWS and Microsoft Azure. Cloud deployment provides a flexibility and a scalability and resources can be easily scaled up to or, or down based on the organization need. This deployment model also eliminates the need for upfront investment in hardware and IT resources making it a cost effective solution for organizations. We also have hybrid deployment which is a combination of non-premise and cloud deployment. In this deployment model allows organization to take advantage of benefits of both deployment models while also addressing the challenges of each. And the Hadoop ecosystem provides several advantages for organizations including scalability and Hadoop is designed to scale horizontally which means that the resources can easily add it together to the cluster needed providing the ability to handle massive amount of data and it is pretty cost effective and it provides a solution for managing and processing large data sets as eliminates the need for expensive hardware and software licenses and it is a fault tolerant as I said which means is it is designed to stand human fault and continue operating even a node or a component if fails and it is pretty flexible which can be used for variety of applications making it useful for organization and company and it provides a real-time processing with the component of Ap Apache Spark, Storm, Kafka and using Hadoop you can process large amount of data in a real time providing a timely insight into the organization. So Hadoop is an ecosystem that is powerful for managing and processing big data and its co core components are Yarn, MapReduce, HDFS and a lot more that we are going to learn about them in the future videos. And that's it for this video on Hadoop ecosystem. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video. In this video we are going to discuss Hadoop architecture and we are going to take a deep dive into it. So Hadoop is a distributed computing framework designed to store and process large amount of data in a distributed parallel manner. It was developed by Apache Software Foundation and it is widely used by companies to store and process big data. The architecture of Hadoop consists of several components that work together to, provi to provide a a scalable and fault tolerant system. Hadoop distributed file system is a distributed file system that provides a readable and a scalable storage for large data sets. It consists of two types of node, a name node and a data node. The name node maintains the metadata of the file system while the data node stores the actual data. Yet another resource navigator or yarn is a cluster manager management technology in Hadoop. It manages resources in the cluster and schedules the task to be executed on the node. Yarn consists of two main components, the resource manager and node manager. The resource manager manages the resources in the cluster while node manages the resources on the individual node. We also have the MapReduce which is a programming model for processing large data set. It consists of two phases, the map phase and the reduce phase. The map phase process the input data and 
products key value pairs well the reduce phase aggregates the key value pairs and produces the final output we have also the Hadoop common which is a set of libraries and utilities used by other companies in the Hadoop and it includes the tools for distributing file system operations remote procedure calls and other common functions now let's go into more detail about each component so Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS for short is designed to store large data files into a distributed manner across multiple machines. The node name is responsible for managing and managing the metadata of the file systems, including the location of the data blocks and the permission for each file. The data nodes are stored in actual data and communicate with the name node to ensure the data is properly distributed. When a file is stored in the HDFS, FS is splitted into blocks of fixed size usually 120 megabytes or 256 megabytes and distributed across the data nodes in a cluster the name node keeps the track which blocks are stored in which data nodes and ensures that there are multiple copies of each block for a fault tolerance by default HDFS stores three copies of each block but this can be configured HDFS also optimize, is optimized for large sequential reads and writes rather than random accesses. This makes it well suitable for big data processing where data is typically processed in batches. Yet another resource navigator or YARN is a cluster management technology that provides a framework for running distributed application on Hadoop. It consists of two main components as I said before the resource manager and node manager. The resource manager is responsible for managing the resources in the cluster including memory, CPU, disk space and it retrieves the requests from resources from the various applications running on the cluster and allocates the resources into them. It also monitors the health and cluster and detects failures and the node manager runs on each node in the cluster and manages the resources resources on that node. It communicates with the resource manager and requests resources and reports on the status on the resources. It also manages the containers that run on the actual application process and also Yarn allows for multiple applications to run on the same cluster each with its own set of resources. This allows for efficient resource utilities and makes it easy to manage a large number of applications. Moving on to the map reduce the map reduce is a programming model for processing large data set it consists of two phases as i said before the map phase and reduce phase but we are going to take a more deep dive into it the map phase inputs the data in and divides it into chunks and process it in parallel across the nodes in a cluster each node applies the map function to the input data and produces the key value pairs as an output the key value pairs are then stored and shuffled into ensure that all of the values with the same keys are grouped together. In the reduce phase, the output from the map phase is aggregated across the nodes in a cluster. Each node applies the reduce function to the key value pairs to produce the final output. The reduce function takes in the key value pairs produced by the map function and produces a new set of key value pairs as an output. The map reduce is also well suited for processing large data sets because it can be easily parallel parallelized across multiple nodes in a cluster. The map and reduce functions can be written in any programming language which can make it easier to integrate with integrate with existing node. And finally we have the Hadoop common which is a set of libraries and utilities used by companies in the Hadoop and includes tools for distributed file systems operations remote procedure calls and other common functions and it also provides an interface for integrating with Hadoop and makes it easy to write applications that can run on any Hadoop cluster it also includes utilities for managing Hadoop clusters such as Hadoop shell and Hadoop archive so in conclusion the Hadoop architecture consists of several components that work together to provide a scalable and fault tolerant system for storing and processing
processing large amount of data. The HDFS provides a reliable and scalable storage. Yarn manages the resources in the cluster. MapReduce is used for processing large data sets. And Hadoop Common provides a set of libraries and utilities for other components to use. By understanding the architecture of Hadoop, it's important to build and manage the Hadoop clusters for developing applications that run on the Hadoop. So that's it for this video on Hadoop architecture. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. And we are going to have a more deep dive into Hadoop and its component in the later videos. So stay tuned and make sure to watch those as well. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video where we are going to take a deep dive into Hadoop Slave and Master Architecture. Hadoop is an open source distributed computing framework used for storing and processing large data sets. It is designed to handle big data and provides a parallel processing on a cluster of machines. The master and a slave architecture is a fundamental design in Hadoop. In this video, Video, we are going to discuss the various aspects aspect of Hadoop master and slave architecture. The Hadoop architecture is based on the slave and master architecture, which composes the two main components of the Hadoop master and Hadoop slave. The Hadoop master is responsible for maintaining and coordinating the entire Hadoop ecosystem, while the Hadoop slave executes the task assigned to it by the Hadoop master. The Hadoop architecture has three main components including Hadoop distributed file system, HDFS and is is a primary storage system used in Hadoop and it is responsible for storing data in a distributed manner across multiple nodes in a cluster. Yet another resource navigator or YARN is the job scheduler used in Hadoop and it is responsible for maintaining resources in the Hadoop cluster and scheduling the jobs to be executed. We have also the map reduce which if you are following the videos you have you know about which is responsible for processing data as stored in the HDFS by dividing data into a smaller chunks processing them into parallel on different nodes in the Hadoop cluster. The Hadoop master and a slave architecture is the backbone of Hadoop system. The master architecture the master and a slave architecture is based on the client server model where the client client sends a request into the server and the server responds to the request. The request of the master and a slave architecture comprises the two main components, the Hadoop master and Hadoop slave. Hadoop master is responsible for managing and coordinating entire Hadoop system and it has two main components including the name node and the resource manager. Again, if you're following videos, you know about them. The name node is responsible for managing metadata of the data stored in HDFS and it keeps a track of location of data blocks stored in the HDFS and mapping of the data blocks into data nodes. The resource manager is responsible for managing resources in the Hadoop cluster. It allocates the resources to the application running on the cluster and monitoring the resource use usage. We have also the Hadoop slave and about the Hadoop slave, the Hadoop slave executes the task assigned to it by the Hadoop master and it has two main components, the data node and the node manager. The node manager is responsible for storing data in a HDFS and it stores the data blocks on the logical disk and communicates with the main node to get metadata of the data block. About the node manager, node manager is 
responsible for managing the resources on the node. It monitors resource use usage on the node and reports the resource usage to the resource manager. So let's have a bit a bit of a deep dive into the master and a slave architecture. So you know by now the node name is the master node in the Hadoop system and it is responsible for managing metadata of the data stored in the HDFS. The metadata includes information about the location of the data blocks stored in the HDFS and mapping of the data blocks into data nodes. The name node stores the data in the memory and periodically writes it to the disk. And the metadata stored in two files in includes FS image and edits. The FS image file contains the snapshot of the metadata while the edit file contains the changes to the metadata since the last snapshot. If the node, if the name node fails, the entire Hadoop system becomes unavailable. To avoid this situation, Hadoop provides a mechanism called a secondary main name node, which periodically creates a checkpoint of the metadata and merges with the edits files to create a new FS image file. And resource manager is responsible for managing the resources in the into the Hadoop cluster. It allocates resources to the application running on the cluster, monitors the resource usage. The resource manager maintains information about the available resources in the cluster, including the number of nodes, memories, and CPU capabilities. The resource manager uses YARN framework to manage resources in the cluster. YARN divides the resources in the cluster into two types, including the node manager resources and the application master re resources. The node manager resources are the resources available on the node, while the application master resources are the resources required to run the application. We have also the data node which is a slave node in the Hadoop system as I told you and it is responsible for storing data in HDFS and the data node stores data in blocks on the lo local disk and communicates with the name node to get the metadata of the data block. The data node periodically sends heartbeat message to the name node to inform it about its situation. If the name node does not retrieve a heartbeat message from the data node for a specific period, it makes the data node as dead and replicates the data block stored in the data node to, the, to other nodes in the cluster. The node manager is responsible for managing resources in the node. It monitors the re resource usage on the node and reports the, reports the resource usage to the resource resource manager and the node manager starts and stops the containers which are the processes that execute the task assigned by the application master. And the node manager uses the Linux C groups which is for short of control groups to manage the resources on the node. C groups allows the node manager to limit the resources used by the container including the memory C CPU and the disk I.O. And uh, there are several advantages of Hadoop master and a slave architecture, including the scalability, default tolerance, and high availability. And in the scalability, we can say we can handle large data sets and we can easily sc scale them by adding more nodes into the cluster. And in the side of fault tolerance, if a node fails in the Hadoop, the data is stored in the node is replicated to the other nodes in the cluster. And in terms of high availability, if the name node fails, the secondary name node takes over the role of the name node and ensures that the Hadoop system remains available. And there is one more reason which is data locality, which it means that in the Hadoop slave and master architecture, we are going to get the data locality, which means that the data is processed where it's 
stored. This is a this reduces the network overhead and provides a performance for a Hadoop system. So in conclusion, we talked about the Hadoop master and slave architecture in pretty good detail. We have learned about the Hadoop architecture based on the master and slave and which comprises the two main components, the Hadoop master and Hadoop slave. We also discussed the advantages of Hadoop slave and master architecture, including their scalability, fault tolerance, high availability, and data locality, which is pretty important in many use cases. And it's a pretty powerful architecture, which most of the companies uses these types of systems and architecture so that's it for this video i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video on hadoop cluster mode and its type in this video we are going to discuss hadoop cluster mode and its different different types of cluster modes and how they work hadoop cluster mode refers to the way in hadoop distributes data and computes them across cluster a cluster of machines in simple term it is a way by of dividing large data sets into a smaller parts and processing them simultaneously across multiple computers there are three types of Hadoop cluster mode the local which is a standalone mode pseudo distributed mode and fully distributed mode first we are going to take a look at the local mode or standalone mode which is the simplest and the most basic mode on Hadoop in this mode Hadoop runs a single machine without any Hadoop demons running on the background it is mainly used for development and testing purposes and it is not suitable for processing large data sets as it can run only and handle data that can fit into the memory of a single machine the second mode is the pseudo distributed mode pseudo distributed mode is a second type of Hadoop cluster mode in this mode Hadoop simulates distributed environment on a single machine and it means that Hadoop runs a single machine but it runs all Hadoop daemons such as name node, data node, resource manager and node manager in the background just like a fully distributed cluster. This mode is main, mainly used for testing and debugging purposes and it can handle relatively a, a small data set as it can run on the single machine as it still run a single machine however provides a good simulation of fully distributed Hadoop environment and now that we mention it, mentioned it the fully distributed mode is most advanced and complex mode on the Hadoop in this mode Hadoop runs a cluster of multiple machines where each machine is running one or more Hadoop daemon this mode is used for processing large data sets as it distributes data and computation across multiple machines in this mode there is a master and a slave architecture and where machine act as a master and coordinates coordinates to work of all of their machines the master machines the master machine runs the name node and resource manager demons while the slave machine runs the data node and node demons and Hadoop cluster mode is a way of distributing data and computation across multiple machines. So in conclusion, we covered several types of cluster mode, lo local, pseudo distributed and fully distributed mode so that's it for this video on cluster modes in hadoop and i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video
Hello and welcome to this video about HDFS and how it works. In this video we are going to take a look at the distributed file system in Hadoop which is for short we call it HDFS and we will explain the various components of HDFS and how they work together and, and how they can provide a reliable, scalable and fault tolerant distributed file system. So let's have an overview of HDFS. HDFS HDFS is designed to handle large data sets and they are typically in the range of gigabytes up to petabytes. It is built on the master and a slave architecture where a single node acts as the master and multiple data nodes act as slaves. The name node manages the file system, metadata including the directory structure, file permissions and file to block mapping. The data node stores the actual data block and performs the read and write operations requested by the client. In HDFS the data is stored in block each which has a fixed size of typically 64 or 128 megabytes. These blocks are distributed across multiple nodes to provide fault tolerant and high availability. The replication factor determines the number of copies of each block that are stored in the cluster. The default replication factor is 3 which means that each block is stored in 3 different data nodes. When a client wants to read and write a file in HDFS, it communicates with the name node to get the information about the file location and block mapping. The name node responds with the list of data nodes that have the requested data block. The client then reads or writes the data directly from one from our data node. In HDFS, write operations are handled using pipeline mechanism. When a client wants, wants to write a file, first sends the data to the first data node in the pipeline. This data node then sends the data to the next data node in the pipeline and so on until all replicates have been written. Once all replicated have been written, and the client sends a confirmation message to handle the name node to indicate that the write operation has completed. Default tolerant and replication in HDFS is a mechanism that if the data node fails or becomes unavailable, the name node automatically detects the failure and schedules the replication of the missing block to other available data nodes. This ensures that there are always multiple copies of each block in the cluster even in the event of node failure. Additionally, HDFS supports a failure callback block level checksum and when a block is written in the cluster, the data node calculates the checksum for the blocks and stores it along with the data. When a client reads, date, reads a data block, the data node calculates the new checksum and compares it with the stored checksum. If the checksums do not match, the data node assumes that the block has become corrupted and reports the error to the client. So in conclusion, HDFS is a distributed file system designed to store and pro process large datasets in a reliable and fault tolerant manner and it is using the a slave and master architecture with a single name node and multiple data nodes to provide a scalability and high availability. HDFS stores data in a fixed, fixed size block and replicates these blocks across multiple data nodes to ensure the fault tolerant. With its pipeline mechanism, the block level checksum and replication features of HDFS are robust and reliable to distribute files across systems that can handle demands of big data processing. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.
Hello and welcome to this educational video where we are going to explore the concept of secondary name node and checkpointing in the Hadoop distributed system or HDFS. Hadoop is an open source framework that allows for distributed storage and processing large data set in a commodity hardware. Name node is the central component of the HDFS that manages the metadata in the distributed file system. The secondary node and checkpointing plays a crucial role in maintaining the name node health and performance in the HDFS. This is so what is the secondary name node? The secondary name node is a helper node that assists the primary node in managing the metadata of the HDFS. It does not replace the primary name node instead periodically retrieves a copy of the primary name node the space name, the name space image and edits logs and merges them also then sends the merged image back to the primary name node. The primary name node uses the uses this merged image to recover from the failure and to perform faster restarts. So how secondary name node work? The secondary name node periodically, periodically communicates with the primary primary name node to fetch a copy of its name space image and to fetch a copy of its name space image and edit log. The name space image contains the directory and file structure of HDFS while the log edit while the edit log contains the metadata that changes while the edit log contains the metadata changes that have occurred since the last name space image was taken. The second the secondary name node merges the edit log with the current namespace image and creates a new checkpoint image. Once the secondary name node has created a new checkpoint image, sends it back to the primary name node. The primary name node then loads its new image to the memory and discards the old one. The checking point process reduces the time required to restart the name node in the case of failure since it eliminates the need for it. So what is the checkpointing? Checkpointing is the process of creating in a snapshot of HDFS metadata at a regular interval to minimize the recovery time in the case of name node failure. The checkpointing involves creating a new namespace image by merging the current namespace image with the edit log. So now you might ask yourself how checkpointing works. Checkpointing is performed by the name node itself. It periodically creates a new namespace image by merging the current namespace image with the edit log. It then uploads this new image to the secondary name node for merging with the edit log. This process, this process creates a new checkpoint image that can be used for faster recovery in a case of failure. The checkpointing frequency is comfortable and depends on the size of the HDFS cluster and the rate of metadata changes. The default checkpointing frequency is set to one hour but it can be changed as per requirement. So the secondary name node and checkpointing plays a crucial role in ensuring the name node health and performance in HDFS. The secondary name node periodically merges the primary name node base image and edits the log to create a new checkpoint image which is used for faster recovery in case of failure. So in conclusion, checkpointing is performed by the new name node itself which creates a new namespace image by merging the current namespace image with the edit log. So by understanding these concepts, Hadoop administrators can ensure the name node availability and minimize the downtime in the event of failure. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any questions, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.
Hello and welcome to this video which we are going to discuss the HDFS data block and how it works. Hadoop is a distributed file system or HDFS for short and it is responsible for distributing file system that allows you to store large files across multiple nodes in a Hadoop cluster. The HDFS divides a large file into a smaller block and stores each block on the separate node. It provides a fault tolerance a scalable and re reliable way of storing and processing large data sets. In this video we will explain every aspect of HDFS data block and how they contribute to overall performance of the Hadoop cluster. So what is HDFS data block? In the HDFS large files are divided into smaller blocks and they are a fixed size. By default the block size in the HDFS is 1 128 megabytes whether you can change its default value suits your need however you can change its default value to suit your needs each block is assigned a unique identifier and stores on a separate node in the Hadoop cluster it allows HDFS to achieve fault tolerance as multiple copies of each block are stored in different nodes HDFS uses distributed architecture to store data blocks. When a file is written in HDFS, it divides into the block of the fixed size. Each block is then replicated on the multiple node in the cluster. The number of replicants is determined by the replication factor, which is configurable in the Hadoop. The default replication factor is 3, which means that each block stores on the three different nodes in the cluster. This provides redundancy and helps helps ensure that data is not lost due to the hardware failure. HDFS uses master and slave architecture to manage data blocks. The node is the master node in the HDFS and it is responsible for managing metadata for all files and data blocks in the system. The metadata includes information about the location of each block and the replication factor for each block. The data nodes are slave nodes in the HDFS and they are responsible for storing the actual data blocks. So how do HDFS data blocks contribute to Hadoop performance? They use HDFS data, the use of HDFS data blocks are, has several advantages for Hadoop performance. First, fixed block size allows for efficient data processing. Each block can be processed independently, allowing for parallel processing across a cluster. Second, the repli replication of the data blocks provides a fault tolerant and high availability. If the node fails, the system can still access data blocks from another node. Finally, the distributed architecture allows for a scalability. As the size of data grows, additional nodes can be added to the cluster to handle in increased performance workload. In summary, HDFS data blocks are a key component of the Hadoop distributed file system by dividing large data files into smaller blocks, replicating them across multiple nodes and managing them with the a master architecture. HDFS provides a fault tolerant, scalable and reliable way of storing and processing large data sets. The use of HDFS data block is essential to performance and reliability of the Hadoop making it a popular choice for big data processing. So that's it for this video on HDFS data blocks. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this educational video on HDFS replication. In this video we are going to have a deep dive into HDFS replication and we are going to explain every aspect of it. So HDFS replication is a key feature of Hadoop distributed file system or for short HDFS that ensures data durability and high avail availability in a distributed environment. So what is the HDFS? HDFS replication. The F HDFS replication is a process of creating and maintaining multiple copies.
copies of data across different nodes in the Hadoop cluster. The replication factor determine, determines the number of copies of data that are created. The default replication factor is 3, which means that 3 copies of each block of data are created and stored in different nodes in the cluster. So you might right now ask yourself, ask yourself how does the HDFS replication work? So the HDFS replication works by dividing data into blocks of fixed size and then replicating each block across different nodes in the cluster. The name node is responsible for managing the replication process. When a client submits a file into the HDFS, the node name creates a metadata about file, file name, including the replication factor and the locations where the block will be stored. The name node then assigns each block to the data node and ensures it to replicate the block to other nodes according to the replication factor. The data node stands, sends a heartbeat signal to the name node to indicate that it is still alive and reports any changes in the block list. If the data node fails or becomes unreachable, the name node detects the failure and selects a new data node to replicate the missing block. The name node also monitors the cluster for data in consequences for data in consequences and takes a corrective action if necessary. So the HDFS replication it's pretty important. So why it is important you might ask. First it ensures the data durability by creating multiple copies of data that are stored in different nodes in the cluster. This means that if a node fails or becomes unavailable the data can still be accessed from other nodes. Second, secondly, HDFS replication improves the data availability by allowing clients to access the data from the nearest data node. This reduces the ne network latency and improves the overall performance of the system. Thirdly, the HDFS replication enables par parallel processing of data by allowing multiple nodes to access the same data simultaneously. This improves the scalability of system and makes it possible to process large amount of data quickly and more efficiently. So in conclusion, the HDFS replication is a key feature in Hadoop distributed file system that ensures durability, high availability, and most importantly for many startups and companies, a scalability in a distributed environment. By replicating data across different nodes in the cluster, HDFS replication enables parallel processing of data and improves the overall performance of the system. So that's it for this video on HDFS replication. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about read and write mechanism in HDFS. Hadoop Distributed File System or for short HDFS is it provides a readable and a scalable storage for big data applications. In this video we are going to take a deep dive into HDFS read and write mechanism and explain every aspect of it. The HDFS write mechanism is a two-step process that involves writing data to the local file system and then copying the data to the HDFS cluster. Let's break this process down even further. When a data is written in HDFS cluster, it is first stored in the logical file system on the client machine. This is this local file system can be any file system that is supported by the client operation. The logical file system is is used as a temporary temporarily buffer to hold the data until it can be copied to the HDFS cluster. Once the data is written in the local file system, it is copied to the HDFS cluster. This is by this is done by taking the data into a smaller chunks and carrying each block to the cluster of HDFS. Each block is typically 64 me megabyte size or maybe 100 
120 megabytes 28 megabytes through this through although this can be configured by your needs during the day during the copy process the data is first written to handle written to the local file system on the hdfs data node and then copied to other data nodes in the cluster for replication the replication factors determine how many copies of data are stored in the cluster the default replication factor is three which means that each block of data is stored in three different data nodes in the cluster the hdfs read mechanism is a three-step process that involves localize involves locating the data in the cluster fetching the data and then running the data on the client so le let's take break down the process even further when a client requests a data from the hdfs cluster it first needs to locate the data this is done by creating the data node which contains the metadata for the hdfs cluster the metadata includes information about the location of each block of data in the cluster once the client is located has located the data it needs to fetch the data this is done by contacting the data node that has a copy of the block data clients reads the data directly from the data node over the network after the data has been fetched it is returned to the client the client can process the data as needed so in conclusion we explained to us the process for the data to, to writing data to the hdfs cluster and the three step process for reading data from the hdfs cluster i hope this video provided you with a better understanding of read and write in hdfs and if this video is informative to you and you learned something from it make sure to leave a thumbs up button and subscribe thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this tutorial on map reduce in this video we are going to take a look at what map reduce is and how it works map reduce is a programming model associated with implementation for processing large data set in a distributed computing environment in this video we are going to take a deep dive into map reduce explore how it works so what is map reduce map reduce as i said is a programming model for processing processing large data set in parallel across a large number of commodities commodity servers it was developed by google in 2004 to handle large amount of data in their search engine the basic idea behind MapReduce is to split up the large data set into a smaller chunks and process them in a parallel across a cluster of machines so how does the MapReduce work the MapReduce works by dividing the input data into chunks and de distributing them across a cluster of machines the map reduce framework then process these chunks in a parallel with each machine processing different chunks of data the framework consists of two phases the map phase and the reduce phase the map phase is the phase that each machine process its chunk of data and applies map func and applies a map function to it the map function takes the input data and process a set of intermediate key value pairs these intermediate key value pairs are then collected and stored by key the reduce phase is the phase that it's responsible to store intermediate key value pairs and process them by reduce function the reduce function takes a key and set of values associated with the key products produces an input value of value associated with that key and produces an input value the input value of the map function is then written into the file let's take a look at some examples to understand how the map reduce works suppose we have a large data set of cells data that we want to analyze we use the map reduce to produce this data and calculate the total cells for each product in this map phase 
each machine processes its chunk of data, its chunk of cells data and applies the map function to it. The map function takes an input data and produces a set of intermediate key value pairs where the key is the product name and the value is the cells amount. In the reduce phase, the stored intermediate key value pairs are processed by the reduce function. The function, the reduce function takes a key product name and the set of values is sales amount associated with that key and produces the total sales for that product. In conclusion, the MapReduce is a pretty powerful tool for processing large data set in a distributed computing environment. It works by dividing data into chunks and process them in parallel across a cluster of machines. The framework consists of two phases, the map phase and the reduce phase. The map phase on each machine processes chunk of data and applies a map function to it. In the reduce phase, the stored intermediate key value pairs are processed by the reduce function. So I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video on what is yarn and how it works. So in this video we are going to have a deep dive into yet another resource navigator or yarn for short. Yarn is a critical compo component of Hadoop ecosystem. It is responsible for man managing resources and scheduling jobs across, across a cluster of machines. In this video we are going to explore yarn and its architecture in the next video. Yarn consists of consists of three main components, the resource manager, node manager and application master. First, let's talk about the resource manager, which is a central component of Yarn and it is responsible for managing resources and, and scheduling applications. It runs on the master node and retrieves resource requests from the application master. The resource manager then allocates resources resources to the application master based on their requirement. It also monitors resource usage and handles the node failures. Also the node manager runs on, on each node in the cluster and it is responsible for managing resources on the node. On that node, it retrieves resource requests from the resource manager and then executes them on the node. The node manager also monitors the resource usage on the node and reports back to the resource manager. The application master is responsible for managing the cycle of an application. It is created when an application is submitted to Yarn and runs on the node in the cluster. The application master requests resources from the resource manager and then coordinates the execution of tasks on the node manager. The Yarn workflow consists of three main steps. The application submission, application master, creation and task execution. The first step in the YARN workflow is the application submission. When a user submits an application to YARN, it is sent to resource manager. The resource manager then assigns an application ID and creates an application master. Once an application master it is created, it requests resources from the resource manager. The resource manager then allocates resources to application master based on its requirements. The application master then communicates with the node manager to execute the task. The final step in YARN workflow is the task execution. The application master coordinates the execution of task on the node manager. Each node manager runs the task on the assigned node and reports back to the application master once it's completed. The YARN uses a pluggable scheduler that allows users to choose the best schedule for their needs. The two main schedulers are capacity scheduler and fair scheduler. The capacity scheduler is a, a static scheduler that divides resources between different queues based on the preferred capacities. Each queue is allocated a certain
certain amount of resources and jobs submitted to the queue can only use the resource allocated to that queue. The fair scheduler is a dynamic scheduler unlike the capacity scheduler and divide resources between queues based on the demand of the application. The queues are not allocated a fixed amount of resources but instead they share resource based on their demands. The fair scheduler ensures that each queue gets a fair share of resources. Yarn uses containers to allocate resources to the application. A container is a lightweight virtual machine that runs on the node manager. Containers provide a high level of isolation between different applications running on the same node and Yarn provides a several security features to protect against unauthorized access and data breaches. It uses Kerberos authentication to authenticate users and secure communication between components. It also uses the access control list or ACL to control access to resources and jobs. So in conclusion, Yarn is a critical component of Hadoop ecosystem and provides a robust and a scalable way of managing resource scheduling applications across a cluster of machines by identifying yarn architecture components, workflow, and also scheduling containers and security for users, and it can optimize their Hadoop, their Hadoop cluster performance and ensure the secure and efficient execution of their application. So that's it for this video on what is yarn. In the next video, we are going to focus on the yarn architecture if you if this video was informative to you and you learned something from it make sure to leave a thumbs up button and subscribe thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video on yarn architecture YARN stands for yet another resource navigator and it is a distributed resource manager system that is used to manage and schedule resources for big data processing. YARN is a part of Hadoop ecosystem and it was introduced in the Hadoop 2.0. YARN has revolutionized the way big data processing is, is done and it has become an integral part of big data processing framework. YARN has a master and a slave architecture where the master node is called the resource manager and the slave nodes are called node managers. The resource manager is responsible for managing resources and scheduling the jobs while the node managers are responsible for managing the resources on the slave node. The resource manager has two main components, the scheduler and the application manager. The scheduler is responsible for scheduling the, the jobs and allocating the resources while the application manager is responsible for managing the applications and resources that are being used by the application by those applications the node manager are responsible for managing the resources on the slave node they communicate with the resource manager to get the resources that are needed for the job and they are being run on the node slave the node manager also monitors a resource on the slave node and reports back to the resource manager. The yarn workflow can be divided into four stages. The first stage is submitting the job on the yarn system. The job is submitted to the applications manager which if the job has all of the necessary resources the application manager allocates the resources and starts the job. The second stage is resource allocation. The resource manager allocates the necessary resources for the job based on the requirements specified by the job. The resource manager also communicates with the node managers to get the status of the resources on the slave node. The third st stage is the job execution. Once the resources have been allocated, the job starts running on the slave node. The node manager also monitors the resources on the slave node and reports back to the resource manager. The the fourth stage is the application completion. Once the job is completed, the resource manager frees up the resources that were allocated for the job. The re result of the job are then returned to the application.
Application Manager which then returns the result to the user. Yarn has several benefits that makes it a popular choice for big data processing. Firstly, it allows for efficient resource utilization as it can handle multiple types of processing frameworks. Secondly, it allows better scalability as it can handle a large number of jobs at the same time. Thirdly, it provides a better way of managing resources based on the job requirements. So, in conclusion, Yarn is an important part of the Hadoop system that has revolutionized the, the big data process is being done. And it has a master and a slave architecture and with a resource manager and node manager that, that creates a workflow along with Yarn which makes it a pretty powerful and complete tool. So that's it for this video on Yarn architecture. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about what is Scoop. In this video we are going to discuss Scoop and how we can use it and how it works. A scoop is an important tool for these for those working in a field of data engineering and big data. So let's get us started because that's why we are here. A scoop is an open source tool that is used to transfer data between Hadoop and relational databases. It was originally developed by Cloudera but now is a part of Apache Software Foundation. Scoop stands for SQL to Hadoop and is used to import data from a relational database into Hadoop or export data from Hadoop into relational databases. So a Scoop is used for a number of reasons. The number one reason or the main reason is that it allows us to move data from a relational database to Scoop quickly and easily. It is important because a scoop is designed to handle large amount of data and it is often used for data processing and data analysis. By using a scoop we can move data from a database to Hadoop where it can be processed more efficiently. Another reason why a scoop is used is that it allows us to work with data that is stored in a relational database using tools that are designed for Hadoop. For example, we can use tools like Hive or Pig to analyze data that has been imported into Hadoop using scoop. We are gonna look at Hive and Pig in the later videos, but just know that they are useful. So a scoop works works by using JDBC or Java database comma connectivity driver to connect to a relational database. Once connected, Scoop can import data from a database into Hadoop or export data from the from Hadoop back to the database. Scoop supports a number of different databases including MySQL, Oracle, and SQL server, server. To import data from a database into Hadoop, Scoop uses a MapReduce job and as I told you in the previous videos, MapReduce is a programming model that is used to process large amount of data in a parallel across a cluster of computers. Scoop divides the data into chunks and then distributes those chunks across the cluster for processing. To export data from a Hadoop back to a database, Scoop uses a similar process. A scoop first divides the data into chunks and then sends those chunks to the database for insertion. A scoop also provides options for handling updates and deletations, allowing us to keep our database sync with the Hadoop data. In conclusion, Scoop is an important tool for anyone working in a field of data engineering engineering and big data. It allows us to move data between Hadoop and relational databases quickly and easily and provides us with the flexibility to work with the data in the environment that best suits our needs. If you are working with large amount of data, you need to move data between relational database and Hadoop. Then Scoop is definitely worth exploring and every single company that you get hired in uses scoop. So that's it for this video. We will explore other subjects in the later videos. If this video was informative to you and you learned something from it, make sure to leave a thumbs up button and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.
Hello and welcome to this video where we are going to discuss features of Scoop and how it works. Apache Scoop is a tool used for importing and exporting data between Hadoop and relational databases like MySQL, Oracle, and SQL Server. In this video, we are going to discuss the features of Scoop and how it can provide us features that are useful. First, we are going to look at connecting to multiple databases. Scoop allows connecting with multiple databases including MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server, and more, and many other databases making a versatile tool for transferring data. A scoop can process data in parallel allowing for faster transfer of data. This feature enables scoop to import and export data from a, da a database into Hadoop much faster, and it also provides us with automatic a schema recognition which is which means that automatically detects the schema of the data in the source database and maps it into the corresponding data types in Hadoop. This feature eliminates the need for manual schema mapping. It also provides us with incremental import which is a perform an incremental import of data meaning it can import only the data that has changed since the, la since the last import. This feature saves time and resources by only importing new or updated file and it also allows us to do customizable import and export. The scoop allows you to customize the import and export data including specifying the number of mappers that target the directory and the file format. The scoop architecture consists of three components, the client, the server and the connector. The client is responsible for initializing the scoop job, the server execute the job, and the connectors provide the interface between the scoop and the source database. When a user initiates a scoop job, the client uh, sends a request to the server to execute the job. The server then uses the connector to connect to the source database and retrieves data. The retrieved data is then transferred to the Hadoop parallel and the job is completed. Scoop allows for importing data from databases into Hadoop and exporting data from Hadoop to other databases. The import operation retrieves data from their source database, transforms the data into format suitable for Hadoop and stores it in Hadoop. The export operation retrieves data from the Hadoop and transfers it into a format suitable for target database and stores it in the target database. The scoop performs an incremental import by using a high watermark which is the maximum value of the column used to track the changes in the database in the source database. When a job is executed the a a scoop checks the value of the high watermark and import only the data that has changed since the last import. So in conclusion, a scoop is a versatile tool that allows the transfer of between Hadoop and relational databases. It features it features include connecting with multiple databases, supporting parallel processing, automatic schema recognition, incremental error import, and customizable import and export. A scoop architecture architecture contains of a client server and connectors and it, its job execution involves retrieving and transforming and storing data and so that's it for this video on features of scoop in this video we provided some information about its features in the later videos we are gonna take a look at scoop in a much more detail so stay tuned for that and if this video was informative to you and you learned something from it make sure to leave a thumbs up button and subscribe thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video, a Scoop Architecture. In this video, we are going to take a look at how a Scoops work. And you know, a Scoop is a tool designed to transfer data between Hadoop and relational databases or other uh, structured data stores. In this video, we will be mainly focus on the uh, Scoop uh, structure and its component. Scoop is a tool developed by Apache 
Software Foundation in the re recent years and it is used to transfer data between Hadoop and relational databases. The primary purpose of a Scoop is to move data between the Hadoop and external data stores such as relational databases or data warehouses. The Scoop provides a command line interface that allows users to interact with it and transfer data using various parameters and its options. A Scoop architecture is designed into three main components, the Scoop client, the Scoop server and the data connector. The client is responsible for interacting with user and accepting commands from the user and the command line interface allows user to configure and run Scoop jobs. The client accepts various parameters such as source database connection details, the target Hadoop cluster detail and job related parameter. The client also provides options to specify the import and export formats, the file formats and other data related options. The Scoop server is responsible for executing a Scoop jobs. It retrieves command from the client and then interacts with data connector to transfer data between source database and the Hadoop cluster. The server is also responsible for managing job executions, monitoring the job process and reporting the job status to the client. The data connector is responsible for connecting to the secure database and extracting data from it. It converts data into Hadoop compatible format and then transfer the data into Hadoop cluster. The connector supports various databases such as MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server and others. It supports various data transfer mods such as full node, increment mental node and parallel load. So how Scoop works? When a user submits a Scoop jobs, the following steps occur. Step 1 is the user runs a Scoop client and specifies the job parameters and options. The Scoop client sends the job request to the Scoop server. The Scoop server retrieves the job request and validates the parameter. The Scoop server server in the fourth step sends the job request to the data connector. In the fifth step, data connector connects to the source database and extract, extract data. The step six is data connector converts the data into a Hadoop compatible format. And in the eight, step seven, the data connector transfer the data to the Hadoop cluster. The step eight is the Scoop server monitor job progress and reports the job status to the client. The client retrieves job status and displays, displays it to the user. So that was all of the steps that are happening. Moving on to a scoop use cases, you know, one of them is merging data from a relational database into Hadoop. As I said, exporting data from external stores, data stores such as data warehouse or no SQL databases to Hadoop, extracting data from Hadoop extra external data stores, integrating Hadoop with legacy data systems, and finally the backup and recovery of the Hadoop data. So in conclusion, a Scoop is a powerful tool that enables seamless data transfer between Hadoop and external data stores. Its architecture is designed to prevent design to to provide efficient, reliable data transfer capabilities and I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any questions, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.
hello and welcome to this video about import and export in scoop in this video we are going to take a look at some scoop commands which include the export and import commands so in a scoop is a tool that is widely used to transfer data between Hadoop and relational databases in this video we are going to mainly focus on the commands and an overview of scoop so before we dive into the import and export commands and let's have a brief overview of a scoop. A scoop is an open source tool that is used to transfer data between Hadoop and relational databases. It provides a command line transfer command line interface to transfer data between Hadoop and structured data stores like MySQL, Oracle, and Postgres. To import the um, import a scoop command is used to import data from a relational database into Hadoop. So let's go through the syntax of the scoop command. Command. As you can see in the picture, in the left hand side, we have the import commands the connect JBC, the username root, password, ta table employees, and so on and so forth. so forth. The above commands import data from the employees table into the scoop database on the local MySQL instance. The minus M option specifies the number of map tasks to use for the importing to use for importing data. The dash dash target dash dir or dir option specifies the Hadoop directory where the imported data will be stored the dash dash fields terminated by option specifies the field delimiter used in the input data while the dash dash line terminated by option specifies the record delimiter used in the data used in the input data and the dash dash null string and and null non string option specifies the string representation of the null value in the input data. And about the export scoop command, the export scoop command is used to export data from the Hadoop from Hadoop to a relational database again. And let's walk through the syntax of the export command. So in the right hand side, you can see the commands, and the above commands export data from the again input employees directory into a Hadoop from the employees directory in Hadoop to the employees copy table in the scoop database on the local MySQL instance so the export DIR option specifies the Hadoop directory containing the data to be exported the input field terminated by and the input line terminated by options specify the field and record delimiters used in the input data pretty similar to the import so to wrap this video off the import on the import and export commands in a scoop we can say that scoop is a pretty powerful tool for transferring data and it is pretty easy to understand and learn you can read more uh, commands in the apache scoop documentation and so in this video we covered the basic syntax for import and export and i explained to you some commands and I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video on what is Flume. Flume or, or also known as Apache Flume is a distributed reliable and available system used to efficiently collect, aggregate and move large amount of streaming data from various sources to a centralized data store. In simple words, Flume is a tool used to ingesting and moving data from different sources to a central to a central location. Now that we know what Flume is, let's talk about its in architecture. So this is a brief overview of its architecture, but in the later videos we are going to dive even deeper into Flume architecture. Flume is divided 
into three components the source channel and sync so this source is the component in flume that is responsible for collecting data from different sources and flume supports various sources such as log file social media feed messaging system and the source sends the data to the channel for further processing the channel is the intermediate component between the source and sync it stores data retrieved from the source and makes it available to sync the channel also ensures uh, the data is delivered reliably and that has no loss the sync is the component responsible for taking the data from the channel and delivering it to the final destination the final destination can be a data source data store such as F HDFS HBase or Elasticsearch now that we know the component of flume let's talk about how it works the flume works on the principle of data flow the data flow from the source to the channel and then from the channel to the sink when a source retrieves data it sends it to the channel which stores the data temporarily once the channel has received the data it makes it available to the sink the sink then delivers the data to the final destination Flume uses an agent based architecture where an agent is a logical entity responsible for collecting and transporting data. The agent consists of the source, channel, and sync. Flume can also be configured to have multiple agents which can be deployed across multiple machines, making it distribu a distributed system. Flume also supports data transformation where data can be modified before it is delivered to the final final destination. The transformation is done by using an interceptor which is a component that modifies the data as it flows through the agent. So in conclusion for this video we learned about Flume is a distributed reliable and available system used to efficiently collect aggregate and move, move large amount of streaming data from various sources to a centralized data store. It has three components the architect component architecture source channel and sync flume works on the principle of data flow and uses the agent based architecture flume supports data transformation using interceptors and I hope this video was informative to you if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about Flume architecture. In this video we are going to have a deep dive into Flume architecture which Flume is a distributed reliable and available system for efficiently collecting, aggregating and moving large amount of data from various sources to a centralized data store and you know that if you watch the previous videos. But in this video we are going to have a much deeper, much deeper look into Flume. Flume consists of three main components, the source, channel, and sync. The source represents the point where data is generated and enters the Flume system. The channel is the intermediate buffer that temporarily stores data before it's passed into the sync. The sync is the final destination of the data where it's stored or processed. The Flume can be configured in two ways as a standalone agent or the distributed system. In the standalone uh, agent configuration, all three components, source, channel, and sync are located in a single machine. In a distributed system, each component can be located in different machines and allowing Flume to scale horizontally. And the source is the starting point of data flow in Flume. Flume supports variety of sources such as Avro source, which this source retrieves data in a Avro format, the netcat source which is going to retrieve data through the TCP connection, SYS log source which this one retrieves data in an SYS log format, and a spooling directory source. This source monitors the directory for file read for files and reads the files as they appear. Each source can be configured to retrieve data in a particular format such as S such as C 
PSV, JSON or XML. And channel is the intermediate buffer that temporarily stores data before it's passed to the sink. Flume supports various channel types such as memory channel which stores events in the memory and can cause data loss if the channel capacity is exceeded. We have the file channel. This channel stores the events on a disk which can provide durability and prevent data loss. We have also the JDBC channel. This channel stores event in a JDBC accessible database. The choice of the channel type depends on the use case and desired trade-off between the performance and reliability and the sync is the final destination of the data where it is stored and processed. Flume supports variety of sync types such as HDFS sync. This sync writes data to the Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS. We have also the Hive sync. This sync writes data into Hive table. Solar sync. This sync writes data to the solar index. We have also the Kafka sync. This sync writes data to the Kafka topic. Each sync can be configured to write data in a particular format, Avro, JSON or CSV. And we have also the agents and channel selectors. In a distributed Flume configuration, agents are configured to retrieve data from a particular source and forward it into a particular sync. The channel selector determines which channel events should be stored in before passing to the sync. The Flume supports a variety of channel selectors such as replicating channel selector. This selector replicates events to all available channels. We have also the multiplexing channel selector. This selector sends events to a particular channel based on a header or attribute in the event. So Flume as I said is a reliable efficient system for collecting and aggregating large amount of data. So in conclusion the architecture of Flume consists of three main components the source channel and sync and Flume can be configured as a standalone agent or distributed file system allowing to scale horizontally. The choice of source channel and sync type depends on the use case and the desired trade-off between the performance and reliability and that's it for this video on Flume architecture. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about what is Apache PIG and its architecture. In this video we are going to discuss the definition of PIG and we are going to have a deep dive into its architecture. The Apache PIG is a high level platform for analyzing large data sets that are stored in Apache Hadoop. The goal of PIG is to provide a high level language for expressing data analysis programs which can be executed on the Hadoop. So let's get started. Apache Pig is a high level scripting language for analyzing large data sets as I said. So it was developed by Yahoo in the year 2006 and later become a top level project of the Apache Software Foundation. The Pig is designed to work with Apache Hadoop and is often used in process of large amount of unstructured or semi-structured data. So Pig Latin is a language used to write pig script. It is a high level language that abstracts away the complexities of MapReduce programming and pig Latin consists of a series of operations that are changed together to create a large processing pipeline. The Apache pig architecture is layered which means that it composed of several components. The top layer is the pig Latin language which can be used to write pig script. The second layer is pig latin compiler which compiles the pig scripts into, the se into a sequence of map reduce jobs. The third layer is the pig latin runtime which execute the compile map reduce jobs on the Hadoop cluster. Finally the bottom layer is the Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS which stores data that is processed by pig. The pig latin supports several operations that can be used to process data 
data. These operations can be broadly classified into two categories, the relational operations and non-relational operations. The relational operations include operations like join, filter, group by, while non-relational operations include load and store. And PIG provides several advantages over a traditional MapReduce programming. The first provides a high level language that is much easier to use than MapReduce. Second, PIG abstracts away the complexity of MapReduce allowing developers to focus on data analysis rather than programming. The third is that PIG provides a wide range of built-in functions that and operators that can be used to process data. So in conclusion, Apache PIG is a high-level scripting language for analyzing large data sets and it provides a simplified programming model for data analysis and is often used in conjunction with Apache Haru. PIG Latin language is used to write PIG scripts that consist of series of operations chained together to create a data processing pipeline. PIG, as I said before, is a layer, has a layered architecture that provides a high level language compiler runtime and it provides us with HDFS for storing data. PIG provides several advantages over traditional MapReduce programming and it is pretty easy to use and reduces the complexity in a wide range of functions and operations. So that's it for this video on what is PIG and its architecture. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Make sure to leave a thumbs up button and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video where we are going to discuss Apache PIG and MapReduce. Apache PIG and MapReduce are two popular technologies used in big data processing. So let's begin by discussing what these technologies are and their fundamental differences. The MapReduce is a programming model that is used to process large amount of data in a parallel across a large number of commodity servers. It is a batch of processing model that breaks down the data into a smaller chunks and processes them in parallel. The result from the various computations are combined into generate a final output. The map reduce is based on two primary functions, the map function and the reduce function. The map function takes an input data and transfer it into key value pairs. The reduce function then, then takes these key value pairs and combines them to generate a final output. The map reduce is a low level program programming model that requires developers to write code in Java and Apache PIG is a high level platform for analyzing large data sets that is built on top of Hadoop. So this is, so it is a, a scripting language that provides a simpler interface to MapReduce programming model. With Apache PIG, developers can write scripts in language, in a language called PIG Latin, which is then compiled into MapReduce jobs by the PIG engine. The primary advantage of the Apache PIG is that it provides a high level abstraction over the MapReduce making it easier to write complex data processing pipelines. The PIG Latin provides a rich set of operations that can be used to perform a wide range of data transformation. Additionally, developers can write their custom operations to extend its functionality. So let's compare the Apache PIG and Map MapReduce. Now that we have a basic understanding of what MapReduce and Apache PIGs are, let's compare them in more detail. The MapReduce is a low-level programming model requires, that requires developer to write code in Java, while Apache PIG provides a high-level abstraction over MapReduce allowing developers to write scripts in PIG Latin. The MapReduce is a complex programming, programming model that requires developers to have a deep understanding understanding of Java and Hadoop ecosystem. Apache PIG is more accessible to developers who may not have such an experience with Java or Hadoop. About the flexibility, the MapReduce provides a high level degree of 
flexibility since developers can write custom code to perform any computation. Apache Pig provides a more constrained environment but it provides a rich set of operations that can be used to perform a wide range of data transformations. Writing MapReduce jobs can be time consuming and error prone since it requires developers to write a lot of boilerplate code and Apache Peg reduces the development time by providing a high level abstraction and simpler programming model. And about the performance which is pretty important for most companies, MapReduce provides a better performance since it is a lower level programming model that allows developers to optimize their code for the specific use case. However, the Apache Peg is still is a performance solution and it is suitable for most data processing use cases. And in conclusion, the Apache Pig and MapReduce are pretty powerful technologies and they are widely used in data processing, especially in big data. MapReduce is a low level programming model, as I said, and it provides a high degree of flexibility but requires a deep understanding of Java and Haru. The Apache Pig, on the other hand, provides a high level abstraction over MapReduce and it is more accessible to developers. Apache Pig provides a simpler programming model and a rich set of operations making it easier and faster to develop data processing pipelines. However, MapReduce provides a better performance and it is more suitable for a specific use cases that are required optimization. So that's it for this video. In the later videos we will be focus on the other aspects of Apache Pig and if you have any question put it down in a comment below make sure to leave a thumbs up button and subscribe thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Pig component. In this video we are going to explore various components that make up Apache Pig, a high level data processing language used to analyze large data sets. By end of this video we, are, we will have a better understanding of Pig component and how they work together to help process data. First let's take a look at what Apache Pig is. So if, if you watched the previous videos you know what Apache Pig is but I'm gonna explain again in brief if you forgot that. So Apache Pig is a platform for analyzing large datasets that are stored in a Hadoop cluster. It provides a high level language called Pig Latin which is used to write data processing programs that are executed on the Hadoop platform. The Pig Latin is designed to be intuitive and easy to use even for those who are not familiar with Hadoop or other distributed system. Now let's dive into the Apache Pig component. The first one is Pig Latin Parser. The Pig Latin Parser is the component responsible for interrupting Pig data scripts and converting them into series of map, map reduced jobs that can be executed on the Hadoop cluster. The parser is able to handle complex scripts and optimize them for efficient execution. The Pig Latin compiler, on the other hand, is responsible for taking the output of the parser and compiling it into executable map reduce jobs. It generates code that is optimized for Hadoop platform and can run efficiently on the large database. We have also the execution engine which is responsible for executing the compiled map reduce jobs on the Hadoop cluster and it is designed to handle large handle complexities of distributed system and ensure that the jobs are executed in the correct order with the current input and output formats. The Pig Latin is a high level language used to write data processing programs in Apache Pig and it is designed to be easily used and understand even for those who are not familiar with Hadoop or any other distributed system and Pig Latin is based on the SQL language and provides a rich set of operations for processing data. We have also the Grunt Shell which is a command line interface for interactive with pig and it provides an intuitive environment for executing pig latin scripts and exploring data in a Hadoop cluster. The grunt shell also provides a number of debugging and testing tools for working with pig scripts and we have also the UDF or user
user defined function which are a custom function that can be written in java or any other programming language using a pig latin scripts udf also allows user to extend the functionality of pig and create a custom operations for processing data this complement is particularly useful for complex data processing tasks that are not supported by pig built-in operators piggy bank is a default collection of user contributed functions and tools that can be used with pig which includes a wide range of functions for processing data such as regular expressions mathematical functions and data and time functions piggy bank is a great resource for users who want to extend pig functionality without having to write their own custom function so these are some various components that make up the apache pig as you can see each component plans an important role in processing data sets in a hadoop platform by working together these components provide a powerful and flexible tool for analyzing data so i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Pig data models. In this video we are going to discuss what Apache Pig is and its data models and use cases. So without further ado let's dive into it. Apache Pig as you might have known if you watched previous videos is a high level platform for creating MapReduce program used with the Hadoop. It was created by yahoo in the year 2006 and now is maintained by apache software foundation it provides a sql like language called pig latin to process large data sets there are two main data models in apache pig a relational data model and a nested data model the relational data model is similar to sql and it represents data as a set of tables with rows and columns in pig tables are represented as relation and each relation has a schema that defines the name and types of its column relations can be manipulated using relational operators such as filter group and join the nested data model in other hand is a data model that represents data as a nested structure such as arrays and maps nested structures can contain other nested structures creating and creating a tree like structure in pig nested structure nested data is represented using a bag tuple and map data types and nested data can be manipulated using operators such as flatten for each and generate Apache pig to use Apache pig you first need to write a pig latin script a pig latin script is a sequence of a statement that manipulates data in the script the script is then compiled into MapReduce jobs that can run on the Hadoop cluster there is an example of pig latin script that reads, reads data from a file and filters out a certain records and groups the remaining records by a particular field and then counts the number of records in each group and you can see that in the picture so make sure to read it pause the video and take your time to understand it if you know sql or python which you should know um you are going to easily understand these codes and if you don't understand them please just um first learn about sql and a programming language uh, such as python and then watch these types of videos because it's it is not going to be useful for you and in conclusion the apache pig is a powerful platform for processing big data using hadoop and by using pig you can write scripts that perform complex data transformation and analysis and then run them on the hadoop cluster to process large amount of data quickly and efficiently so that's it for this video on data models in apache pig if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video
Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Hive. So in this video we are going to cover the basics of Apache Hive and its features and it's a brief on architecture. In the later videos we are going to understand the architecture and other aspects of Apache Hive in detail. So Apache Hive is a data warehousing tool that provides a SQL like interface to analyze large data sets stored in the Hadoop desktop distributed file system or HDFS for short. It was initially developed by Facebook and later become a part of Apache Software Foundation. The Apache Hive is written in Java and it is built on top of the Hadoop ecosystem which includes the Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS and MapReduce. The, the Apache Hive provides several features that makes it a popular choice for big data analysis. So, of the key features of Apache Hive are SQL like interface which provides a familiar SQL like interface to query data stored in the Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS for short and scalability is a, a strong point in Hive which allows for large databases to handle their, their scale horizontally as the data volume grows and it will also is pretty good with data support data type support which supports variety of data types including a structured semi-structured and on a structured data and it provides a very good in integration with Hadoop ecosystem Apache Hive integrates seamlessly with other Hadoop ecosystem including HBase, Pig and Spark and Apache Hive also supports partitioning which improves the query performance by reducing the amount of data that needs to be scanned and let's have a brief on Apache Hive architecture which in the next video we are going to have a deep dive in. Apache Hive architecture consists of three main components the meta store which is a central responsibility that stores metadata about tables and partitions created in the hive this include the information such as table schema location of data files and partition keys we also have the query processor the query processor is responsible for parsing and executing sql like queries against the data is stored in the Hadoop distributed file system and finally the execution engine the execution engine is responsible for executing the query plan generated by the query professor it converts the query plan into the MapReduce job that run on the Hadoop cluster and Apache Hive has many use cases Apache Hive is widely used in various of industries for big data analysis some cases are business intelligent which is commonly apache hive hive used for and applications of business intelligent or bi need to perform ad hoc queries and generate reports on a large data set which apache hive is pretty good for and it also it is good for data warehousing which is used as the data warehousing tool to a store manage and analyze a structured semi structured and unstructured data and Apache Hive is used as an ETL or extract transform load tool to extract data from various sources and transfer it and load it into the Hadoop distributed file system for analysis Apache Hive is used in data science applications to explore and analyze large data sets in to identify trends and patterns and in conclusion the Apache Hive is a pretty powerful data warehousing tool that provides a SQL like interface to analyze large data sets stored in the Hadoop distributed file system and its scalability data support and, and integration with other Hadoop ecosystem tools making it a popular choice for big data analysis Apache 
high visa is structured based based on the three main component the meta store query processor and execution engine the and finally the apache hive has various use cases including business analysis data warehousing etl and data science as i told you before so that's it for this video on apache hive if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video where we are going to discuss the difference between pig latin and hive ql into the world of big data there are multiple ways to process and analyze large databases two popular technologies will be the apache pig and hive ql both pig and hive ql are high level languages that enable data analysis and developers to write complex queries without having to worry about underlying details of distributed computing in this video we will be discussing the difference between these two technologies so first what is apache pig apache pig is a platform for analyzing large databases and it provides a high level language called pig latin and it is designed to work with the haru pig latin enables users to write map reduce programs with Without need for java coding the language is designed to be simple and easy to use allowing developers to write complex queries quickly peg latin is built on top of the hadoop which means that it can easily handle large data sets so what is hive ql hive ql is another platform for analyzing large data sets it is built on top of the hadoop and provides a sql like language called hive ql the Hive QL is similar but is designed to work with Haru. The Hive SQL queries convert are converted into map reduce jobs that are executed on the Haru. Hive is ideal for data analysis who are familiar with SQL and they want to work with large data sets. So what is the difference between Pig Latin and Hive QL? Well, Pig Latin and Hive SQL are designed for large data sets there are some significant differences between the two one of the main differences is the syntax the pig latin is a procedural language meaning that it requires users to define the step for data processing in contrast the hive ql is a declarative language meaning that it allows users to specify the output they want without worrying about the steps required to achieve that output another difference between pig latin and hive ql is the high level of abstraction pig latin is a higher level language than hive hive ql which means that the abstractions more of the underlying details of the direct distributed computing the pig latin is defined to be simple and easy to use while the apache apache hive ql is more similar to sql and requires requires users to have a deeper understanding of the distributed computing so when to use pig latin and when to use hive sql the decision to use pig latin or hive sql depends on the specific use case the pig latin is ideal for an data analysis and developers who want to write complex queries easily it is also a good choice for a task that require a lot of data processing as pig latin can handle large data sets efficiently in other hand the hive sql is a good choice for data analysis who are familiar with sql and they want to work with large databases hive ql provides a sql like syntax that is familiar to many users making it easy to learn and use hive ql is also a good choice for adhoc queries or for tasks that require more fine grained control over the data processing so in conclusion the both apache pig and hive ql are an excellent choice for working with large data sets pig latin is a high level 
a language that abstracts over the underlying details of the distributed computing, while the HiveQL is more similar to SQL. Query users to have a deeper understanding of the distributed computing. The choice between Pig Latin and HiveQL depends on the specific use case and the user familiarity with each language. So I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Hive architecture. In this video we are going to have a deep dive into architecture of Apache Hive and if you're following the videos you know Apache Hive is the most popular data warehousing solution for data for big data processing. Apache Hive is built on top of Hadoop distributed file system or HDFS for short and it is designed to provide a SQL like interface query for analyzing large data sets as stored in a HDFS. So let's get started. Apache Hive was developed by Facebook and later donated to the Apache Foundation software. Hive supports various data formats such as CSV, JSON and Avro and also supports multi-processing engines such as MapReduce, Spark and Tease. The main component of, Ap of Apache Hive are the Meta Store which is a central repository that stores metadata about Hive tables partitions there and partitions their locations and it is implemented using relational database such as MySQL, Postgres, SQL and MetaStore is responsible for managing the schema of Hive tables and it provides the API to access metadata. Hive server is a service that provides the SQL like interface to interact with Hive and accept requests from clients and process them using an extension engine. Hive server can run into two modes, the Thrift server and HTTP, HTTP server. And we have also the executions engine which is responsible for executing Hive queries. The Hive supports multi-execution engine such as MapReduce, Spark and Tease. The choice of the execution engine depends on the type of query and the characteristics of data. And and let's dive in live let's dive deeper into meta store which is a component of the hive architecture as i told you before and meta store is a central repository that stores metadata about hive tables partitions and their locations and it is implemented using a relational database such as mysql and postgres and moving on to the important aspects of meta store which the first one is metadata storage and meta store stores metadata about hive tables their partition and their location and stores information about data columns data type and constraints meta store supports different types of metadata storage such as embedded local and removed and we have also the schema management which meta store manages the schema of the hive tables and it provides a central repository to define and manage the schema of the tables the metadata also meta store also supports partitioning of the tables which provides a query performance we have also the metadata access which meta store provides an api to access metadata it allows user to query metadata using an sql like syntax and users can also modify metadata using an api we have also the Hive execution engine as I told you before. The Hive execution engine is responsible for executing Hive queries. Hive supports multi multiple execution engines such as MapReduce, Spark and Tez. The choice of execution engine depends on the type of query and the characteristics of data. And here are some aspects of the execution engine. The execution engine co compiles 
files, hive queries into series of MapReduce or these jobs. It optimizes the query plan to minimize the data movement and maximizes the and parallelism. And the execution engine executes hive, squ hive queries using the selected execution engine and it manages the execution of MapReduce or test jobs and collects the result. And the execution engine processes the data using a selected execution engine and applies the transformations such as filtering, grouping, and aggregation on data. Lastly, let's talk about the Hive server component of our Hive architecture. The Hive server is a server, again, that provides a SQL-like interface to interact with Hive. It accepts queries from the client and processes them using the execution engine, and Hive server can run into two modes, the Thrift server and HTT server. So we are going to take a deep dive into HTTP and a Thrift server. The, the Hive server can run in Thrift server mode, which provides a Thrift API to interact with Hive. The Thrift is a cross-language framework for building remote procedure call or RPC service. It enables clients to communicate with Hive server using a variety of programming languages and about the HTTP server, Hive server can also run in the HTTP server mode which provides a re reset API to interact with Hive and reset is a web server architecture that is used to architecture that uses HTTP methods such as get, post, put and delete to interact with resources and it enables clients to communicate with Hive server using HTTP requests. The authentication and authorization on the Hive server uses the Kerboos, LDAP, and SQL standard based authentication. It allows administrators to control and access Hive resources and ensure data security. So, in conclusion, the Apache Hive is a pretty powerful data warehousing solution that provides the SQL like interface to query and analyze large data sets, data sets and S stored in the HDFS. So that's it for this video on Hive architecture. In the later videos, we are going to move on to other topics that are pretty important. So if you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Hive component. In this video we are going to discuss the components of Apache Hive and how they work together and why they are important in big data processing and big data analysis. So Apache Hive is a data warehouse infrastructure that provides data summarizing, query and analysis. It is built on top of the Apache Hadoop and allows SQL queries to be executed on the Hadoop distribution file system or HDFS for short. Ha Hive provides a simple and easy to use interface to interact with Hadoop data, making it accessible to users who are not familiar with Hadoop ecosystem. Now let's dive into component of Apache Hadoop. First we are going to take a look at the Hive Meta Store. And the Hive Meta Store is a central repository of metadata for Hive and it stores information about tables, partition and other metadata that is used used by the Hive query engine. The meta store provides an undefined view of the data stored in the HDFS making it easy to query and analyze data across multiple tables and databases. The meta store can be configured to use different backends such as MySQL or PostgreSQL into the meta store to store metadata. It is also possible to use share, shared meta store for multiple Hive in instances allowing, allowing for easier management of metadata across multiple clusters. The Hive query engine, in other hand, is responsible for processing Hive QL queries and generating MapReduce jobs that execute on the Hadoop cluster. Hive QL is a SQL-like language that is used to query data stored in the Hadoop. The query engine translates Hive QL queries into MapReduce jobs 
jobs that can be executed on the cluster. The query engine so supports wide range of operations and functions allowing users to perform complex analysis on large data set. It is possible to op it also provides optimizations such as query planning execution which improves the query performance. The Hive driver is also a component that retri retrieves a Hive queries from the user and communicates with, with the Hive query engine to generate MapReduce jobs. The driver also handles the result of the queries and returns them to the user. The Hive driver is responsible for parsing the SQL queries and validating them before they are sent to the query engine. It also handles query execution errors and provides a detailed error message to the user. And the Hive CLI or command line interface is a command line tool that allows users to interact with Hive using Hive QL, QL queries. The CLI provides a simple interface for users to execute queries, manage metadata, and perform other administrative tasks. The CLI also provides a history of previously executed queries, making it easy to reuse and modify queries. It also supports tab completion and syntax highlighting and other features that make it easy to write and execute Hive QL queries. The Hive web, uh, web interface is a web web based tool that allows users to interact with Hive using the web store. It provides a graphical interface for executing queries, managing metadata and performing administrative tasks. The web interface is built on top of the Hive CLI and provides many of the same syntax and features provides many of the same features such as query history and syntax highlighting and it also provides additional features such as visualization data exploration tools making it easier to analyze and understand large data sets so in conclusion the apache hive is a powerful data warehouse infrastructure that provides a simple and easy to use interface for querying and analyzing data as stored in the Hadoop. Its component or we can name some couple of components such as query engine, driver, CLI, the driver and CLI and web interface and they are working together to provide undefined view of the metadata making it accessible to users who are not familiar with Hadoop ecosystem. By understanding the component of Apache Hive is essential for anyone who wants to work with big, da big data and perform complex analysis on large data sets. And I hope this video provided you with a detailed overview of component of Apache Hive and their importance in the world of big data. So thanks for watching and stay tuned for other videos. Make sure to watch them as well. And if you like this video, make sure to leave a thumbs up button and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Hive Meta Store. In this video, we are going to cover everything you need to know about Met Hive Meta Store, including its purpose, architecture, and how it stores messages, store and manages Hive tables. So, what is Apache Hive Meta Store? Apache Hive Meta Store, or HMS, is a service that stores metadata related to Apache Hive and other services in the backend of RDBMS. Its primary function is to manage the metadata for Hive tables, including their definitions, column names, data types, and components in a centralized schema repository. Other services such as Impala, Spark, Ranger are also shared the same meta store. And about the architecture, HMS interacts with other services including Hive Server, Ranger, and NameNode, and the NameNode represents the HDFS. Clients such as Beeline, Who, JDBC, and Impala shall make, make a request through Thrift or JDBC to the Hive server which in turn reads and writes data from the HMS. HMS stores metadata in a backend of RDBMS such as MySQL and Postgres and all HDMS instances use the same backend database. By default read by default the redundant HDMS operates
operates in active and inactive mode and all connections are returned to a single RDMS service at any given time. The HMS talks to the name node over the thrift and functions as a client to HDFS. The HMS also connects, the HMS also connects directly to the ranger and the name node uh, of HDFS and also does and so does the Hive server but this is not shown in the diagram for simplicity. We have also the table storage when, and when you run a create table statement or more merge a table to the Cloudera data platform, the success or failure of the statement and the resulting table type and the table location depends on the number of factors. HMS includes the following Hive metadata about the table that you want to create, the table definition, the column name, data types and comments in a centralized schema repository. When you use the external keyword in the create table statement, HMS stores the tables as an external table. When you omit the external keyword and create a managed table or ingest a managed table, HMS might translate the table into an external table or the table creation can fail depending on the table property. And the ACID and non-ACID table types are important table properties that affect table transformation and it is pretty important concept in MetaStore. And non-ACID tables properties do not contain any ACID related properties set to the true such as transactional equal true or instant insert only equal to true. The ACID tables properties contain one or more ACID properties set to true and the full ACID table properties contain the transactional equal true but not the insert only true. The insert only ACID table properties contain the insert only equal to true and the HDMS detects the types of the client for intercepting for interacting with HMS for example the Hive or a Spark and compares the capabilities of the client with the table requirement. HMS performs different actions depending on the result of the comparison. In conclusion, the Apache Hive Metastore is an essential server for managing metadata and, rela and related to Hive and other services. It interacts with other services such as Hive Server, Ranger and NameNode that represents HDFS to manage the metadata for Hive tables. When creating or merging Hive tables, it's important to understand the table properties and how they affect table transformation. With the information in this video, you should have a better understanding of the purpose and architecture of Hive MetaStore and how it stores and manages Hive tables. So that's it for this video. If you learned something from this video, make sure to leave a thumbs up button and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video we are going to discuss the Apache Hive data model. So Apache Hive is a data warehousing tool built on top of Hadoop which allows users to query and analyze large data sets stored in Hadoop distributed file system. Hive provides a SQL like interface query data to query data stored in the Hadoop and is especially useful for processing a structured and semi-structured data. The Hive data model defines the way data is organized organized and stored in the Hive tables and in this video we are going to discuss every aspect of it. The Hive table is the most basic building block of Hive data model and Hive tables are similar to tables in a traditional relational database but the main difference being that they are stored in the Hadoop distributed file system and Hive tables can be created using the Hive query language which is a SQL 
like language that allows users to defer a structure the a structure of the table including the column name data type and a storage format and about partitioning um, we can say partitioning is a key feature of hive data model which allows data to be split into a smaller more manageable pieces and partitioning partitioning can be done on any column in hive table and it is especially useful for organizing data by time location or any other category categorical variable when a table is partitioned hive creates subdirectories in hadoop distributed file system with each subdirectory containing data for a particular partition we also have the bucketing and it's an another important feature of hive data model which allows data to be grouped into a smaller more manageable files and bucketing is sim similar to partitioning but instead of splitting data based on a categorical variable data is grouped into bucket based on a hash function applied to one or more column in a table bucketing is useful for reducing the number of smaller files into Hadoop distributed file system which can improve the query performance which can improve the query performance we have also the data types which hive supports a wide range of data types including primitive data primitive types such as int string boolean as well as the complex types such as a struct map and array hive also supports the user defined function which allows users to define their own custom data types and functions and the about the storage formats hive supports a variety of storage formats including test sequence file orc and and parquet and parquet are more efficient for processing large data sets or parquet each storage format has its own advantages and disadvantages depending on the specific use case text is a simple human readable format that is easy to work with while the orc and parquet are more efficient for processing large data sets so in conclusion hive tables partitioning bucketing data types and storage formats are all key components of hive data model and understanding them is essential for working with hive and haru if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about Apache HBase and its architecture. In this video we are going to take a look at what is Apache HBase and its architecture in detail. So Apache HBase is a NoSQL distributed database that is designed to handle large amount of structured data across cluster of commodity hardware. It is based on a Google Big Table design and provides a fast real time read and write access to data in this video we are going to take a closer look at what apache hbase is and its architecture so apache hbase is an open source column oriented database that is built on top of the apache hadoop and it is designed to handle large volume of structured data with high throughput and low latency hbase is commonly used in applications where fast access to large large amount of data is required such as social media financial services and a lot of e-commerce websites and about the hbase architecture hbase has a master and a slave architecture where hbase master node controls the cluster and manages metadata about the distributed data while the hbase hbase region servers store and serve the data and about the zookeeper which is pretty important but we are gonna more focus on it in the later sections of this course and before we dive into HBase architecture it is pretty important to mention the zookeeper zookeeper is a distributed coordination server that is used to manage the state of HBase cluster the zookeeper is responsible for maintaining configuration information naming and providing distributed synchronization and group service it is also used to detect and cover from the failures in a HBase cluster and we have a, we have something called HBase 
HBase master node, which is responsible for managing the HBase cluster. It maintains the metadata about the distributed data, such as table schemas, table regions, and their locations in the cluster. The master node is also responsible for assigning regions to region servers and monitoring the health of a region server. In addition, the master node can be used to perform administrative tasks such as creating or deleting tables, altering schemas, and adding or removing column families. The HBase region servers stores and serve the data. Each region server is responsible for a set of HBase region. A region is a contagious range of rows in a table, and each region is stored on a single region server. The region servers are responsible for serving, reading, and writing requests from the data in the regions, and they are also responsible for managing data in the regions, including compacting, splitting region as needed. And about the HBase Zookeeper Quorum, which is another topic that you should know, is that the quorum is a group of Zookeeper nodes that are used to manage the state of the HBase cluster. The quorum queries ensure that there is always a majority of Zookeeper nodes available to make decisions about the state of the cluster. This ensures that the cluster can continue to function even if the Zookeeper nodes are failing. But as I said before, we are going to take a look at Zookeeper in a much, much deeper um, in, the, in the later videos. So stay tuned for those videos. And the HBase client is used to interact with HBase cluster. Clients can be written in a variety of programming languages, including Java, Python, and Ruby. The HBase clients interact with the HBase master node to obtain information about the location location of the data to submit read and write requests to the appropriate region servers. In summary, the Apache HBase is a distributed NoSQL database that is designed to handle large amount of structured data. It is a structured, its architecture is based on a master and a slave model where HBase master node manages the cluster and the HBase region servers store and serve the data. The zookeeper is used to manage the state of the cluster and ensures that it continue to function even if some nodes fail. With its fast access to large amount of data, HBase is an excellent choice for handling applications where real-time read and write access to data is required. So that's it for this video on what is Apache HBase and its architecture. In the later videos, we are going to move on to Apache HBase in more detail. So if you if this video was informative to you and you learned something from it, make sure to leave a thumbs up button and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video where we're going to discuss the HBase physical storage. In this video, we're going to discuss the basics of physical storage architecture and we will also talk about the different components of HBase storage and how they work together. HBase is a distributed, scalable, and fault tolerant NoSQL database built on top of the Hadoop distributed file system. And you know all of these if you watch the previous videos, so we will move on to HBase physical storage architecture. The HBase physical storage is made up of two components, the H files and the MIM store. H files are immutable files that store on data store data on disk and they are created when a data is flushed from the mem store to the disk. The mem store is in the memory data a structure that stores data temporarily before is flooded to the disk. The mem store is divided into different regions and each region associated with the specific column family. When data is written into HBase, it is first written to the mem store. Once the mem store reaches 
reaches a certain threshold, it is flushed to the disk in the form of edge file. The edge files are stored by row key and stored on the disk. Each edge file contains a range of row keys and columns, families. Edgebase also has a distributed architecture where data is positioned into different regions based on the row keys. Each region is managed by a region server which is responsible for handling reading and writing requests from a region. The component of Edgebase physical storage are Edgebase files that are immutable as I said and they are stored by the row key is stored in the HDFS and the HDFS and H file contain data for a specific column family and a range of row keys. We have mem store which is in the memory data structure that stores data temporarily before it is flushed to the disk again as I said before and we have the region which is the partition of the H base table that is managed by the region server. Each region is associated associated with a specific range of row keys. We have the re region server. The a region server is responsible for managing a region of the HBase table and it handles read and write requests from a region. We have the HDFS which is underlying file system used by the HBase, HBase to store data on a disk. And about working with HBase physical storage, the, when data is written to HBase, it is first written to the mem store. The mem store is an in-memory data structure that stores data temporarily before it's flushed to the disk. It each mem store is associated with a specific column family. When a mem store reaches a certain size threshold, it is flushed to the disk from an H file. The H files are stored in a row key and is stored in the HDFS. Each HD each H file contains a range of row keys and column families. When a read request is made, the region server is responsible for that region that retrieves the H file containing the request, row keys, and returns the result. So, in conclusion, HBase physical storage is the underlying storage of layer of the HBase layer of HBase that stores data on a disk is made up of two components, the H file and the mem store. The H files are immutable files that store data on a disk and mem store is a built-in memory data structure that stores data temporarily before it's flushed to the disk. And HBase is a distributed architecture where it's positioned into different region based on keys and each region is managed by a region server where data is written to HBase and first written when a data is written to HBase is first written in mem memstore and when the memstore reaches a certain size threshold it's going to get flushed and I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about compaction in Edgebase. In this video we are going to discuss the basic basics of compaction and its type and how it works in Edgebase. And compaction is a process of merging smaller files into a larger file. It's an essential part of data storage in distributed system like Edgebase. And in Edgebase data is stored in a form of edge files which are immutable and they can be written sequentially. When we write data into edge base, it creates a new edge file which can lead to creation of many small files. These small files can cause performance degradation while scanning data. Compaction is a process of merging these small files to a larger file to improve to a larger file to improve 
improve the read and write performance. And there are a couple of types of compaction. We have the minor compaction, which merges merges a small number of files into a single H file and is triggered when a number of H files reach a configurable threshold. We have the minor and the minor compaction is a lightweight process and does not require much system resources. On the other hand, the major compaction mer merges all files in a H region, all H files in a region into a single H file and it is more intensive process and requires more system resources than minor compaction. The major compaction is triggered when the number of H files in a region exceeds a configurable threshold and the compaction in HBase is performed by HBase region server. When a compaction is triggered, the region server selects the H file to merge based on their age, size and other factors. Factors. The server then creates a temporarily, temporarily edge file. Once a server has created the temporarily file, it's then it's then perform a compaction by merging a new edge file with the existing edge file. In the target region during the merge process, HBase ensures that data in in the new edge file is a stored, so they are resulting in a sorted way. Sorting is important because because HBase stores data in a lexicographical order based on row key. And when a data is stored in order, it becomes easier to search and retrieve data based on a specific row keys. In addition to sorting, HBase also removes duplicated data during the compaction process. If there are multiple versions of same row key in different edge files, the HBase selects the most recent version and discards the old order older versions. The compaction can be triggered in several ways. One of one common way is setting the time threshold or a size threshold. For example, if the size of the edge file in the region exceeds a certain threshold, edge base will automatically trigger a compaction to reduce the number of edge files. Similarly, if the time since the last compaction exceeds a certain and threshold, HBase will trigger the compaction to ensure that data is completed regardless. The compaction can also be triggered manually by the HBase administrator. This can be useful in a situations where there are a specific performance requirements or where is needed is need to reclaim a disk space. So in summary, the compaction is an important process in HBase that helps us ensure efficient storage and data retrieval. It involves merging a smaller files into a larger one and sorting the data and removing duplicated data. Compaction can be triggered automatically based on a time and size threshold or it can be triggered manually by the HBase administrator. So that's it for this video on compaction in HBase. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video on HBase Client API. HBase is a NoSQL database that can store and process large amount of data distributed across a cluster of servers. The HBase Client API is a Java-based library that allows developers to interact with the HBase database to perform various operations such as data insertion, retrieval, and deletion. In this this video, we are going to cover the basics of HBase Client, HBase Client API, and then dive into more advanced features such as filters. The HBase Client API is designed to be simple and interactive for Java developers. To interact with the HBase database, the first step is to create an instance of HBase configuration class. This class provides a configuration setting for HBase clusters such as location of the zookeeper, quorum, and the port number used 
for communication. Once you have created a configuration object, you can create an instance of HBase client class, which represents the HBase client connection. With a client instance, you can perform various operations on the H database, such as creating table, inserting data into a table, and retrieving data from a table. HBase uses the concept of row keys to identify a particular row in a table. You can use the get method to retrieve a single row from a table based on its row key. The scan method can be used to retrieve multiple rows from a table based on a range of row keys. And HBase filters are very powerful feature that can greatly enhance your effectiveness when working with a data is stored in a table. Filters allow you to limit data retrieving by progressively adding more limiting selectors to the query. These include column families, column qualifiers, timestamp or ranges as well as a version number. While the basic HBase API gives you control over what you what is included, it is missing more fine-grained features such as selection of key values based on a regular expression. Both the get and scan method support filters for exactly these reasons. What, what cannot be solved with the provided API functionality to filter row or column keys or values can be achieved with filters. The base interface for filter is aptly named filter and there is a list of concrete classes supplied by HBase that you can use without doing any programming. You can also extend the filter classes to implement your own requirement. All filters are actually applied on the server side also called predicted pushdown. This ensures the most efficient selection of data that needs to be transported back to the client. So in conclusion, HBase Client API is a powerful tool for developers to interact with and with HBase database. With the basic API, developers can write, insert, and retrieve and delete data from HBase tables. Advanced features of filters allow developers to fine-tune their data retrieval queries, efficiently retrieve the required data. If you are interested in learning more about the HBase, HBase client API and its advanced fe features, be sure to check out the HBase documentation and commodity resources. So that's it for this video on HBase client API. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about H base shell commands. HBase shell is an interactive command line tool for interacting with HBase database. It's very powerful for a number of reasons because it allows you to perform wide range of operations on your HBase database. In this video we're going to explore what HBase shell is in detail including its features, syntax and some examples. So what is HBase shell? HBase shell is an interactive command line tool for HBase database that allows users to interact with their HBase database using the command line interface. HBase shell is written in Java programming language and uses the HBase API to interact with HBase databases. It is a powerful tool that allows users to perform wide range of operations on their HBase databases. The features of HBase shells are that allows for operations such as create, delete, and modify tables in the HBase database. HBase shell supports HBase filters. HBase filter language which allows users to filter their HBase data based on a specific criteria. HBase shell allows users to perform an scans on their HBase database to interact with data that matches a specific criteria. HBase shell allows users to perform batch operations on their HBase database which improves the performance and about the same 
syntax of HBase shell. It is similar to command line interface, other command line interfaces, and usually the blueprint for HBase command is that you have the keyword HBase command first, and then you're gonna have a table name and you're gonna have an argument followed by it. The the HBase command itself is used to start the HBase shell. So let's have some examples of hbase shell commands to create table in hbase we will write create students and we are gonna a students is our table name and the personal data and academic data these commands create a table named students with the column families of personal data and academic data to insert data into a table we we will write put keyword and then student one personal data name name John. So this command inserts the name John into the personal data name column of the row key of the row with the key one in the students table. And to scan the data from a table, we can write a scan and the name of the table, which in this case is a students. This command scans the entire students table and returns all rows and columns. And to delete a table, we will write disable students or drop students. These command disable and drop the students from the HBase database. So in conclusion, HBase shell is a powerful tool that allows users to interact with their HBase database using the command line interface. It supports wide range of operations including crude operations, table management, filtering, scanning, and batch operations. HBase shell commands are structured in a similar way to other command line interface, making it easy for users to get started and HBase Shell is an essential tool for anyone working with HBase databases or data analysis and data science in general. And we hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video where we are going to discuss Kafka and its architecture. In this video we are going to cover everything you need to know about Kafka including definition, features and its architecture. So what is Kafka? Kafka is an open source distributed streaming platform developed by Apache Software Foundation and it is designed to handle high, high throughput real time data streaming from various sources such as sensors, logs, social media feed and transaction systems. So about the features of Kafka, Kafka is known for its high performance and scalability for fault tolerant and it will make it an ideal platform for processing large volume of data. Some of its key features include distributed architecture. Kafka has a distributed architecture. Kafka has a distributed architecture which allows it to handle large volume of data from multiple sources and processes them in real life. And about the fault tolerant, Kafka is designed to be fault tolerant which means that it can continue to operate even if one or more nodes fail. And about the scalability, Kafka is highly scalable and can handle millions of messages per second without its compromising performance. With without compromising performance. And about the low latency, Kafka is designed to process data in real time, which means that it has low latency and can deliver data quickly. Now that now let's dive into Kafka architecture, which consists of four main components, the, pro, the producers that are responsible for generating data and sending it to Kafka brokers. They can send data into batches or, or one at a time. And about about the brokers, brokers are part of the core Kafka architecture. They retrieve data from producers and store it in the partition and replicated manner. Brokers are also responsible for handling customer requests. And we have the topics which are categories that data is organized into Kafka. Each topic consists of one or more partitions and each partition is replicated across multiple brokers for fault tolerance. The 
consumers are another part of Kefka architecture which are responsible for reading data from a Kefka broker. They can consume data in batches or one at a time and they can also be subscribed to one or more topics. The Kefka products in other hand they need a little bit more explanation. Kefka brokers are core Kefka architecture as I said and they receive data from producers and they store it in a partitional and replicated manner. Brokers are also responsible for handling customer requests but each broker in Kefka cluster is identified with a unique ID and can host one or more replicas of one or more partitions. When a broker fails it partitions are automatically assigned to other brokers in the cluster and Kefka topics has more explanation. So as I said Kefka topics are categorizing data and they are organizing it into Kefka. Each topic consists of one or more partitions and each partition is replicated across multiple brokers for fault tolerance. When a producer sends data to Kefka it specifies the topic which data should be sent. Customers can then subscribe to one or more topics and read the data from the partitions that make up topics. So now if we want to dive a little bit deeper into Kefka consumers we can say consumers are responsible for reading data from Kefka brokers. They can consume data in batches or one at a time and they can also subscribe to one or more topics. When a consumer subscribes to a topic it assigns a partition from that topic. The consumer then reads data from that partition in a pool based manner. Customers can also specify the offset which they want to start reading data. So in summary Kefka is a distributed system, distributed a streaming platform designed to handle high throughput real-time streams from multiple sources. It is fault tolerant and its scalability and low latency makes it an ideal platform for processing large volume of data. Kefka Kefka architecture consists of four main components, the producers, the brokers, the topics and the consumers. The producers, producers generate data and send it to brokers which store the data in a partition and replicated partitions. Topics are used to categorize data and consumers read data from partitions. With Kefka you can process and analyze large volume of data in real time which is a critical for many modern data driven businesses and I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video where we are going to discuss Kefka brokers. Kefka brokers are a critical component of Kefka distributed system platform and in this video we are going to explore what they are, how they work and their importance in the Kefka ecosystem. So what is a Kefka broker? If you watched the previous videos you know what Kefka broker is and in this video we are going to take a much deeper look into Kefka brokers. In Kefka Kefka, a broker is a server or node that acts as a message broker responsible for handling incoming and outcoming messages. It is responsible for retrieving, storing and forwarding message to customers or other brokers. A Kefka brokers is, broker is essentially a container that manages one or more partitions of a topic. So how does Kefka broker work? When a producer sends a message to Kefka, the broker receives the message and appends it to the end of the partition that it belongs to. The broker then sends an acknowledgement. The broker then sends an acknowledgement to the producer to confirm that the message has been received. The customer then reads message from the broker in a pull based manner by, by specifying the offset of the last message they read. Kefka brokers work in 
a cluster, which means that multiple brokers can work together to ensure message availability and fault tolerance. When a broker goes down, other brokers in the cluster can take over the workload, ensuring that the message are still processed and delivered to the customer. And about the Kafka configuration, Kafka broker configuration, each Kafka broker has its own configuration file, which specifies various settings such as the broker ID, the network port that it listens on, and the location of the data directory. And the data directory is where Kafka stores the partitions of this data on a disk. One important configuration setting is the replication factor, which determines the number of copies of each partition that are kept in a cluster. This helps ensure fault tolerance and availability of data in case of a broker goes down. And about the Kafka scalability, Kafka brokers can be scaled horizontally by adding more brokers to a cluster. This increases the throughput of the system and provides additional fault tolerance. Kafka brokers can also be scaled vertically by incre increasing the resources allowed to each broker such as CPU, memory, and disk space. Kafka broker uh, security is one of the important topics and Kafka brokers can ensure can be secured using various security protocols such as SSL, TLS, and SASL. And the SSL and TLS provides encryption and authentication for the communication between brokers and clients while the SASL provides authentication and authorization for client connections. So in conclusion, Kafka brokers are a critical component of Kafka distributed streaming platform. They receive and store and forward messages to customers or other brokers and they work together in a cluster to provide the fault tolerance and availability of the data. Kafka brokers can be configured, scale and ensure to meet the specific needs of the Kafka cluster and I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this educational video video on Kafka topics. In this video we are going to discuss what Kafka topics are and how they work and their importance in the modern distributed system. So let's get a start. Kafka topics are feeds or categories of messages in Kafka messaging system. In other words, it is a logical container or namespace that holds a stream of records. These records can be any type but they are typically JSON or binary encoded data that represents events, logs, or any other form of data that needs to be processed by the application. Kafka Topics work, works by re retrieving data from one or more producers and delivering that data to one or more consumers. When a producer sends data to Kafka Topics, it is added to the end of the topic log. Consumers can read data from the log and process it. Kafka topics are partitioned to allow for scalability and parallel processing. Each topic can have one or more partitions which are distributed across multiple brokers. This allows for parallel processing of data and helps to ensure fault tolerance. When a producer sends data to Kafka topics, it can specify a partition key which determines which partition the data will be written. To if no partition key is specified, the data will be distributed across all partitions in a round-robin fashion. Consumers can then read the data from partition that they are interested in and process it. Kafka topics are an essential component of modern distributed system. They provide a scalable, fault-tolerant and efficient way to handle large volume of streams. And Kafka topics are used in a wide range of 
applications including log aggregation, real-time analytics, and event-driven architectures. One of the main benefits of Kafka, Kafka topics is their ability to decouple producers from consumers. The producers can send data to a Kafka topic without knowing who will consume it or how it will process it will be processed. Consumers can then read data from a topic and process it independently or of the producers. Kefka topics also provide a strong guarantees of data delivery. Once a data is written to a topic, it is then stored on a disk replicated across multiple brokers. This ensures that the data is durable and it's available for consumption, even if broker fails. So, in in conclusion, Kafka topics are a powerful tools for handling large volume of data streams in a modern distributed systems. They provide a scalable, fault toler tolerant, and efficient way to handle data and decouple producers from consumers. Kafka topics are used in a wide range of applications and they are essential component of the event-driven architecture. So that's it for this video on Kafka topics. I hope this video was informative informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to discuss Apache Kafka producers and how they work and its various aspects. So first, let me explain to you what Apache Kafka producer is. Kafka pr producer is a component of Apache Kafka, a distributed a streaming platform. It is responsible for producing and sending data to Kafka topics. Kafka producers can be used to send data from very variety of sources such as sensors, log applications, and other data sources. So how Kafka producers work? Kafka producers work by creating messages, which is then sent to the Kafka topic. A Kafka topic is a logical name for a stream of records in a Kafka. When a producer sends a message to a Kafka topic, it is stored in the topic partition. The partition is a unit of parallelism in a Kafka that allows for a scaling of data ingestion. When a message is sent to Kafka topics, Kafka topic is a stored in the topic partition based on the partitioning strategy used and there are various partitioning strategies available such as round robin, hash base, and range base. The partitioning strategy determines which partition the message will be stored in. Once the message is being is stored in the topic partition, it is available for computation consumption by Kafka consumers. Kafka consumers read messages from the Kafka topics and then processes them. Benefits of Kafka produce producers are such as a scalability, which Kafka producer can scale horizontally to handle large volume of data, and reliability, which provides a reliable data delivery by ensuring that messages are not lost in a transit and flexibility which is which means that it can be used to send data from various sources making it a flexible and adaptable choice and finally the high throughput kafka producer can handle high throughput of data with a low latency making it an ideal for real-time data processing so in conclusion kafka producer is an important concept of Apache Kafka that is used to produce and send data to a Kafka topic. It provides a scalable, reliable, and flexible solution for handling large volume of data. By using Kafka producers, organizations can process data in a real time and ensuring them to make informed decisions faster. And so that's it for this video on Kafka producers. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any questions, Question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.
Hello and welcome to this video where we are gonna discuss the Kafka consumers. In this video we are gonna explore the topics of Kafka consumer groups and understand how they work in Kafka ecosystem. So what is the Kafka consumer? A Kafka consumer is a client that receives messages from a Kafka topic. A consumer subscribes to one or more topics of Kafka cluster and reads messages from them. The Kafka cluster ensures that each message is delivered to only one consumer in a consumer group. So how does the Kafka consumer works? The Kafka consumer works by connecting to Kafka broker and subscribing to one or more topics. Once the consumer subscribes to a topic, it starts reading messages from the topic partitions. Each partition is read by only one consumer in the consumer group. If a consumer fails, another consumer in the same consumer group will take over the failed consumer and partitions. So we have to configure the Kafka consumer. The Kafka consumer has ver various configurations that can be set in order to customize its behavior. Some of the commonly used configurations are the bootstrap.servers, the list of Kafka brokers to connect to, the group.id which is the unique identifier of the consumer group, the auto.offset.reset that determines what to do when there is no initial offset in Kafka or the current offset does not exist anymore on the server. We have the enable.auto.commit which determines if the consumer's offset is automatically committed to Kafka. The Kafka consumer group is a group of one or more Kafka consumers that jointly consume a set of partitions of the Kafka topic and, they, and a consumer group provides benefits of fault tolerance, load balancing and parallel processing. So how the Kafka consumer group work? When a Kafka consumer group joins a consumer group, it will assign to one or more partitions in the subscribed topic. Each partition is read by only one customer in the customer group. If a customer fails, another customer in the same group will take over the failed consumer partitions. This provide a high av availability and fault tolerance. Additionally, the con consumers in the group can share the workload by reading from different partitions of the same topic. And the Kafka consumer group configuration is in variety, which can be set in order to customize its behavior. And some of the commonly used configurations are group, group.id, which is a unique identifier for group consumer group, the auto offset.reset which we looked at before and determines what to do when there is no initial offset in the Kafka or if the current offset does not exist anymore in the server. Enable.auto.commit enable which determines if the consumer offset is automatically committed to Kefla and finally the max.pool.interval.ms which is maximum time between call to pool before the consumer is considered failed. So in this video we covered the Kafka consumer and Kafka consumer group in detail and we learned about Kafka consumers and we learned Kafka consumer is a client that receive, receive messages from a Kafka topic while the Kafka consumer group is a group of one or more Kafka consumers that jointly consume a set of partitions of a topic. We also learn about configurations that can be set for the Kafka consumers and consumer groups. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Kafka message format. Kafka is a popular distributed stream streaming platform that is used built in top of the real-time data pipeline and streaming applications. The Kafka message format is the format in which data is sent and received by the Kafka. In this video, we are going to discuss what Kafka message format is and its component and how they work together. So the Kafka message is a format in a 
binary format that is used to serialize the data before it is sent to the Kafka. The data is then deserialized, deserialized when it's received by the Kafka consumer. This format is designed to be efficient and fast, allowing large amount of data to be sent and retrieved quickly and reliably. The Kafka message format consists of several components. The message header which contains metadata about the message such as the topic, the partitions and the timestamp, the key. This is an optional field that is that can be used to identify a message. If a key is provided, Kafka will use it to determine which partition to use to send the message to and the value which is which is the actual data that's that being sent to Kafka and it can be any binary data such as Dayton, Avro or Protoboof. And we have finally the message footer. This contains metadata about the message such as CRC32 checksum which is used to ensure data integrity. So how does the Kafka message format works? When a data is sent to Kafka it is first serialized into the Kafka message format the data is then sent to the appropriate partition based on the key if one was provided or using a robbing round robin strategy if no key is provided the data is stored in the kafka until it consumed by the consumer when a consumer reads data from a partition the data is deserialized back into the original format the kafka message format is designed to be highly efficient allowing large large amount of data to be sent and retrieved quickly and reliably. The use of binary serialization and efficient, compar compar efficient comparison algorithms such as a Snappy or Gzip help to minimize the network and storage overhead. In conclusion, um, the Kafka message format is an important concept of Kafka that allows data to be sent and retrieved quickly and efficiently. Its components include the message head key value and the message footer work together to ensure that data is reliable and its data integrity. By using Kafka message format, developers can build real-time data pipeline and streaming applications that are scalable and reliable. So that's it for this video on Apache Kafka message format. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Kafka Connect. In this video, we are going to explore the concept of Kafka Con Connect and its features and its architecture. So let's dive into it and see how it works. Kafka Connect is a framework for building scalable and reliable streaming data pipelines between Kafka and other data systems. It allows you to easily move data in and out of Kafka and perform transactions on the data. Kafka Connect is built in top of the Kafka, which is a distributed managing system that can handle high volume of data in real time. The Kafka Connect architecture consists of two main components, the connectors and tasks. The connectors are responsible for managing the connection to the data system and for retrieving the data from the source. They are also responsible for configuring the task that will perform the data transaction for sending the transformed data into Kafka and tasks are responsible for actual movement of the data between Kafka and other data and the data system. So key features of Kefla Connect are that makes it very powerful tool for building paper pipelines are easy to use. Kafka Connect is designed to be easy to use and configure. You can quickly set up the pipeline without needing to write any code. A scalability, the Kafka Connect is designed to be a scale allowing to easily handle large volume of data in real time default tolerant which is designed to be secure and ensure that data is not lost in the event of failure and it is pretty flexible and it is designed to be flexible allowing you to easily add new sources and data syncs to your pipeline and it is extendable which means that Kafka Connect is designed to be extensible allowing you to customize 
customize and extend your framework to meet your specific needs. And about the use cases of Kafka Connect, we can say the real-time processing. Kafka Connect can be used to move data in real time between different systems such as database and data warehouse and a streaming processing. A stream processing is one of its key features. Kafka Connect can be used to perform a stream processing on the data such as filtering, aggregating or enriching the data. And we have also the data integration which Kafka Connect can be used to integrate data from different sources into single system such as integrating data from CRM system and make marketing automation system. So in conclusion Kafka Connect is a powerful framework for building scalable and reliable data pipelines between Kafka and other systems. It is easy to use a scalable and fault tolerant flexible system and it is extendable. With many features Kafka Connect is an ideal tool for real-time processing, streaming, stream processing and data integration. So I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question put it down in the comment below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Kafka Streams. Kafka Stream is a powerful tool that allows developers to build real-time streaming stream processing applications using Apache Kafka platform. In this video, we are going to walk through the basics of Kafka Streams and we are going to explore its features. So what is Kafka Streams? Kafka Stream is a library built in top of the Apache Kafka platform. It allows developers to process and analyze data in real time using Kafka messaging cap capabilities. Kafka Stream provides a high-level API that enables developers to write a stream processing application in Java or Scala. So how does the Kafka Stream works? Kafka Stream operates on the stream of data that is stored in Kafka topics. The library that allows developers to define a stream processing pipeline using a series of operations such as filtering, mapping, and and aggregating. These operations are executed on the data that is flows through the stream allowing developers to transform and analyze data in real time. So what are the key features of Kafka Stream? One of them is exactly once processing which means that Kafka Streams provide exactly once processing semantics which ensures that data is processed exactly even in the case of failure. This failure is a crucial it is crucial for many real-time applications such as financial system and where data integrity integrity is crucial so there is another feature that is a stateful full processing Kafka stream allows developers to write allows developers to maintain a stateful operations which means that the library can maintain the state across multiple events this feature is useful for applications that require maintaining state such as real-time analytics system. Low time latency processing is one of its feature. Kafka Stream is designed for low latency processing which means that it can process data in real time with a minimal delay. This feature is essential for applications that require near instantaneous processing such as fraud detection systems. And about the use cases of Kafka Stream we can say that it is a real-time analytics platform. The Kafka stream can be used for real-time analytics where data is analyzed and processed as it's guaranteed as it is guaranteed this use case is common in industries such as finance where real-time data analysis is crucial and as I mentioned before fraud detection it is one of the main topics Kafka stream can be used for fraud detection system where data analysis in real time to identify the fraudulent behavior Behavior. This use case is common in industries such as banking and e-commerce. The IoT data processing Kafka streams can be used for processing IoT data where data is generated by connected devices and sensors. This use case is common in industries such as manufacturing, logistics, where time and data analysis is crucial for offer operation efficiency. And if you want to set up a Kafka cluster before 
before setting before getting started with kafka streams you will need to set up a kafka cluster a kafka cluster consists of one or more kafka brokers which are responsible for storing and processing data creating kafka stream applications is the next step and you need to use the kafka stream api which is available in java or scala and you will need to define a processing topology that describes how data will be processed as it flows through the stream and for running a kafka stream application once you create created a kafka stream application you can run it by deploying it to the cluster of kafka brokers you can also use the kafka built-in command line tools to monitor the performance of your application and troubleshoot any issues that may arise so kafka stream is a powerful tool that allows developers to build real-time streams of processing for applications using the apache kafka platform so in conclusion features such as exactly once processing stateful processing and low latency processing and is a main feature in kafka stream that is an ideal solution for wide range of use cases including real-time data analysis fraud detection and iot data processing so i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video in this video we are going to discuss the kafka cluster which is used in a distributed system like kefla for storing and processing a stream of data in real time it is widely used in industry industries like finance healthcare technology and to handle massive amount of data the Kafka is uh, a pretty useful software nowadays because of big data analysis, machine learning, and data science. So in this video, we're going to cover every aspect of Kefla cluster to be specific and how it works. So what is Kafka cluster? Kafka cluster is a collection of Kef brokers that work together to handle incoming data stream. A Kafka broker is a server that manages a partition of the data stored in a kafka cluster when the data is retrieved it is distributed across the kafka brokers in a cluster for fault tolerance tolerance and scalability kafka cluster follows a publish subscribe model where publishers send data to topics the subscribers consume data from these topics the topics are divided into partitions which are spread across different bro brokers in the cluster each partition has its own offset that determines the partition of the consumer in the partition so when a data is sent to a topic it is assigned to a, a partition based on a key or round robin algorithm kafka ensures that the data is sent to the same key always the data sent to the same key always go to the same partition ensuring the order and consistency once the data is assigned to a partition it is replicated to other brokers in the cluster to ensure default tolerance the kafka cluster has a distributed architecture with four main components the producers the brokers the consumers and the zookeeper the producers are responsible for sending data to kafka cluster they publish data on a specific topic and partition which there are then distributed across the brokers the brokers are the service that retrieve and store data sent by the producers they are also replicated they also replicate the data to ensure default toler tolerance and high availability and about the consumers they are the client that reads the data from the kafka cluster they subscribe to a specific topic and partitions and they read data in a real time and consumers can be part of the consumer group which helps to describe the load amount multiple co consumers and about the zookeeper which we are going to more focus on in a much much deeper detail in the later videos but let's have a brief now about the zookeeper which is a centralized service that manages the coordination between the brokers and consumers in a kafka cluster it stores metadata about the cluster such as the location of the partitions the status of brokers and the part and the position of the consumers so 
advantages of Kefla cluster are several over the traditional messaging system, such as the high through output. Kefla cluster can handle massive amount of data in real time, making it suitable for use cases that are require high throughput. The fault tolerance is one of its key features. Kefka cluster ensures that data is replicated across multiple brokers, making it a fault tolerant and highly available. And scalability is one of its key features. Kefka cluster can be easily scaled by adding more brokers to the cluster, allowing it to handle increasing data volumes. The Kefka cluster is a powerful distributed system for storing and processing real-time data streams, it is distributed and its distributed architecture and fault tolerance and scalability makes it suitable for cases that require hard, high throughput and availability. So I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video we are going to discuss Kafka partitioning and we are going to explore what Kafka partitioning is why and why is it and why it is important and how it works. So let's discuss the different strategies for partitioning and best practices for designing and implementation of partitioning in Apache Kafka. So what is partitioning? Apache Kafka is a distributed streaming platform that allows you to publish and subscribe to a streams of record. A stream is a sequence of immutable records that can be continuously processed. A topic in the Apache Kafka is a particular stream of data. A partition in Kafka is a unit of parallelism in which a topic is divided. Partitioning is a process of dividing topic into multiple partitions where each partition is stored in a separate bro broker node. The goal of partitioning is to provide scalability and fault tolerance. By dividing a topic into partitions, we can distribute the load across multiple brokers and handle more data than a single broker can handle. However, if a broker fails, the data can still be read from the remaining brokers. So why Apache Kafka partitioning is important? Partitioning in Kafka is important for several reasons. Firstly, it allows you to scale your system horizontally by adding more brokers to handle more data. Secondly, it provides a fault tolerance by replicating data across multiple brokers. If a broker fails, the data can still be read from other brokers. Lastly, partitioning allows you to parallelize data processing, which can increase the throughput of, of your system. So how does the Kafka partitioning works? In Kafka, a topic is divided to multiple partitions where each partition is assigned to different brokers. Each partition has a unique identifier called partition key. The partition key is used to determine which partition a record will be written to. When a producer, when a producer writes a record to a topic, it specifies the partition key for the record, for that record. The partition key is used to hash the record and determine which partition in the record should be written to. When a con consumer reads data from a topic, it can choose to read from all partitions or from a, a specific partition. If a consumer reads from all partitions, it will receive a stream of records in the order they were produced. If the consumer reads from a specific partition, it will retrieve a streams of records from the partition in order they were produced. And the strategies of implementation implementing Apache Kafka partitioning are several. So one strategy is partitioning by the key. This strategy is useful for when you want a natural ordering for your data. For example, if you are processing events from a sensor, you might want to partition the data by the sensor ID. This will ensure that all events from a particular sensor are stored in the same partition and they can be processed in order. Another strategy is partitioning by round robin. This strategy is useful when you want to, when you do not have a natural, it is useful when you do not have a natural ordering for your data. For example, if you are processing log data, um, if you are pro processing log data, you 
may want to partition data using a round robin strategy to distribute the load evenly across brokers. When designing and implementing partitioning in Apache Kafka, there are several best practices to follow. Firstly, you should choose the right partitioning strategy for your use case. Secondly, you should choose the right number of partitions for your topic. A good rule of thumb is to have the la to have at least as many partitions as the number of brokers in your cluster. Second and lastly, you should monitor the system to ensure that the partitioning is working as expected and that you are not experiencing any performance issues. So in conclusion, in this video we explored the Apache Kafka partitioning and why it is important and how it works. We discussed the different strategies for partitioning and best practices for designing and implementing them in Apache Kafka. And by following these steps, you are able to implement a good architecture and a strategy for your needs. So that's it for this video on partitioning in Apache Apache Kafka. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video where we are going to discuss Kafka replication. We are going to talk about its importance and how it works. But first, let's talk about what it is. Kafka replication is a feature of Apache Kafka that allows data to be replicated across multiple Kafka clusters or brokers. This is done to ensure fault tolerance and high availability. In simple term, it means that if one Kafka broker goes down, another broker can take its place without losing any data. Kafka replication is essential for maintaining data consistency and ensuring that data is always available. Kafka replication is crucial for business businesses that rely on real-time processing and enables the creation of backup system that can take over in case of failure. This ensures that data processing continues uninterrupted and the business can continue to function without any major disruption. Disruptions. Kafka replication also improves data readability, scalability, and ensures data consistency. Kafka replication works by creating multiple replicas of the data on different Kafka brokers. This is done by, by designating one broker as a lead and other as followers. The lead server receives data from producers and writes it to its local disk and also sends a copy to all followers. The Followers acknowledge the receipt of data and write it to their own local disk. The leader also maintains a record of the offset of all messages that have been replicated to the followers. In case if a failure, a new leader is selected and the followers are updated with the new leader information. And about the types of uh, Kafka replication, the Kafka replication can be classified into two types, the internal replication and cross data center replication. The internal replication involves replicating data within a single data center. This type of replication ensures that data is always available even if one broker fails and the internal replication can be configured at a to topic level or partitioning level. So we have the cross data center replication. Cross data center replication involves involves replicating data between data centers. This type of replication ensures that data is always available even if an entire data center fails. Cross data, data center replication is typically slower than the internal replication and requires different configurations. The Kafka replication offers several benefits to businesses including high availability, which is Kafka replication ensures data is always available even if one or more brokers fail and scalability is the second benefit which is allows businesses to scale their business processing and ca capabilities as needed and another one is fault tolerance which provides a backup system that can take over in case of failure another one another one is data consistency
consistency, which ensures data is consistent across multiple Kafka brokers. And finally, the disaster recovery. Kafka replication enables businesses to recover from disaster relatively pretty quickly if, if the employees are skilled enough. So in conclusion, the Kafka replication is a crucial feature of Apache Kafka that enables businesses to ensure data availability, readability, and consistency. It provides backup system that can take over any in case of failure, ensuring the interrupted data processing and Kafka replication is essential for businesses that rely on real-time data processing and it is a must to have for any data-driven organization. So that's it for this video on Kafka, Apache Kafka replication. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to discuss Apache Kafka Offset Management. And Apache Kafka is a distributed sys a streaming platform that allows for processing large amount of data in real time. In this video, we're going to more focus on the concept of offset management and it's important in the Kafka cluster. Before we dive into the offset management, let's define what is offset in Kafka. An offset is a unique identifier that Kafka uses to keep track of the position of the consumer in a particular topic partition. Each message in the topic partition has a corresponding offset which is incremented sequentially as a new message or added to the partition. So what is offset management? The offset management refers to the process of tracking and managing the offset position of each consumer group in a Kafka cluster. In Kafka cluster multiple consumers consumers can subscribe to the same topi topic partition and each consumer group has its own unique offset partition. So why offset management is important? Offset management is a critical part of Kafka cluster because it allows for message processing and resume and to resume from the point where it was last left off. Without offset management, each consumer group would start processing messages from the beginning of the topic partition which could lead to a duplicate message processing and a waste of resources. So how does the offset management works in Kafka? The Kafka provides two types of offset. So Kafka provides two types of offset management. The automatic and manual. In the automatic offset management, Kafka handles the offset tracking for the consumer group automatically. In contrast, the manual offset management allows the consumer to control the offset position explicitly. And the automatic offset management, uh, if we want to have a deeper look, in the automatic offset management, Kafka tracks the offset position of each consumer group and automatically manages the offset commits. Each uh, time in each time a message is processed successfully, Kafka will commit the offset position for that message, allowing the consumer group to resume the processing from the last commit offset. This ensures that the message are not processed multiple times and that no data is lost if if a consumer fails. So about the manual offset, ma offset management, in manual offset management the data con consumer controls the offset position explicitly. The consumer can choose to commit the offset position after processing a batch of memories or hold off to committing the offset until the certain condition is met. The manual offset management is useful when the cons consumer requires more control over the processing of ma messages or when a consumer is processing messages asynchronously. So in conclusion, the offset management is a critical component of Kafka that ensures the efficient and reliable message processing in a distributed environment. Kafka provides two types of offset management, the automatic and manual. The automatic offset management is the default and it is suitable for most use cases. However, the manual offset management provides a more control over the message processing and it is useful in a specific situations. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Make sure to leave 
give a thumbs up button and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about a transactional messaging in Apache Kafka. Apache Kafka is a distributed streaming platform that is widely used for building real-time real -time data pipelines and a streaming application. So let's dive into its architecture and how it works, mainly the transactional messaging. So what is transactional messaging? The transactional messaging ensures that a set of related messages are passed atomically either all succeeding or all failing in other words if one message in a set of in a set fails the entire set fails and no message are processed this helps to maintain data consistency which is a crucial in applications that rely on reliable messaging so what is the kafka transactional messaging architecture the transactional messaging is built on top of the kafka producer api the transactional messaging is a feature that ensures messages produced to the kafka are part of the transaction a transactional a transaction is a set of messages produced to kafka that must be processed atomic kafka transactional messaging provides a strong consistency and guarantees that all messages in a transaction or transaction either committed or aborted kafka transactional messaging architecture consists of following component the producer which sends the message to kafka in a transactional manner the transaction coordinator this component is responsible for managing the life cycle of a transaction and the transaction log which is delegated log that stores the state of the transaction coordinator and the transaction outcome and so now you might ask yourself how transactional messaging works in kafka the transactional messaging first the producer starts the transaction by calling the begin transaction method this creates a new transaction associated with the current thread once the transaction is started all messages produced by the producer will be the part of the transaction when a producer is done producing the messages it can either commit or abort the transaction if the producer commits the transaction all messages produced in the transaction are considered committed and they will be available for consumption if a produ producer aborts the transaction all messages produced in the transaction are discarded discarded and they will not be available for consumption consumption in order to ensure transactional consistency the kafka uses two-phase commit the 2pc for short protocol the first phase is the prepare phase where the transactional coordinator sends a prepare request to all partitions involved in the transaction if all partitions successfully prepare the transaction coordinator moves the commit phase where it sends the commit request to all partitions involved in the transaction if any partition fails to commit the transaction coordinator sends the abort request to all partitions and kafka transactional messaging provides several advantages including a strong consistency guarantees and allows atomic processing of related messages and simplifies the application de development and provides the data consistency so in conclusion the kafka transactional messaging is an essential feature of kafka platform and it ensures related messages are processed atomically allowing for a strong consistency guarantees and a simplified application development by using two-phase commit protocol kafka transactional messaging ensures that all messages in the transaction are either committed or abor aborted providing data consistency with the help of the producer the transaction transaction coordinator and the transaction log kafka transactional messaging architecture provides a reliable way to handle transaction in a distributed system so that's it for this video on apache kafka transactional messaging i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video
Hello and welcome to this educational video about Apache Kafka Mirror Maker. In this video we're going to discuss what Apache Kafka Mirror, Mirror Maker is and its benefit and how it works. So Apache Mirror Maker is an open source tool developed by Apache Software Foundation that enables data replication between two Kafka clusters. With the Mirror Maker you can replicate data from a Kafka cluster to another even if the two clusters are located in different data centers or geographical locations or geographical regions. This tool is designed to enable high availability, disaster recovery and data consolidation. The main benefit of the Apache Kafka Mirror Maker is its ability to replicate data between two Kafka cluster. This can be useful in several scenarios including high availability. By replicating data between two Kafka cluster you can can ensure that if one cluster goes down another can take over seamlessly without losing any data. And disaster recovery which is pretty important and in event of a disaster you have having a replicated Kafka cluster can help you recover quickly and minimize downtime. And about the data consolidation if you have multiple Kafka clusters separated across different regions you can use the mirror, mirror maker to replicate data from these clusters to a single centralized cluster. So finally we are reaching how Kafka Mirror Maker works. Mirror Maker works by consuming messages from one Kafka cluster and producing them on another Kafka cluster. This process is also known as data replication. There are two modes in which the data mirror can operate, the unidirectional replication and bidirectional replication. The unidirectional replication, in this mode the mirror maker replicates data from a source uh, of a Kafka cluster to a target Kafka cluster. The source cluster is the one from which mirror Mirror Maker consumes the message and the target cluster is the one which one to which Mirror Maker produces the messages. By a directional replication, in this mode Mirror Maker replicates data bi-directionally between two Kafka clusters. This means that the both clusters act as a source and a target for Mirror Maker. To configure Mirror Maker, you will need to create a configuration file that specifies the source and target of Kafka cluster as well as any other relevant settings such as message transformation role and let's move on to best practices with mirror maker use dedicated hardware the mirror maker can consume a lot of resources so it is best to run on the dedicated hardware the monitor mirror maker keeps an eye on the mirror maker to ensure that running smoothly and to detect any issues before it becomes critical and the use of SSL encryption, if you are replicating data across different data centers or regions, use the SSL encryption to ensure that data is transit. And also the test replication, which is important because the test replication, it is used to ensure that data is being replicated correctly and it is being, and that is the target of Kafka cluster that is up to date. So in conclusion, the Kafka Apache Mirror Maker is a powerful tool for replicating data between two Kafka clusters. By replicating data, you can ensure the high availability, disaster recovery, and data consolidation. The Mirror Maker can operate in unidirectional or bidirectional mode, and it is important to follow the best practices when using it. And so that's it for this video on Apache Kafka Mirror Maker. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about Kafka performance tuning. In this video we are going to discuss various aspects of performance tuning for Apache Kafka and how you can optimize your Kafka cluster to maximize efficiently and throughput. To begin, let's first understand the basics of performance tuning for Apache Kafka. The performance tuning is a process of optimizing the system parameters to achieve 
achieve the desired performance goals. In the case of Apache Kafka, the performance tuning involves adjusting various configurations and settings to optimize the Kafka cluster performance, throughput, and reliability. There are several factors that affect the performance of Apache Kafka, so let's discuss them one by one. First is the hardware resources. The hardware resources of the Kafka cluster play, play a crucial role in determining its performance. This includes the CPU memory, also the disk I.O., and the network bandwidth. It is essential to ensure that the hardware resources are adequate for the workload and the data throughput. And the network latency is another big aspect that can significantly impact the performance of your Kafka cluster. It is essential to minimize the network latency by ensuring that the brokers and the clients are deployed in the same data center or region. The producer slash customer configurations is another aspect. The producer and the customer configuration can significantly affect the Kafka cluster performance and it is crucial to tune the configuration setting to optimize the producer and consumer performance. And about the performance tuning strategy, which is pretty important now that we discuss the factors affecting the performance of Apache Kafka, let's look at some strategies that can be used to optimize the performance. The cluster size, it is something to keep in mind. The sizing the Kafka cluster correctly is crucial for achieving the desired performance. You need to ensure that the cluster has enough brokers to handle the workload and that the hardware resources are adequate. The topic partitioning is another aspect. The partitioning topics can help describe the workload across multiple brokers and improve the performance and it is essential to choose the right partitioning strategy based on the use case and data throughput. And another aspect is compression. Compression can significantly significantly improve the Kafka cluster performance by reducing the amount of data that needs to be transmitted. You can use the compress compression at the producer or broker level to optimize the performance. And about the monitoring and matrix, monitoring the Kafka cluster performance and controlling matrix can help you identify the performance bottleneck and optimize the performance. It is essential to monitor key matrices such as throughput, latency, and error rates. And finally, we are going to take a look at some best practices for Apache Kafka performance tuning. Optimizing hardware resources ensures that the hardware resources are optimized for workload and data throughput. Choosing the right compa compression strategy based on the use case and data throughput can greatly improve your workload. The monitoring and to monitor the Kafka cluster performance and collect matrices to identify the performance bottleneck is another aspect that you should definitely keep in mind and tuning the producer and co consumer configuration it is something that you should definitely pay attention to tune the producer and consumer configuration to optimize the performance and and there are two more things such as a uh, topic partitioning and network configuration which I explained them in brief and it is good to have a recap on partitioning to describe the workload across multiple brokers can greatly improve the performance and network optimization minimize the latency minimizing latency improves the performance significantly so in conclusion the performance tuning is a critical aspects of Apache Kafka that can significantly impact the cluster throughput and reliability and efficiency. By understanding the factors affecting the performance and using the right strategies and best practices, you can, minim you can optimize your Kafka cluster for maximizing the performance and achieve the desired performance goal. So that's it for this video on Kafka Plus. Kefka cluster to performance tuning. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comment below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.
Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Zookeeper. In this video we are going to focus on what is Apache Zookeeper and if I want to put it in simple terms Apache Zookeeper is a powerful open source coordination service for distributed application. In this video we are going to explore what Apache Zookeeper is, its key features and how it benefits distributed system. So let's get us started. Before before we dive into Apache Zookeeper, let's quickly understand the concept of distributed systems. Uh, distributed systems are computer networks where multiple independent machines work together to achieve a common goal. These systems are designed to provide reliability, scalability, and fault tolerance. However, the coordinating and mani managing the in interaction between these machines can be challenging. This this is where Apache Zookeeper comes in. The Zookeeper acts as a centralized service for distributed system, providing a reliable and highly available infrastructure for coordinating and synchronization and configuration management. It simplifies the development and maintenance of the distributed application by handling complex tasks under the hood. Now let's uh, take a closer look at the key features of Apache Zookeeper. One of the most important features is hierarchical namespace. Zookeeper organizes data in hierarchical tree-like structure called namespace. Each node in the namespace, known as the Z node, can hold data, also serve as a parent for other Z nodes. In this hierarchical organization, allows us for efficient and flexible data management. We have also the data replication. Zookeeper ensures data reliability and fault tolerance through data replication. It replicates data across multiple Zookeeper servers forming a cluster. If a server fails, another server can take over its responsibility seamlessly. We have also the consensus and atomic broadcast which uh, employs the ZAB or Zookeeper atomic broadcast protocol to maintain a consistent view of distributed system. Zab ensures that all updates are ordered and that every server in the ensemble receives the same set of updates. We have also the watchers. Watchers are event notifications that allow distributed application to receive update about changes in the Zookeeper namespace. Application can register watches to be notified when a specific Zenode change enabling them to react dynamically to those changes. Now that we understand the key features, let's explore some common cases where Apache Zookeeper shines. One of them is configuration management. Zookeeper is commonly used for managing dynamic configuration setting across distributed system. Application can store their configuration data as Zenodes and other instances can watch for changes to react accordingly. We have also the distributed uh, locking. Zookeeper provides a distributed locking primitives that allow applications to impl implement coordination machines like distributed mutexes and read and write locks. This helps to prevent conflicts and ensures the correct execution order for critical operations. And we have also the leader election. Leader election um, refers to in a distributed system. Leader election in a distributed system it's often necessary to elect a leader among groups of nodes to coordinate actions. Zookeeper provides the necessary tools and algorithms to implement the leader election efficiently and reliably. We have also the service discovery. The zookeeper can be leveraged for service 
discovery where applications can register their persons and availability as Zenodes. Other applications can then discover and connect to available system dynamically. And lastly, let's explore the border Zookeeper ecosystem. Zookeeper clients can provide client libraries for various programming languages, allowing developers to interact with Zookeeper from their applications easily. Zookeeper recipes is commonly developed as a set of common patterns and recipes using the Zookeeper. These recipes provide a high level abstraction and resumable components for building distributed system. We have also the Zookeeper monitoring and management. Uh, several tools are available for monitoring and managing Zookeeper clusters such as Apache Zookeeper admin server and third party solutions like Exhibitor and Zoo Navigator. And now that, uh, and that concludes our overview of Apache Zookeeper. We explored what Apache Zookeeper is and its key feature and some popular use cases and its ecosystem with its hierarchical namespace data replication and powerful event notification and many other features that it has that we are going to explore in the later videos. So remember Zookeeper simplifies the development and management of distributed applications allowing developers to focus on building reliable, scalable and fault tolerant ecosystem. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. I hope this video was informative to you. If you have any question put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this educational video on Apache Zookeeper architecture. In this video we will be delving into the Apache Zookeeper architecture which is a centralized service for maintaining configuration information and synchronizing and providing distributed coordination for a large scale system. So let's get us started. Before we dive into the architecture, let's have an understanding of what is a distributed system. Multiple nodes often need to coordinate and agree on a certain action or share a critical information. This coordination becomes challenging as the system grows larger and more complex. Apache Zookeeper was designed to address this challenge. It provides a robust and reliable coordination service, enabling distributed applications to operate seamlessly. And now let's explore some key components of Zookeeper architecture. At the heart of the Apache Zookeeper is the ensemble, which consists of a group of servers forming a cluster. These servers work collaboratively to provide fault tolerant coordination service. Each server in the ensemble plays a, a specific role, either a leader or a follower. The leader is responsible for handling client requests, maintaining the state of the system and ensuring the consistency among the followers. Next we have the Zookeeper clients. These are the application or services that connect to the ensemble to perform operations such as reading and writing data and watching for changes or synchronizing with other clients. Zookeeper clients communicate with the ensemble through a session which represents the connection to the cluster. Sessions are a critical part because they are for maintaining stateful interactions and ensuring reliability. Now let's explore the data models in Zookeeper. It follows a hierarchical tree-like structure called the Zenode hierarchy. Each node can store data that has unique path within the hierarchy, similar to a file system. Zenodes can be ephemeral or persistent. Ephemeral Zenodes only exist and as long as session of the client that created them inactive. Persistent Zenodes on the other hand remain often remain even after a client disconnects. One of the powerful features of Zookeeper is watches. Clients can set watches on a specific Zenode to receive 
receive notifications when changes occur. This enables event-driven programming that reduces the need for continuous polling. Zookeeper guarantees a strong consistency, durability, and high availability. It achieves this by implementing a continuous protocol called Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast, which we mentioned briefly in the previous videos, which ensures all updates are applied in the same order across ensemble. The ZAP protocol or Zookeeper Atomic Broadcast protocol elects a leader among the servers using a variant of Pox's algorithm. This leader coordinates the order of updates and ensures that all followers replicate each changes. In case the leader fails, the Zookeeper automatically initiates a leader election, ensuring on on uninterrupted server so this makes it fault tolerant mechanism for enabling ensemble to handle failures gracefully. Apache Zookeeper finds application in a wide range of use cases. It commonly used for distributed coordination, leader election, distributed locking, configuration management and more. It simplifies the reliability making it a popular choice for building robust and distributed systems. Some notable system leveraging Apache Zookeeper include Apache Kefka, Hadoop, HBase, and many other. Zookeeper battle-tested architecture and performance have made a trusted component in various production environments. And there you have it. The Apache Zookeeper architecture is pretty simple to understand. We explored the ensemble, the role of leaders and followers, Zookeeper clients, hierarchical data model, watches, and the Zookeeper atomic broadcast. Remember, Apache Zookeeper provides a foundation for building reliable distributed system that can handle complex coordination tasks. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this educational video about Apache Zookeeper workflow. In this video, we are going to dive into the intricacies of Apache Zookeeper, which is a centralized service for maintaining configuration information, naming, and providing a distributed synchronization ecosystem and group services. So let's get us started. First, let me give you a brief about what is Apache Zookeeper. Apache Zookeeper is a distributed coordination service that helps managing distributed system by providing a hierarchical key value namespace, similar to fault system. It excels in providing reliable and highly available coordination primitives and some of its key features of Zookeeper include simple architecture which Zookeeper follows a simple client service model with a small highly available cluster of services. Another thing is high performance. It offers a low latency high throughput operations making it suitable for various use cases and another one is is coordination primitives. Zookeeper provides a set of primitives like logs, barriers, and queues that helps building distributed applications. A scalability is another key factor. It scales horizontally by adding more servers to the Zookeeper ensemble. And fault tolerance is among with one of the important features, and it can tolerate failures by electing a new leader if the primary leader goes down. We have the Atomicity. Zookeeper operations are atomic, ensuring the consistency and reliability. And now let's dive into the Zookeeper workflow. Understanding a key, fee, key component of how to handle Zookeeper data and coordination. Let's take a closer look at the key component of Apache Zookeeper and how to handle and coordinate data. One of them is data model. A zookeeper uses a hierarchical data model called Znode. Each Znode can store data as a byte array 
array similar to a file or directory in the file system. Z nodes are organized into a hierarchical namespace formatting a tree-like structure. We have also the watches. Zookeeper allows clients to set watches on the Z nodes. A watch is triggered when a data is associated with the Z node changes, allowing clients to be notified of the updates. Z nodes and insummable are another aspect. A zookeeper operates in a distributed environment with multiple nodes. These nodes from a zookeeper insummable where the majority of consensus is required for a consistent and reliable operation. Zookeeper workflow it can be explained in three parts. Bootstrapping the zookeeper ensemble, the client interaction with the zookeeper and coordinating distributed applications. So now let's dive into the workflow. First the bootstrapping the zookeeper ensemble. To start using a zookeeper we first need to set up an ensemble of the zookeeper servers. Each server has a unique ID and a majority of consistence is required for the ensemble to operate efficiently. The client interaction with zookeeper is another part. Clients interact with zookeeper to perform operations like reading, writing and coordinating distributed applications. Clients connect to any server in the ensemble to maintain a session. The server redirects the client to the leader who coordinates the requested operations. Coordinating distributed applications as I said is another aspect. Zookeeper provides a coordination primitives like locks, barriers and queues to assist in the building of distributed applications. These primitives ensure that different parts of the distributed system synchronizes their activity properly. Apache Zookeeper offers several guarantees that makes it reliable for choices and distributed systems. So let's explore them and understand their common use cases. Guarantee provided by zookeepers are first the sequential consistency. We can update from a client applied in the order where they have been sent. Second thing is atomicity. Third thing is a single system image. All clients see the same view of the namespace. We have the readability. Zookeeper ensures the durability of data even in the persistence of a failure. Some common use cases are configuration management. Zookeeper can store and distribute com configuration data across a cluster. A second thing is leader election. Zookeeper helps in electing leader among a group of nodes. Third thing is a distributed locking. It offers locks that enable mutually exclusive access to resources. And we have the synchronization zookeeper facilities and coordination among zookeeper facilitates coordination among distributed processes. In summary, Apache Zookeeper workflow and benefits are many. In summary, Apache Zookeeper is a powerful distributed coordination service that simplifies the development and management of distributed system. We covered the key components of workflow guarantees and use cases of Zookeeper. Some of the benefits include a simple architecture, high performance, scalability, and fault tolerance. Whether you're building a distributed application, manage configurations or coordinating pro processes Apache Zookeeper can be valuable in your arsenal. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Zookeeper terminologies. In this video, we are going to have a deep dive into fundamental concept of Apache Zookeeper and explore some terminologies associated with it. So let's get started. Apache Zookeeper is a distributed coordination service that provides a reliable and efficient synchronization for distributed system. It acts as a centralized repository for information and facilities 
coordinations between various components in a distributed environment. The first terminology that we are going to discuss is sessions. In a Zookeeper, a session is established when a client connects to Zookeeper server upon connection. A session ID is assigned to a client. This session is essential for executing requests in a first in first out or FIFO order. To keep sessions valid, the client sends a heartbeat to as a regular interval. If a server does not receive heartbeats from a client for longer than a specified session, the timeout period it considers the client as dead. Additionally, any inferral Z node creates created during the session will be automatically deleted when a session ends. The next technology that we are going to terminology that we are going to discuss is watches. Watches provides a me mechanism for clients to receive notification about changes in the zookeeper ensemble. When reading a specific Z node, clients can set watches on the Z node. If any changes occur on the watch, watch Z node or its children, the registered client will receive a notification. It is important to note that watches trigger only once, so if a client wants to receive subsequent, subsequent information, it needs to perform another read operation. Now let's explore Z nodes. In Zookeeper, every node in the Z every node in the Zookeeper tree is called Z node. Each Z node maintains a, a state structure that contains important metadata. This a structure includes version numbers for data changes, ACL or access control list, changes, timestamps, and more. The version number along with the timestamp allows Zookeeper to validate its cache and coordinates updates. Whenever a Z node data changes, its version number increases. When a client receives data, it retrieves a version of data for update or deletions. The client must supply the current version to ensure the consistency if the provided version does not match the actual version of the data and then the update will fail. Another important terminology is name service. The name service is a service that maps a name to some information associated with that name. In the next, in the concept of Zookeeper, it can be extended to function as group membership service providing information information about a group to which an entity belongs. We have also the distributed systems often require synchronization and access control mechanism. Zookeeper offers support for looking to implement distributed mutexes. These mutexes enable syn serialized access to share resources ensuring only one component can access resources one time. In addition, looking in addition to to locking Zookeeper facilities synchronization for accessing shared resources. Whether implementing a producer-consumer queue or barrier, Zookeeper provides a simple inf interface for synchronization access to shared resources, allowing component to coordinate action efficiently. Zookeeper can also serve as a configuration management tool. In a, it enables the central storage and management of the configuration for distributed system. By utilizing Zookeeper, administrators can easily update and distribute configuration settings across a system. The Leader election is another significant feature of Zookeeper and terminology, which I'm going to explain to you. And the and in a distributed systems node may go down and ensure the automatic failover. And becomes this part becomes a critical part of the Zookeeper features offer. And the Zookeeper offers a built-in support for leader election, enabling the system to elect a new leader when the current leader 
leader becomes unavailable. Finally, the zookeeper provides an ACL, which stands for access control list, and uh, ACL are used to control and access xenos within the zookeeper data tree. By setting appropriate ACL, administrators can enforce fine grain access control and ensure the security of the system. And that concludes our video on zookeeper technologies. We have covered the essential concepts that you will encounter throughout your career. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this educational video on Apache Zookeeper features. In this video we are going to explore the Apache Zookeeper and its features which is a distributed coordination, coordination service widely used in the world of distributed systems. So let's dive in, into it and understand what makes a Zookeeper so powerful and popular. And the first feature that we are going to discuss is the naming server. Apache Zookeeper assigns a unique identification similar to DNA to every node in the distributed system. This makes it easy to identify and track nodes, ensuring efficient communication and coordination. Zookeeper offers flexibility to update the status of each node in real time. This capability allows the systems to store and receive updates, updated information about each node across the entire cluster. It ensures that the system always has the latest and accurate data minimizing errors and inconsistencies. The Another point is managing a cluster which can be challenging sometimes but Zookeeper simplifies this process. It maintains the real-time status of each node providing a centralized view of the cluster. This comprehensive view helps in efficient cluster management reducing the changes and errors and ensuring both a smooth and easy operation. Zookeeper understands that failures are invincible in a distracted system, in a distributed system. To address this, it provides an automatic failure recovery mechanism when modifying data. Zookeeper locks it and ensures the data integrity in event of failure. The system can automatically recover and store data ensuring high availability high availability and reliability. Zookeeper simplifies the coordinations among distributed processes by using a shared hierarchical namespace. This shared namespace acts, acts as a common ground for different components of the distributed systems to communicate and synchronize their actions. This simplifies the communication enhances and the overall efficiency and effectness, effectiveness of the system. Reliability is a crucial aspect of any distributed system. Zookeeper excels in in different areas by providing reliable and fault tolerant environment. Even if you even if one or more nodes fail, Zookeeper continues to operate seamlessly, ensuring that the system remains functional and available to users. In Zookeeper, updates are assigned a unique number that denotes their order. This order update mechanism allows for the implementation of the higher level abstraction. The ordered nature of the updates ensure the consistency and helps in maintaining a coherent state of the system. And Zookeeper exhibits impressive speed, especially in the read dominant workloads. With read to write ratio of the 10 to 1, Zookeeper performs efficiently and responds quickly to read requests, making it suitable for applications where rapid access to data is crucial. As the demand on the distributed system increases, scalability becomes a crucial requirement. Zookeeper addresses this by allowing development of an additional mechanism to enhance the performance by adding more me machines 
for the system capability and throughput which can be increased and also increases the accommodation for growing workloads. In a distributed system, ensuring atmosphericity is essential for maintaining data consistency. The Zookeeper guarantees atmosphericity, atomicity during the data transfer. It ensures that either the entire data transfer operation succeeds or fails completely without leaving the system system in an inconsistent state. We have also the sequential consistency which is another crucial aspect of Zookeeper. It ensures that the updates from a client are applied in the same order where they were sent. This guarantees that the distributed system processes the updates in a consistent and predictable manner, maintaining the desired order of the operations. Zookeeper also provides a single system image meaning that regard regardless of the server client uh, the connection will have a concise view of the server. This feature ensures that all clients are accessing the distributed systems observe the same state, eliminating, eliminating any confusion or discrepancies. Zookeeper ensures the timelessness by keeping the client view of the system up to date within the defined frame. This timely synchronization allows clients to access the most recent data and make informed decision based on the current state of the distributed system. In conclusion, Apache Zookeeper offers a wide range of powerful features that address complexities of distributed system from an efficient naming service and real-time updates to automatic failure recoveries and scalability. Zookeeper provides a reliable and robust foundation for building distributed application. In simplicity, the speed and order approach makes it a popular choice among developers and system architectures Worldwide. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this educational video where we are going to discuss the Zookeeper data model. In this video, we are going to explore the various aspects of Zookeeper data model including Zenode, time tracking, and Zookeeper structure. So let's dive into it. The Zookeeper data model is based on a hierarchical namespace similar to distributed file systems. However, Zookeeper introduces a unique concept where each node in the namespace called a Z node that can that can contain both associated data and be accessed within the child nodes. Path in the zookeeper are always expressed in the canonical absolute flash separated format unlike relative preferences. Zookeeper doesn't support them. Now let's discuss the constraint on the path names in zookeeper. There are certain uh, constraints on the path names in Zookeeper. First, the null characters, which is represented in a slash u quadruple zero, and should not be part of the path name as they can cause problems within the C binding. Second, characters ranging from the a slash u triple zero one up to a slash u double zero nineteen and dash u double zero seven f up to nine f and they are not allowed to display these issues and third characters are such as the ud eight hundred uf eight triple f and dash u triple f zero and u quadruple f there are also restricted final finally path containing the ux triple f e to ux quadruple f where x is a digit from 1 to e and the dash u quadruple 0 and the u 5 f as you can see right here in the screen are not allowed it's important to note that while the dot characters can be part of the another name it cannot be used in alone or with double dot 
dot to indicate a node along a path this imitation exists because the zookeeper does not support a relative path accidentally to be broken in zookeeper and it is reserved and cannot be used in path names so now let's discuss the different component of zookeeper data model in a more detail the centralized entity in the zookeeper data model is the z node each z node maintains a set of a structure which consists of version numbers for data changes and timestamps and other information the zookeeper employee zookeeper employs various mechanisms to track time so let's take a closer look at them one time tracking mechanism in zookeeper is the zookeeper transition id commonly known as the zx id every change made to the zookeeper state receive a unique zx id this allows for total ordering of all changes in zookeeper version numbers are another important aspects of time tracking in zookeeper they are associated with different types of changes in to the zeno the version represents the number of changes to the data of the zeno the c version indicates the number of changes to the children of the zeno the a version denotes the number of changes to access the c the acl of the zeno and if you forgot acl stands for access control list and there are tickets used to buy servers to define the timing of event in a multi-server zookeeper setup they play they play a role in the session timeout a status upload and connections timeouts between pairs and more the take time directly affects the minimum session timeout now let's explore the zookeeper status structure which provides important information about the zeno the status Data structure contains various fields that describe the zenode. CZX ID represents the ZX ID of changes that created by the zenode. MZX ID represents the ZX ID of the most recent modification to the zenode. The seed time indicates the time in milliseconds since each epoch when the zenode was created. M time represents time in milliseconds since epoch since the epoch when the zenode was last modified we have the version which denotes the number of changes to the data of the zenode c version represents the number of changes to the children of the zenode and a version indicates the number of changes to the acl of the zenode and we have the ephemeral owner which if the zenode is ephemeral we have the ephemeral owner Owner, if the Z node is ephemeral, this field contains the session ID of the owner, otherwise it is set to zero. We have the data length which represents the length of the data field associated with the Z node, and we have finally the num children that indicates the number of children of the Z node. So that wraps our uh, explanation about Apache Zookeeper data model. We discussed the Z nodes and tracking mechanism and the structure of the zookeeper stat remember understanding the data model in zookeeper is pretty essential and you have to work with it to understand it so that's it for this video i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video where we are going to discuss finally the nodes and z nodes in the apache zookeeper in this video we are going to have a deep dive into the concept of zookeeper nodes and their characteristics and especially we are going to focus on the z node so let's get us started first let's understand what zookeeper nodes are in apache zookeeper every node in the zookeeper tree is called z node these z nodes serve 
serves the fundamental unit for minimizing state and coordinations within the zookeeper system. The structure of Z-node is essential to grasp each Z-node is associated with a set of a structure which involves diversions for data that changes and access control list changes. Additionally, the set the stat structure also holds the timestamps. The primary purpose of the stat structure within the Z-node is to enable the zookeeper to validate the cache and coordinates updates. When a Z-node data changes, the version number increases, ensuring that the changes are properly tracked. So let's have an understand of the significance of versioning and data retrieval in the zookeeper. When a client retrieves a data from a Z-node, it also retrieves the version of the data. This version helps the client maintain consistency while performing updates or deletions. One of the essential characteristics of Z-node is ability to set watches. Clients can set watches on the Z-node which will trigger notifications whenever changes occur on the watches on the watched Z-node. Once watch is triggered, it is automatically cleared. Moving on, so let's talk about the data access control if you don't understand or not familiar with it. In the Zookeeper, data is stored within a Z-node that can be written from atomicity. Clients can read all data bytes associated with a Z-node while writing and replacing existing data. ACL restricts the operations that can be performed on the Z-node. Let's dive into the concept of ephemeral nodes in the Zookeeper. Ephemeral Z-node exists as long as the session that created them remains active. Once the session ends, these Z-nodes are automatically deleted and it is important to note the ephemeral Z-nodes cannot have children. Another interesting feature of Z-node is a sequence node. When when creating a Z-node, you can request a zookeeper to append monotonically increasing the counter to the end of the path. This counter is unique to the present Z-node and it helps in maintaining order. It is formed as the percentage sign 010D for sorting purposes. To summarize, the Zookeeper nodes are essential elements in Apache Zookeeper with each node being a Z-node and Z-nodes have various characteristics including watches for changes notifications. Data access within the ACL, ephemeral nodes try to session lifetimes, and sequence node for unique naming and ordering. That brings us to the end of this educational video on Apache Zookeeper nodes and Z nodes. I hope this video was informative to you and you have a solid understanding of nodes and Z nodes right now. And thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next. Hello and welcome to this educational video about Zookeeper leader election. In this video, we are going to discuss the leader election in Zookeeper, which is pretty important and essential to know. Before we dive into details, let's first understand what Zookeeper leader election is all about. In the Zookeeper, a leader is elected by a group of servers, also known as the ensembles, to manage a client request and maintain the zookeeper state. The leader is responsible for ordering and processing a client request that involves changing the zookeeper state, such as creating, setting data, or deleting nodes. It acts as a central coordinator so now let's explore the process of leader election in Zookeeper in detail. One simple approach to leader election is by using the sequence and inferral flags while creating Z nodes that represents a client proposal. To 
initiate leader election each server creates a child Zenode under the designed path so let's say the slash election um, these Zenodes are created when both the sequence and ephemeral these Zenodes are created with both sequence and ephemeral flags zookeeper automatically appends the sequence number to each child Zenode ensuring its high higher than my previous than any previous appendant sequence number the leader is the server that created the zenode with the smallest sequence number however it's a crucial point to handle leader failures if the current leader's current leader fails the new leader needs to be created needs to be elected one solution is to have all apl application processes and monitor the current smaller node a smaller z node and check if it goes away to become a new leader but this approach may result in the herd efficient to avoid the hair deficient zookeeper provides a mechanism where processes receive a notification upon the deletion of the current smallest zenode then the get children operation on the election path to obtain the updated list get children operation on the dash election path and obtains the updated list of children the p pseudo code for zookeeper leader election can be summarized as follows the code illustrate the process of violating value the updated list of children it's important to note that being the smallest zenode does not necessarily means the creator is aware of being the current leader additional mechanisms such as creating a separate zenode can be used to acknowledge the leader execution and that the process of leader election in apache zookeeper by following this approach zookeeper ensures the reliable and cons consistent coordination among servers in a distributed system i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video about apache zookeeper cli or, or command line interface in this video we are going to have a deep dive into the command line interface of apache zookeeper before we begin let's understand what zookeeper cli is the zookeeper cli is a command line tool used for interacting with zookeeper ensemble and interacting with the zookeeper ensemble during the development it allows developers to debug work with different options and perform various operations on a zookeeper ensemble to get us started with the zookeeper cli we need to first start the zookeeper server this is done by running the command bin dash zk server dot ch start once the server is up and running we can start the zookeeper client by running the command bin dash zk cli dot ch now that after that the zookeeper cli prompt opens and we can explore the different different operations and we can perform the duties that we want first operation that we are going to look at is creating zenodes to create a zenode we need to use the create command followed by the path and data for the zenode by default zenodes are persistent and another example example is if we want to create an ephemeral sequence of Zenode by using flags and we can do that additionally we can create ephemeral and sequential Zenode by using flags ephemeral Zenodes are automatically deleted when a session expires or when a client disconnects sequential Zenodes ensure the unique path by the appending a sequence number 
to create an ephemeral Z node, we need to use the E dot flag and create a sequence of Z node. We use the dash S flag and Zookeeper appends a sequence of numbers to the Z node path to ensure the uniqueness. The next operation we will explore is getting data from the Znode. The get command receives the data and metadata associated with the specific Znode. We use the get command to retrieve the data and metadata of the Znode. We get the information like when a data was last modified and its length. Now let's learn about the watch feature in the Zookeeper CLI. The watch command allows us to set the watch on the Znode so we will receive a notification when a Znode or its children data is being changed. By adding watch option to the command we can set the <coughs> we can set the watch on the Znode this means that if the Zeno data changes, we will receive a notification. The set command is used to update the data, data of the Zeno. It allows us to modify the content of the Zeno. In this example, we use this set of command to update the data of the Zeno. We specify the path of the Zeno that we want to update and we provide the new, and we provide the new data. Another useful command is the ls command which lists the children of the Znode. By using the ls command followed by the path of the Znode, we can list the children. This helps us to explore the ex structure of the Znode ensemble. Lastly, we can explore the delete command which is used to delete Znodes from the Zookeeper ensemble. Which the delete command, with the delete command, we can remove Znodes by specifying its path if the Z node has children, they will be also deleted unless we specify the dash or flag. So that's it on this video about Apache Zookeeper CLI and we learn how to create, receive and watch and update and delete data and also list children. And the Zookeeper CLI is a powerful tool for interacting with Zookeeper ensembles during its development. So that's it for this video. I I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Zookeeper ACL or Access Control List. In this video we are going to explore the concept of ACL in Apache Zookeeper and I'm going to provide a deep detailed explanation of it for you. So what is exactly Apache Access Control List? It's a security feature in Apache Zookeeper that allows you to control access to Znode within the Zookeeper cluster. In Zookeeper every Z node has an associated ACL that defines who can perform a specific operations on that Z node. This ensures that the only authorized clients can read, write, create, or delete Z nodes and uh, providing and provide us with a robust access control mechanism for our distributed application. Now let's take a closer look at various permissions available in Apache Zoo Zookeeper ACL. The following permissions are supported in the Zookeeper ACL include the create with which this permission allows a client to create a child node under a specific Z node. We have the read. With the read permission a client can retrieve data from a Z node and list its children. We have the write. The write permission enables a client to a set of data for Z nodes. We have the delete which the client with the delete permission can delete a child node. We have the admin which the admin permission guarantees clients ability to modify ACL and set permissions. Apache Zookeeper provides several built-in ACL schemes that you can use to define access control with your Z node. So let's explore them. The following are the built-in ACL schemes in Zookeeper. The word in this scheme 
team has a single ID anyone which represents any user or any client we have the auth the auth scheme doesn't use any ID and represent represents any authenticated user we have the D guest the D guest scheme requires user name and passport combination which is sent in a clear text and encoded using the base 64 and SHA-1. We have the IP. This scheme uses the client host IP as the ID and to work with ACL in Apache Zookeeper, you can leverage a Zookeeper C client API which provides a helpful constraint constants and structure. So let's explore them. Here are some constraints, constants available in Apache Zookeeper C client API. We have the zoo perm read. This represents the permission to read a node value and list of its children. We have the zoo perm write and keep in mind the way they are being written is that zoo with double o underscore p e r m underscore write. So what I'm reading to you they have the underscore between between them but I'm not reading them for simplicity reasons and the right signifies the permission to set the node value we have the zoo perm create which indicates the permission to create children nodes we have the zoo perm delete which represents the permission to delete children node we have the zoo perm admin which grants admins permission for the execution of set ACL method we have the zoo perm all which combines all above flags together the zookeeper c client api also provides a standard acl structure the zoo anyone id unsafe represents the id word with the value of anyone and the zoo auth ids refers to an empty id string which should be considered as the identity of the creator additionally zookeeper offers three standard ACL vectors, the zoo open ACL on safe which grants all permissions to zoo perm all gets the anyone and the zoo anyone ID on safe and the zoo read ACL on safe provides a read access only to zoo perm read and changes it to anyone. We have the zoo creator all ACL which grants all permissions to the zoo perm all and the creator gets the zoo auth IDs. Now let's explore some operations in Apache Zookeeper that deals with AP ACL. We have the zoo add auth. This operation allows application to authenticate itself on the server using different schemes and identities. We have the zoo create which is an operation used to create a new node with the associated ACL. The ACL parameter specifies a list of ACL associated with the node. We have the zoo get ACL method. This operation retrieves the ACL information of a specific node. And that concludes our video about Apache Zookeeper ACL. We covered the concept of ACL. We discussed about available permissions and we explored the built-in ACL schemes and we examined the Zookeeper C client API and and even provide some method for you to better understand them so that's it for this video I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this educational video about Apache Zookeeper Client API. In this video we are going to explore the various aspects of Zookeeper Client API and how to identify use, how to efficiently use it in our distributed system. Apache Zookeeper Client API provides developers with a powerful set of tools to connect, interact, and coordinate actions within a Zookeeper ensemble. Whether you are working with Java or C, Zookeeper offers an official binding for both languages. So let's get started by looking at the Java binding. 
The Zookeeper Java binding consists of two main packages, the org.apache.zookeeper and the org.apache.zookeeper.data and these packages contain classes where used internally or are the part of the server implementation. The central class in the Zookeeper um, Java client is the Zookeeper class. It provides methods for con connecting to Zookeeper Zookeeper ensemble creating session manipulating data and more. The Zookeeper class has two constructors, one with an optional session ID and password and other without one. It also supports session recovery across instances of processes when a Zookeeper is object object is create created two threads are also created and in a new thread and an event thread and even an event thread the IO thread handles all input and output operations using Java and IO while the event thread handles the event backlogs the zookeeper API supports <coughs> the zoo the Zookeeper API supports both, both syn synchronous and asynchronous operations. The synchronous methods block until the response is retri retrieved while the asynchronous method returns immediately and uses the callback to uh, notify the application when operation is complete. There are few important considerations when using the Zookeeper Java building. First callback asynchronous completions are processed one at a time in order. It's important to ensure that no other callbacks are processed during the long longevity operation. Second, the callbacks do not block the process of the IO thread or synchronization calls. This allows for cur current operations without waiting for callbacks to complete. Lastly, ordering of synchronization calls may not be perceived so it is essential to handle responses appropriately. Now let's shift our focus to the Zookeeper C binding. The C binding provides both multi-threaded library and a single threaded library depending on your application needs. The multi-threaded library creates an IO thread and event dispatch thread to handle connection and maintenance and callbacks. On the other hand the same single thread library is suitable for event dri driven application and exposes an event loop for integrations. So that wraps, our, that wraps our video on Apache Zookeeper Client ABI, API and its Java and C binding. And I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this educational video about Apache Zookeeper queues. In this video we will be exploring the concept of distributed queues, the priority queues and producer customer queues using the Apache Zookeeper. So let's dive into it. Let's begin by understanding distributed queues in Apache Zookeeper. A distributed queue is a common data structure where clients can add elements to the queue and remove then remove them in a sequential order. To implement a distributed queue in the Zookeeper, we create a Z node which represents the queue. The clients can add elements to queue by calling the create method with the path name adding in the queue and um, the sequence and inferral flags to set it to set it to true the create method generates a unique sequence of number ensuring the order of elements in the queue the resulting path name of the new z node will include the sequence number indicating the position of the element in the queue clients can remove themselves from the queue by calling the get children method which returns 
contains a list of children Zenode, child Zenodes under the Q Zenode. The client starts processing the Zenode with the lowest sequence number and produces sequentially. If there are no elements in the queue, the client waits for the watch notification before checking the queues again. This ensures an efficient handling of the empty queues. Now let's explore the priority queues in the Apache Zookeeper. A priority queues assigns a priority to each element allowing higher priority elements to be processed first. To implement a priority queue we can make and a slight modification to a distributed queue approach. The path name of the Z node now ends with the Q-YY where double Y represents the priority of the element. The lowest priority number indicates the higher prior priority elements. Just like before, each element is assigned with a sequence number for maintaining the order within the same priority level. This ensures that the oldest element with the highest priority is the next one to be consumed. It's important to note that when a watch notification triggers for the queue Zenode, clients need to invalidate the previously obtained children list to ensure the up-to-date view of the priority queues. We have um, also the producer customer queues in the Apache Zookeeper. A producer consumer queue is a desk distributed data structure used to generate and consume items. In, the, in this implementation, a root node represents the queue and the producer processes creates a new node as a child of the root node to add an element to a queue. Before adding element, the consumer of the queue object checks if the root node exists. If not, it creates a root node during the new queue create method. To add an element to a queue, the producer processes calls to the produce method and passes an integer as an element. The method creates a new node using the create and ensuring the element is appended to a sequence counter associated with the root node. On the other hand, the consumer processes removes an element from the queue and it starts by obtaining the children of the root node using the children method. The children, uh, the list of children is returned in a lexicographical order and the consumer processes then identifies an element within the smallest counter value by traversing the list and removing the prefix element from each name node. Node name, once identified it reads a consumer consumes elements. If the queue is empty the consumer processes if the queue is empty the consumer processes wait for the new element by using the mutex and wait method by using the mutex and the wait method this ensures efficient processing without unnecessary polling and that brings us to the end of the video about apache zookeeper queues we explored the distributed queues priority queues and producer consumer queues and i hope you understand Understood them all and you learned something from this video if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Zookeeper Logs. In this video we are going to explore the concept of Zookeeper Logs and including the shared log and recoverable shared logs. I will cover everything you need to know about Apache Zookeeper Logs and how you can implement them and utilizing these logs in your distributed system. So let's get a start. Before we dive into Apache Zookeeper logs, let's understand them first. Logs in Apache Zookeeper that provides a global synchronization. This means that any given at any given point in time, no two clients believe they hold the same key. Zookeeper offers mechanism to implement these logs similar to Zookeeper queries with 
priorities now let's walk through a step by step of implementing zookeeper locks to obtain a lock you can follow these processes first define a lock node just like the zookeeper queues the lock node acts as a reference point for acquiring the lock and the second step is using the create method create a node under the lock node with the sequence and feral flags set for the example you can use the path name like lock node dash lock to create it and uh, we can call the get children method on the lock node without setting the watch flag this step helps avoid the heard effect where multiple clients wake up unnecessarily step four is if the path name created in the second step has a low sequence number suffix it means that the client acquired the lock at this point the client can exit the lock equation protocol if the path name returned by the get children and does not have a lower sequence number call the exist method which with the next lowest sequence number and set the watch flag under the path in the lock directory if step 6 is that if the exist method returns a false you go back to step 3 otherwise wait for the notification for path name from the previous step and the relating lock in the zookeeper is a straightforward clients simply need to delete the node they created in the step 2 and the lock will be released the zookeeper logs locks offer several advantages over the traditional locking mechanism so let's explore them the first advantage is, is the herd effect previation since each node is watched only one client the removal of the node will wake up only that a specific client this eliminates unnecessary wake-ups and reduces the herd effect second advantage is no pulling timeouts zookeeper logs don't require clients to continuously pull or set timeouts the lock the lock acquisition process is event driven ensuring the efficiency and reducing the consumption the third advantage is easy debugging and monitoring with the zookeeper keeper logs it's easier to identify the log contention debug locking problems and monitor the estate logs this helps in maintaining the stability and performance of your distributed systems in addition regular logs in zookeeper also support the shared logs by modifying the zookeeper log protocol and you can implement shared logs in the zookeeper so let's explore how to obtain the shared logs in the zookeeper first step is for obtaining the read log is to create a node with the path name like lock node dash read using the create method make sure to set both the sequence and inferral flags and call the get children method on the lock node without setting the watch flag and check if the client has the lock and can exit the protocol by verifying if there are no children with the path name starting with right and having a lower sequence number than the node created created in the first steps if exists returns false go back to the step 2 otherwise wait for notification for the path name from the previous step for obtaining a lock or obtaining a right lock create a node with the path name like lock node dash right using the create method and set both sequences in feral flags and in the step 6 you should call the get children method on the lock node without setting the watch flag and a step 7 if is that check if a client has one lock by ensuring there are no children with the low sequence number than the node created in the step 5 and lastly the step 8 if the exist method returns false go back to a step 6 and and uh, wait for notification and otherwise wait for notification for path name from the previous step and furthermore you can make a shared lock in the zookeeper revocable by modifying the shared lock protocol this variant is also known as the re recoverable shared locks so let's talk 
talk about the steps to obtain the recoverable shared lock in the zookeeper after calling the create method you can update the reader and writer locks protocol and call the get data with the watch flag set this ensures that the children receive a notification for node if a client receives a notification and finds a string lock in the node it should call the get data on the on that node and again this indicates that the client must release the lock by writing unlock to the node and calling the set data on the lock node the client can request the lock holder to release the lock so in conclusion the apache zookeeper lock provides a global synchronization in distributed systems by implementing step and utilizing shared recoverable shared keys shared locks and you can ensure the efficient and reliable coordination among clients zookeeper offers advantages such as herd effect prevention elimination of the polling or timeouts and easier debugging and monitoring i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Zookeeper watches. In this video we are going to explore the world of Apache Zookeeper watches, their features and guarantees and everything you need to know about them. Before we dive into the interactics of Apache Zookeeper watches, let's start by having a brief overview of what Apache Zookeeper watch is. All read operations such as get data get children and exist methods have the option to set a watch as a side effect zookeeper watches can be defined as a mechanism that allows clients to set a watch on a specific z node when a watch is set the client receives a one-time trigger known as the watch event if there are if there is any changes in data associated with the z node and there are three important important points to consider when understanding the zookeeper watches let's explore each them each of them in real time in detail when a watch is set to on the z node a client will receive a watch event for that z node if all data changes if it if its data changes however the client will not receive any further watches events unless it performs another read operations that sets a new watch this this one-time trigger ensures that the client is notified of the changes in data but it will not receive additional watch event unless it explicitly set a new watch. A watch event is set from the zookeeper server to the client that sets the watch. However, it is important to note that the event may not reach the client immediately. There could be some delay due to network latency or other factors. Zookeeper guarantees that a client will not see the changes, see the change data until it first receives the corresponding watch event. This ensures the ordering guarantee where, efficient, where different clients will have a consistent order of event. The data for which the watch was set allows two types of watches, the data zookeeper watches and the child zookeeper watches data watches are set during the get date get data method and exist operations which receive information about the node data child watches are using the get children operation which receive retrieves the list of children both data watches and child watches are maintained locally by the zookeeper servers connected to the client these watches are lightweight and trigger when a corresponding responding data or children changes now let's discuss some additional aspects and guarantees provided by zookeeper watches we have the order events watches in zookeeper are guaranteed to be delivered in order with the aspect to other events other watches and asynchronous replies in the zookeeper client 
libraries ensure that events are dispatched in order and we have the watch event before a new data the a client this happens when a client will always receive a watch event for a z node before seeing the new data corresponding to that z node this ensures that the client are notified of changes in the timely manner and here are some important things to remember about zookeeper watches first is one time trigger a watch time a watch is one time trigger if you want to be notified of the future changes you need to set another watch after receiving a watch event we have the latency coordinations due to network latency and the nature of the one time trigger it is not possible to rely to see every changes that happened in the to a node in the zookeeper be prepared to handle cases where multiple changes occur between the receiving watch event and setting a new watch we have the unique trigger a watch object or function context pair will only trigger once for a giving notification connection and reconnections is another aspect which watches are not received while the disconnect while they are disconnected from the server however when a client reconnects previously a registered watch will be triggered and re registered transparently so and that wraps it up in conclusion zookeeper watches are powerful mechanisms that allow clients to set watches on a specific z node providing timely notification of the data changes by understanding their features guarantees and considerations you can effectively utilize zookeeper watches in your distributed system so that's about it i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video about apache zookeeper sessions in this video we are going to explore the sessions in zookeeper so let's dive into it before we dive into sessions and their implementation let's quickly recap what apache zookeeper session is session in the context of zookeeper plays a crucial role in maintaining client server interactions a session is established as soon as the zookeeper clients connect the zookeeper server and, un and a unique session id is assigned to a client these sessions are essential for proper functions to ensure the validity of the zookeeper session clients send periodic heartbeats to the zookeeper ensemble heartbeats are es essentially messages that sent by the client to indicate that they are still active and connected by receiving these heartbeats at a regular interval to the zookeeper ensemble can determine whether a client is alive or has encountered uh, connectivity issues zookeeper session timeout is a critical parameter that determines the minimum duration of interactivity between the, a client and the zookeeper ensemble if a zookeeper ensemble does not receive heartbeats from a client within the a specific session time period it assumes that a client has died or lost connectivity this session is considered expired at that point when a zookeeper client establishes a session it creates a handle to a zookeeper service using the language binding the client library then attempts to connect to the to one of the zookeeper servers to the ensemble once the connection is established the client moves from the initial connection state to the connected state now let's take a closer look at various transactions a zookeeper session can undergo the zookeeper session can transaction between the states such as connected or connecting or closed these states transaction occurred in a response to a default different events such as error explicit 
requested closing closure by application sessions expiring or authentication failure. The next, we will explore how session IDs and passwords are guaranteed in the Zookeeper, and when a client establishes a session with the Zookeeper service, a unique 64-bit session ID is assigned by the Zookeeper server. As a security measure, a server also guarantees a password associated with the session ID. This password is sent to the client during the connection handshake and is used for authentication when a client needs to re-establish the session with the different Zookeeper server. The Zookeeper session timeout is a crucial parameter that impacts the session behavior so let's understand its significance. When creating a Zookeeper session, a client specifies the session timeout in milliseconds. The server responds to the actual session timeout it can provide based on a client request value. This timeout duration determines the maximum time interval between heartbeats that client should send to keep session alive. Now let's dive into session re-establishment and expiration. When a connectivity between a client and at least one Zookeeper server is re-established after its disconnection, the session will transact transition back to the connected state. However, if the Zookeeper client uh, Zookeeper cluster does not receive heartbeats from a client within the session timeout period, the session is considered expired. In such cases, the Zookeeper cluster automatically deletes the inferral node associated with that session. It's important to note that when a session is expired, the client is not immediately notified. The client remains disconnected from a cluster until it can re-establish the TCP connection. Once it is reconnected, the client receives a session expired information including the expiration of the previous session. So that wraps it up and uh, we covered the creation of client session, session state transition, session ID, password session, timeouts and the session re-establishment and session expiration. Zookeeper sessions are vital for maintaining distributed connection in Zookeeper Ensemble. They enable reliable communication and synchronization between clients and servers, ensuring the proper functions of the distributed system. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any, if you have any question, put it down in the comment below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Zookeeper Barriers. In this video we are going to take a look at Zookeeper Barriers which is an essential tool for synchronization computation among a group of processes. So let's dive into it and understand them. First let's understand what Apache Zookeeper Barriers are. A Zookeeper Barriers is a primitive that enables a group of processes to synchronize the beginning and the end of the computation. It ensures that the processes start their computation only when a sufficient number of processes have joined the barrier. The implementation of the Zookeeper barrier involves having a barrier node for each individual process node. The barrier node acts as a parent node and every process creates its own corresponding node under the barrier node. For example, if we want to have a Zookeeper barrier node called dash B11, each process that has P will create a node named dash B11-P. Now let's take a closer look at Zookeeper barriers and let's ha have an example in mind. Each process initiates a barrier object which takes a Zookeeper server address, the root path of the barrier node and the size of the process group as a parameters. Inside of the barrier constructor, a Zookeeper instance 
instance is created using the provided server address then a barrier node is created on the zookeeper acting as a parent node for all processes <coughs> processes nodes this barrier node is created only if it doesn't already exist once the barrier object are initiated the processes can start using the barrier the enter method is called by the processes to enter the barriers it creates a node under the root path to represent the processes using its host name the processes then waits until the enough processes have been entered the barrier when a process finishes its computation it is it calls the leave method to leave the barrier the processes deletes its own contributing node corresponding node and checks if there are any remaining children node on the root path if there are it waits for notification until all processes have been left the barrier now let's talk about the double barriers in zookeeper double barriers are used to synchronize the beginning and the end of the computation among clients all processes start their computation and leave the barrier once they have been finished but only when enough processes have joined the barrier the cycle is completed to better understand the double barriers let's take a closer look at pseudo core code representation of the enter and leave entered and leave the procedures in the enter procedure a client processes registration registers with the barrier node and waits until the specific number of processes have been reassigned bef before proceeding with the computation the leave procedure unregisters a client process from the barrier node when it is ready to leave in the enter procedure each process watches a ready node and creates an inferral node as a child of the barrier node upon the entering the barrier the processes wait for the ready node to appear and the last process to create its node will see all required node in the list of children it it then creates a ready node signaling other processes to wake up and proceed. When a process wants to leave the barrier, it deletes the process node and then checks if there are if there are any remaining processes node. If there are, waits for the notification until process nodes have been removed. Once there are no no processes node left, the processes the processes can exit the barrier. And that wraps it up on zookeeper barriers and the valuable primitives for synchronizing computation among processes ensuring the coordinated and efficient execution so in this video we learned about zookeeper barriers allow procedures to synchronize and begin at the beginning and end of the computation and each process creates a node under the barrier node and computation start when enough processes have been joined we also explored the concept of double barriers and saw how they enable clients to synchronize their computation. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Logstash and its architecture. Logstash is an open source data processing tool used for collecting, transforming and ingesting data into various destinations. Whether you are a developer, data engineer or someone interested in data processing, this course will provide a comprehensive understanding of Logstash. So let's get started. Before we dive into its architecture, let's have an overview of Logstash and what it is. Logstash is a part of Elastic Stack, a set of powerful open source tools for data processing and anal analysis. Logstash acts as a data pipeline facilitate facilitating the collection, transforming and transporta transportation of data from various sources to multiple destinations such as Elasticsearch, databases or even external systems. The Logstash architecture that 
that we are going to explore follows a pipeline based approach where data follow flows through a series of uh, stages for processing. The architecture consists of th three primary components, the inputs, filters, and the outputs. First, let's talk about the inputs. The first component is inputs. Input defines the source of data for Logstash. Logstash provides a wide range of input plugins allowing you to ingest data from source like log files, message queues, databases, or even web services. These plugins enable Logstash to efficiently collect data from diverse systems and formats. Once the data enters the Logstash through the input plugin, it passes through the second component, which is filters. Filters perform data transformation and inheritance. Logstash offers an ex extensive collection of filter plugins such as group, JSON, mutate, and many more. These plugins enable you to parse, modify, in and enhance the incoming data, ensuring it's inf ensuring it is a structure and ready for further processing. After the data has been processed by the filters, it is moved to the final component, which is output. Outputs defined where the processed data should be sent. Logstash supports various output plugins, including the Elasticsearch, database man messaging system, and external services. You can configure multiple outputs, allowing you to store distribute data to different destinations simultaneously. To bring everything together, Logstash relies on a configuration file. The configuration file specifies the pipeline stages including the inputs, filters, and the outputs along with their respective configurations. Logstash uses a simple intuitive domain, domain a specific language called DSL for defining the pipeline. By editing the configuration file, you can customize the behavior of Logstash to fit your specific data processing requirements. Logstash is, is designed to be scalable and performant. It supports horizontal scaling by allowing you to distribute the data processing load across multiple Logstash instances. Additionally, Logstash employs the various techniques such as parallel processing, batch operations, and buffering. To optimize the performance and handle large volume of data efficiently. Logstash flexibility and versatility makes it suitable for a wide range of use cases. It is commonly used in the log analytics where it collects and processes log data from various sources, providing a valuable insight and monitoring capabilities. Additionally, Logstash can be used for data integrations, data inheritance, and real-time data processing scenarios. So in summary, Logstash is a powerful data processing tool that forms the essential component of Elastic Stack. Its pipeline-based architecture consists of inputs, filters, and output, as I said before, enables efficient data collection, transformation, and distribu distribution by leveraging its extensive plugin ecosystem. Logstash provides a flexibility to handle diverse data sources and destination with Logstash. You can process your data efficiently unlocking its potential for analysis and decision making. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comment below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Logstash input plugins. In this video, we are going to explore the various aspects of Logstash input plugin and how they enable you to efficiently collect data from different sources. So let's dive into it. Logstash is a powerful open source data processing tool that allows you to collect your data, transform and store data from various sources. Logstash plugin input plays a crucial role in fetching data and 
bringing it to the Logstash pipeline for processing. These plugins support a wide range of input sources, including files, databases, network protocols, and more. One of the most commonly used Logstash input plugin is the file input plugin. This plugin allows Logstash to continuously monitor and read data from log files, making an ideal choice for a real-time log analysis and it supports various file format and provides a flexibility in tailing and reading data files. The best input plugin, the Beats input plugin is designed to retrieve data from Elastic Beats which are a lightweight data shippers and uh, Elastic uh, can Beats can collect and send data from wide range of sources such as logs, matrix and network data. Logstash with the Beats input plugin act as a central hub to process and further distribute this data. We have also the JDBC input plugin for those dealing with relational database the JDBC input plugin comes in handy. It allows Logstash to execute SQL queries against a database and fetch data from tables. With this plugin you can extract information from databases and transform it for downstream processing, indexing or analytics. And the syslog input plugin enables Logstash to retrieve log messages from the network devices, servers and applications that follow the syslog protocol. It is widely used for centralizing and analyzing system logs making it easier to detect and troubleshoot issues across various components of the IT infrastructure. We have the HTTP input plugin that allows Logstash to accept data sent via the HTTP request. It provides a HTTP endpoint where data can be posted, making it suitable for integrating Logstash with an external system or retrieving data from webhooks. This plugin is useful when you need to ingest data from web services or applications. Apart from the mentioned plugins, Logstash offers many more input plugins that cater to different data sources and use cases. Some some noteworthy plugins include the S3, Kafka, SNMP, and many others. The executable nature of the Logstash enables you to easily incorporate these plugins into your data processing workloads. So to wrap this video up, we covered the essential aspect of Logstash input plugins. We explored the various plugins such as the file input plugin, beat input plugin, JBC input plugin, system log input plugin and HTT plugin and these plugins empower you to collect data from a diverse source, sources enabling seamless integration and processing within the Logstash ecosystem. That's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this educational video about Logstash output plugins. In this video we are going to explore the various aspects of Logstash input plugin and how they can enhance your data processing and delivery capability. So let's dive into it without further ado. Logstash is a powerful open source data processing tool that allows you to collect, transform and ship data from various sources into multiple destinations. Output plugin in Logstash is a crucial role in determining where your process data will be sent to. They enable seamless integration with a wide range of systems and services. So let's take a closer look at different types of Logstash input plugins. Logstash provides a rich set of output plugins, each designed to cater to a specific use cases and destinations. Here are some type of commonly used types. We have the Elastic 
search output plugin this plugin allows you to index your process data directly into Elasticsearch a highly scalable search and analytics engine it provides efficient and real-time data storage and retrieval capabilities fall we have the file output plugin as well with this plugin you can write your process data to a local file or network system it offers flexibility in defining file formats and supporting compression out options we have the kefka plugin if you are using the apache kefka as your messaging system this plugin enables you to publish your process data to kefka topics it ensures reliable and scalable data streaming and we have the amazon s3 output plugin this plugin facilitates storing your process data in amazon s3 highly durable and scalable object storage service it is useful for achieving archiving and backing up purposes jdb jdbc output plugin if you need to insert your process data into a relational database this plugin allows you to establish a connection and perform database operations efficiently and uh, the, another aspect is configuring log stash output plugins which is a pretty a straightforward process so let's go through a general steps involved in configuring the plugins in your log stash configuration file you need to define the specific output plugin you want to use for example if you want to send data to Elasticsearch you would specify the Elasticsearch output plugin each output plugin has its own set of configuration options these options determine the destination authentication detail formatting and other relevant parameters refer to the log stash documentation for the detailed information on configuring each plugin because each plugin is different and uh, to test and validate your plugins once you have configured the output plugin it is essential to test and validate the step this ensures that your data is being sent to the desired destination correctly and uh, to make the most of the log stash out plugin consider the following best practices first one is understanding the plugin capability familiarize yourself with the features and limitation of each output plugin this knowledge will help you choose the right plugin for your specific use cases we have the optimized performance depending on your data volume and destination you may need to fine-tune the plugin setting for achieving optimal performance and experiment with the batch size buffering and other relevant parameters monitoring and logging mechanism to track your performance and troubleshoot any issues that you might arise log stash provides various monitoring plugins and tools to assist in this process so that's it for this video to wrap this up we explored the log stash output plugin and their significance in data processing delivery and we discussed the different type of plugins the configuration process and the best practices to follow so that's it for this video i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video about log stash filter plugin in this video we are going to explore the various aspects of log stash filter plugin and understand how it can be leveraged to process and manipulate data efficiently so let's dive into it before we talk about the details of the log stash filter plugin let's have an overview of log stash log stash is an open source data processing pipeline that allows you to collect transform and send data from various sources sources to destination of your choice the filter plugin is a critical component of logstash that enables you to perform transaction and enrichments on the data you during its journey through the pipeline the logstash filter pipeline plugin offers a wide range of functionalities allowing you to parse filter and modify your data in a flexible manner so let's explore some key capabilities these 
that it provides. One of the primary functions of the filter plugin is to parse incoming data into a meaningful field. With the log stash, you can extract a specific data elements such as timestamp, IP address, or custom pattern using the various filters like Grok Dis Dissect or CSV. The Grok filter enables the pattern matching, while the Dissect filter separates the data based on the delimiters. On the other hand, the SCV filter allows you to parse data in a CSV format, extracting values based on a column names. Another essential capability of the filter plugin is to is the data filtering and coordinational processing. Logstash provides a filter like drop, mutate, and coordination, allowing you to exclude or include a specific data based on a pre predefined coordination. The drop filter discards the unwanted events. The, mute, the muted filter modifies the field values and the credential filter enables you to apply credential logic to determine the flow of your data within the pipeline. Logstash filter plugin also empowers you to enrich your data by adding additional information or performing lookups. Filters like GeoIP, Translate and Fingerprint are handy in enhancing your data with geographic graphical in information, translating codes to meaningful value, and uh, generating unique field fingerprints for data duplication. The GeoIP filter adds a geographical detail based on the IP address. The translate filter translates the values based on a custom dictionaries, and the fin fingerprint filters the guarantees unique identifiers for data duplication purposes. In addition to parsing, filtering, and enriching, the filter plugin allows you to modify and format your data. Filters like mutate, date, and group facilitate transforming field values, converting timestamp, and applying complex pattern matching operations. The mutate filter helps modify field values. The date filter converts the timestamp to the desired format, and the group, group filter performs a powerful pattern matching and a extraction operations. The Logstash filter plugin is a versatile tool that enables you to process and manipulate your data at various stages of the Logstash pipeline by leveraging its extensive range of filters that you can parse and uh, format your data to meet your specific requirement. So we explored the filter plugin that wraps it up. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video in this video we are going to discuss the grok patterns and uh, they are a powerful feature of log stack that allows us to parse on a structured log data and ex extract meaningful information from it throughout this video we will explore its use cases and various aspects that you should know before we dive into the specific of log stash grok Rogue patterns, let's begin with the brief overview of Logstash. Logstash is an open source data processing tool that helps you collect, parse, and enrich your data for various purposes, such as data analysis, visualizing, and a group. On the other hand, is a powerful pattern matching plugin used in the Logstash to extract a structured data from unstructured logged messages. Now, you might wonder why we need grok patterns in the 
first place. Well, many application and system guarantee logs in variety of format, making it um, a challenging task to extract relevant information. Grok Patterns provides a way to define a set of rules that match the log lines, patterns, and extract desired fields such as the timestamp, log levels, IP addresses, and more. This helps us make the scene of the log data and gain valuable insight. Let, let's explore the autonomy of the Grok pattern. A Grok pattern consists of two main components, the patterns and the expressions. Patterns are predefined regular expressions that match a specific log pattern, while the expressions are placeholder that capture and name of the specific data. For example, the expression of a percentage sign between the current brackets word quotation username inside of it captures a word and assigns it to the field username now let's dive into some basic growth patterns and that logstash provides for us a wide range of predefined patterns is built in in the growth patterns plugin such as word number IP timestamp and more these patterns serve a building block for for constructing more complex Complex pattern. For instance, if you want to have an example, you can take a look at the screen and you can see that we have a sample data, the growth pattern, and, uh, and a structured data. While the log stash offers a numerous built in patterns, you may encounter log formats that require custom patterns. Thankfully, log stash allows us to define our own patterns using a regular expression. By leveraging regular expressions, syntax, and name capture groups, we can create a precise pattern tailored to our specific log format. When working with group patterns, it's crucial to test and debug them to ensure that they match the desired log lines accurately. Logstash provides various tools to assist in this process. One such a tool in group is the group debugger, which allows you to experiment with patterns and apply them to sample data lo sample log data and instantly see the extracted fields this interactive process help redefine the validate and validate your patterns now that we have covered the basics let's explore some advanced concept in grok patterns log sesh offers a powerful feature like coordination con conditionals names named captures and patterns the composition to handle the complex format log. With the credentials, you can apply different patterns based on a certain condition allowing for dynamic parsing and name captures enhances the readability and organization of the executed field, making them easier to work with. Before we conclude, let's discuss some best practices and tips for working with group patterns. Firstly, it is crucial to choose the appropriate pattern and expression to avoid overmatching or undermatching log lines. Secondly, remember to consider the performance implication of the complex pattern as they may impact the log stack processes processing speed. Lastly, always it is always a good practice to test your patterns on a real log data to ensure the accurate ex extraction so that wraps it up about log stash group patterns we covered the basics and explored the customization options and we delve into some advanced concepts i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about log stash pipeline, which is pretty important in the log stash subject, maybe the most important one. Before we dive into the log stash pipeline, let's have a brief understanding of what log stash is and its significance in world of data processing. Log, log stash is an open source data collection engine that allows you to ingest, transform, and transport data from where 
various sources. It acts as the central hub for processing data and appraising plays a crucial role in the Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. At the heart of the Logstash lies the concept of pipelines. The Elogstash pipeline represents a series of stages that data flows through the transformation and the enrichment. Each stage in the pipeline performs a specific task on the data, such as filtering, parsing, modifying, or aggregating before parsing it to the next stage, this modular and executable architecture makes it extensible architecture, makes it highly flexible and adaptable to diverse data processing requirements. So let's take a closer look at the autonomy of the Logstash pipeline. A typical pipeline consists of three essential components, the input, filters, and outputs. Inputs define this defines the resources from which Logstash collect data. These sources can include the log files, databases, and ma ma message queues, or even network streams. Logstash provides a wide range of input plugins and accommodate various data sources, ensuring the seamless integration with your existing infrastructure. We have the filters, which are workhorses of the Logstash pipeline. They enable data data transformation, enrichment, and modification. With filters, you can perform tasks like parsing incoming data and extracting relevant fields, applying the conditional logic, manipulating timestamp, and much more. Logstash offers a rich set of filters, plugins that carter to diverse data manipulation needs, and we have the outputs. Outputs define the destination to which log Logstash sends the process data. These destinations can include the elastic search for indexing and the searching other data source for, per for persistence, external systems for alerts or notification, or even custom endpoints. Logstash supports numerous output plugins, allowing seamless integration integration with a wide range of systems. Creating efficient and reliable log stash pipeline requires the following some best practices. So let's discuss a few key consideration. Properly configure the buffer setting. Logstash buffers incoming and outcoming data is a crucial to optimize the buffer setting or strike a right balance between the memory usage and throughput. This ensures the smooth data flow within the pipeline. Impor Implement selective filtering is another aspect. Applying targeted filters only to relevant events can significantly improve the pipeline performance, avoiding un unnecessary operations on the data that doesn't require modification, it helps to optimize resources and utilization. Monitoring pipeline performance and regard, regard the of monitoring your sta log stash pipeline is a vital for identifying bottlenecks, troubleshooting issues, and optimizing performance utilizing tools like Elastic Stack, including Kibana, to give a valuable insight to the pipeline matrix to improve the efficiency. So, Logstash Pipeline provides a powerful foundation for handling data processes and transformation tasks by leveraging Logstash modular architecture. You can create a flexible and and a scalable pipeline to handle wide variety of data sources and process their requirements. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Elasticsearch. In this video, we are going to dive into a powerful search and analytics engine, which is widely used for various applications, including real-time data exploration, logging, and enterprise search, or also known as Elasticsearch. By the end of the video, you will have a solid understanding of Elasticsearch. So let's dive into it. Elasticsearch is a 
distributed open source search and analytics engine built in top of the Apache Lucent. It provides a highly available near real-time search availability that can handle massive amount of data efficiency. Whether you are working with a structured or unstructured data, Elasticsearch enables you to index search and analyze it with incredible speed and accuracy. Elasticsearch offers a rich set of features that makes it popular among developers and organizations, so let's explore some key features. Elasticsearch is designed to be distributed, allowing you to distribute data across multiple nodes for high availability and scalability. It automatically handles data distribution and replication, making it easy to scale horizontally as your data grows. Elasticsearch full text search capabilities are powered by the Apache Lucent, which provides a robust indexing and search algorithms. You can perform complex searches across multiple fields and, anal and analyze search results for relevance. And near real-time search is one of its main key features. Elasticsearch provides a near real-time search and analytics, enabling you to retrieve analyze data as needed. This makes it suitable for applications requiring require up-to-date information such as log analytics or monitoring system. And it is document oriented. Elasticsearch stores the data as JSON documents, which makes it schema less and flexible. You can easily index, update, and retrieve documents. And the dynamic mapping feature automatically adapts to changes in your data structure. And we have the RESTful API. The Elasticsearch exposes a RESTful API, allowing you to interact with the system using the HTTP methods like GET, POST, PUT, and DELETE. This makes it accessible from various programming languages and frameworks. And another thing is a powerful querying. Elasticsearch provides a rich query language that supports various uh, search operations, including filtering, sorting, aggregation, and highlighting. And you can construct a complex queries to retrieve a specific data and gain valuable insight from your search result. The Elasticsearch finds application in numerous uh, domains due to its versatility and powerful features. So let's explore some common cases where Elasticsearch shines. Elasticsearch can power search functionality within the organization, enabling users to quickly find relevant information from vast document repositories or knowledge bases. Uh, logging and log analytics is a, one of key use cases of Elasticsearch. Search. Elasticsearch in conjunction with the ELK stack, which uh, if you are not familiar, stands for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. So it is widely used for log storage analytics and visualization. It helps in monitoring and troubleshooting application infrastructure and security events. Another thing is e-commerce and catalog search. Elasticsearch enables enables fast and accurate product searches, face navigations, and personalized recommendations, enhancing the overall e-commerce experience. Real-time analytics with the near real-time capabilities, Elasticsearch allows you to perform real-time analytics on the large volume of data, and it can power the dashboard and visualization providing insight into the business matrices and user behavior and system performance. We have the geospatial data analytics. Elasticsearch integrates with the geospatial libraries like GeoJSON and GeoShape, making it suitable for location-based search analytics, and it can power applications that require geospatial queries or proximity-based on recommendations. Now let's take a closer look at 
the architecture of Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch follows a distributed architecture consisting of multiple nodes forming a cluster. Each node can be hold the data, performing indexing and searching operations and practicing and participating in data distribution and replication. There are two types of nodes in Elasticsearch, the master eligible nodes and the data nodes. Master eligible nodes are responsible for managing the cluster state coordinate, coordinating activities and and handle administrative tasks. Data nodes, uh, as same the name suggests, store index data, perform search operations, and serve queries. The interaction between nodes in the Elasticsearch cluster happens through a communication layer called the transport layer. It allows nodes to communicate and share information seamlessly. Elasticsearch uses a concept called share to distribute data across node and it is shared a self and it is a shared self-contained index subset that holds the partition of the data each share is re replicated to provide a fault tolerant and improve the query performance and the indexing and searching are a fundamental operation in Elasticsearch so let's see how they work in Indexing involves adding documents to Elasticsearch. A document is a JSON object containing the data you want to store and search. When you index a document, Elasticsearch analyzes its content and adds the appropriate shared shard. Searching in Elasticsearch involves const constructing queries to retrieve relevant documentation. Elasticsearch offers a wide range of query types such such as term queries, match queries, range queries, and more. You can also combine multiple queries to create a powerful and complex search scenario. So Elasticsearch is a versatile search and analytics engine that empowers developers and organizations to explore, analyze, and diverse insight from their data with ease. In this video, we cover the basics of Elasticsearch and that wraps it up. Remember, Elasticsearch is the vast topic that many advances advance that has many advanced features and accepts and concept to explore. This video is just an introduction, so keep in mind that there are a lot to learn from now on if you want to get familiar with Elasticsearch and use it comfortably. That's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this educational video about Apache Flink and its architecture. So let's dive into Apache Flink. Apache Flink is an open source stream processing and batch processing framework designed for big data processing and analytics. It provides efficient, reliable, and fault tolerant processing for large volume of data in real time and batch modes. To understand Flink better, let's break down its architecture into several key components. At the core, Apache Flink architecture is the Flink cluster, which consists of two main components, the job manager and the task managers. The job manager it is responsible for coordinating the distributed execution of the Flink applications, while the task managers are responsible for executing the actual component. Flink applications are created using the Flink API or supported APIs. Applications are submitted to the job manager which divides them into set of tasks and schedules them for execution across available task managers in the cluster. The job manager acts as the central coordinator in the Flink architecture. It receives the Flink application from the client and performs various optimization and creates a, a 
execution plan. The execution plan represents a directed acyclic graph or for short DAG of tasks that need to be executed. The job manager also coordinates checkpoint which are a snapshot of the application state taken at the regular interval. These checkpoints allow for fault tolerance and recovery in a case of failure. Additionally, the job manager manages the deployment and monitoring of the task which are then assigned to the available task managers. Task managers are responsible for executing the task assigned to them by running multiple tasks concurrently and they communicate with each other and the job manager to execute data and coordinate the execution. The tasks in the flank are executed in a distributed and pipelined manner. They are organized into stages where each stage performs a specific operation on data such as filtering, mapping, or aggregating. Task managers also handle data partitioning and shuffling. They exchange data between tasks through a network task stack ensuring efficient and reliable data transfer. In addition, the cluster component, in addition to cluster component, Flink supports various data sources and syncs. These are connectors that enable Flink to ingest data from external system and write process data back to external systems. Flink supports a wide range of data sources including Apache Kafka, Apache Hadoop or HDFS and many others. Similar it supports various data syncs such as databases, file systems, and message queues. By leveraging these uh, connectors, Flink can integrate seamlessly with existing data infrastructure and provide a unified processing and anal analytics performance. Now let's take a look at the runtime environment of Flink. Flink runtime provides a robust and efficient execution engine for executing the task of the Flink application. The runtime environment includes a memory manager for managing memory allocation, a task scheduler for distributing tasks across task manager, and a network task for efficient data communication between the tasks. Flink runtime also provides a mechanism for fault tolerance and high availability. It can recover from failures by, re by restoring the application state from the checkpoints and resuming execution for the point of failure. And finally, briefly, let's touch uh, upon the ecosystem surrounding Apache Flink. The Apache Flink has a vibrant community that contributes to its development and provides additional library and tools. Flink ecosystem includes libraries for machine learning, graph processing, and complex event processing, among other. It also integrates with the popular frameworks such as Apache Kafka, Apache Hive, and Apache Hadoop, allowing users to leverage their existing environments to these technologies. So that concludes our video on what is Apache Flink and its architecture. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Flink data flow and programming model. In this video, we are going to take a look at the various aspects of data flow and programming model in Apache Flink. So let's dive into it. Before we start, let's have a brief introduction to Apache Flink. Apache Flink is an open source stream processing and batch processing framework that provides a fast, reliable, and scalable processing for large scale datasets. It is designed to handle both real-time and batch, proce batch processing workload efficiently and one of its key components is data flow programming model. So the data, data flow programming model in Apache Flink is a computational model that represents data processing task as directed acyclic graph or DAG. And 
it provides of operators and it provides a high level abstraction for expressing data processing pipeline and allows for efficient execution and optimization of these pipelines. Let's explore the key concept of Apache Flink data flow programming in detail. The data stream is the fundamental building block of data flow programming model in data stream. It represents an unbounded stream of data elements in Flink. Data streams are created from various sources such as Kafka, HDFS or sockets and, they, and can be transformed using various operations. Operations are processing units in Apache Flink that consume one or more data stream and produce a new data stream. Flink provides a rich set of built-in operations like map, filter, reduce and join and window operations also are important part of the Apache Flink. Additionally, users can define custom operators by extending the base operator class. We have the transformer functions which are applied to data streams using the operator methods. These, these functions define the actual processing logic. For example, a map function applies a transformation to each element in the stream while the reduce function aggregates elements according to a specific logic. Windowing is a crucial concept in a stream processing. It allows grouping and processing of events within the specific time interval or based on other criteria. Apache Flink provides various windowing options such as tumbling windows, sliding windows and session windows to enable efficient time-based processing. We have the state management which is essential for maintaining context and managing the process of data processing. Apache Flink provides a built-in mechanism for managing both keyed and operator state ensuring default tolerance and scalability. And we have the event time processing which refers to the time at which the, an event actually occurred or opposite to the time when an event is processed. Apache Flink allows time allows event time processing and assigning timestamp to an event and providing operations to handle out of order events and event time windows. Now let's discuss the execution and optimization aspects of data flow programming model. We have the lazy evaluation data flink. Apache Flink uses a lazy evaluation which means that the execution of the data processing pipeline is deferred until the result is actually requested. It allows for efficient optimization and resource allocations. We have the operator fusion. The operator fusion is a technique used by the Apache Flink to minimize data serialization and deserialization overhead. If uses multiple operations together, reducing the data transfer between operations and improving overall performance. We have the pipeline execution. Apache Flink supports pipeline execution where operations are executed concurrently in a streaming fashion. This minimizes the end-to-end -end latency and maximizes the throughput. We have the task chaining. The task chaining is another optimization technique used by Apache Flink and it enables the execution of multiple operations within the same thread, reducing the thread synchronization overhead and improving overall performance. Apache Flink seamlessly integrates with various data sources such as sync, external system, and it supports the connectors for popular systems such as Apache Kafka, Amazon S3, Hadoop, and much more. Flink ecosystem also includes the support for complex event processing machine and machine learning libraries and SQL queries. So to wrap this up, in conclusion, the Apache Flink data flow programming model provides a powerful and flexible framework for efficient and scalable data processing by representing data processing tasks as directed, directed acyclic graph operators. Flink enables developers to build complex data processing pipelines easily with its support of event processing, state management, and optimization technique. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.
Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Flink data sources and sync. In this video we are going to have a deep dive into data sources and sync in Apache Flink so let's get started. In Apache Flink data sources and syncs are connectors that allow us to read and write data from or to an external system. A data source is a component responsible for ingesting data into Flink world data sync is responsible for storing outputting data from flink these connectors enable seamless integration with various data storage system and external platforms apache flink comes with the built-in data sources and syncs that uh, support common data formats and storage system some of the commonly used built-in sources include kafka apache polestar apache nifi and file system sources like HDFS and others. Similarly, Flink provides a built-in sync, built-in syncs such as Kafka, Elasticsearch, Apache Cassandra, and various file systems. In addition to built-in sources, Apache Flink allows developers to create custom data sources tailored to a specific requirements. This flexibility empowers users to connect with Flink with virtually any data system or a streaming platform, custom data sources that are implemented by the extending the rich source function class and overwriting these methods. These sources can be used to read data from sources like database, me message queues, and RESTful APIs. Similar to custom data sources, Apache Flink enables the creation of the custom data sync. Custom syncs are useful when a built-in sync do not fulfill the specific requirements by implementing the rich ring rich sync function class and overriding its method users can define their own data syncs this allows for writing data to tables message queues or any other desired storage system apache flink guarantees exactly once a semantics for both data sources and syncs this means that the flink ensures that every record is processed and and written exactly once even in the face of failures or restarts this uh, among semantic guarantees the end-to-end -end data consist consistency which plays a crucial role in many real world use cases and we have the data source in apache flink data sources can be parallelized to achieve higher throughput the parallelism level determines the number of parallel sources instances that flink creates Gates to and ingest data. This parallelism is beneficial when dealing with large volume of data or when data sources can be partitioned. Flink parallel sources efficiently distribute the workload across available resources. Similarly, the data sync in Flink can also be parallelized and the parallelism level of the sync defines the number of parallel instances that write data concurrently. Parallel syncs are especially useful when dealing with high throughput scenarios or when writing to distributed storage system. A flink ensures that data is written consistently and it is parallel across the sync instances. Apache Flink provides a different delivery guarantees for data syncs by default. The flink ensures that at least one delivery semantic for syncs. This means that every record is written to the sync at least one but duplicates may occur in a case of failure however flink also supports exactly one sync delivery semantic using the transactional syncs transactional syncs leverage the external system transactioning the capabilities to achieve the end-to-end -end exactly once semantics failures can happen in a distributed system apache flink is no exception flink provides a fault tolerant mechanism to handle failures in data sources and sync syncs it uses a checkpointing to capture the state of the entire application including sources and syncs in the case of failure flink can recover the applications from at least the successful checkpoint applications from the last successful checkpoint ensuring the data consistency and reliability which is very important in large scale projects to wrap this video up and summarize data sources and sync 
links are vital components in the Apache Flink from reading data into Flinks and writing data out of the Flink. Flink provides built-in connectors for common data system along with flexibility to create common connectors and it guarantees one exactly one semantic, supports parallelism and offers fault tolerant mechanism to ensure the robust and reliable data processing. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comment below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Flink data transformation and aggregation. Before we dive into details of transformation and aggregation, let's first understand what Apache Flink is. Apache Flink is an open source stream processing framework designed to process massive amounts of data with the low latency and high throughput. And it's a, it's a very widely used software among corporations and it is very popular. So data transformation is a crucial aspect of data processing workflows. It involves manipulating, converting, and enriching data to make it more meaningful and suitable for downstream analysis. In Flink, data transformation is achieved through the use of operation functions and various transformation APIs. Flink offers a rich set of transformation operations to process data. So let's explore some key ones in detail. We have the map transformation. The map transformation applies a user defined function to each element in the input data stream and produces a new stream of a transferred element. It allows you to perform simple data manipulation like executing a specific field and applying calculations or converting data types. Unlike the map transformation, flat map can provide produce multiple output elements for each input element it is particularly useful when you need to split an input data element into multiple elements or filter out a specific element based on a certain condition for example you can uh, tokenize a sentence into individual words using flat map the filter transformation evaluates the user defined predicts for each element in the input stream and only passes through the element that uh, satisfy a given condition. It allows you to selectively include or execute elements from the further processing. The by key transformation is, it is used to logically partition the data stream based on a key attribute. It groups the elements with the same key into the key stream enabling the subsequent operations like aggregation and windowing to be performed on the, the grouped data. Key by is a crucial step when dealing with state rule operations. Windowing is a vital aspect, aspect in the streaming that allows you to divide the data stream into infinite logical segments called windows. Flink supports various windowing techniques such as tumbling windows, sliding windows, and session windows, which enables efficient data aggregation and ana analytics over a specific time interval or event counts. Aggregation is the process of combining multiple input elements to a single output element based on a specific criterion. Flink provides a wide range of built-in aggregation functions including sum, count, mean, max, and average to perform common aggregation. Additionally, you can define custom aggregation functions to meet the specific requirements. Apart from the, apart from the aforementioned transform, Flink also offers process function which provides a low-level control over the processing of the individual elements. It allows you to maintain state set timers and emit output elements based on a complex conditions. Process function is especially useful for advanced use cases and custom stream process logic. Now that we have explored the core concept of a Flink data transformation and aggregation, let's see how these elements can be combined to build more complex data processing pipeline. A typical processing pipeline in Flink involves a 
series of transformation and aggregation operations chained together to achieve the desired data processing goals, you can start by defining the input source, then apply various transformation, perform aggregation, and finally write the process data to a sync such as database or message queue. To illustrate these concepts, let's consider the example use cases. Analyzing a real-time user interaction in a website, you can um, collect user events such as clicks, page views, and purchases, and perform transformation and aggregations to gain insight to the user behavior and engagement patterns. Other pipelines will include the step-like mapping event data to maintain the attribute filtering or irrelevant event, keying the stream by user ID, applying windowing to analyze events within the specific time interval and performing aggregations like counting clicks or calculating the average session duration. So that wraps it up. In conclusion, Flink data transformation and aggregations are essential components of the stream processing pipeline. They provide a powerful mechanism for manipulating and analyzing summary of the data in real time by leveraging these various transformation operations windowing technique and aggregations function offered by the Flink, you can build a robust, scalable, and efficient data processing solution. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Flink streaming windows, which is a pretty important concept in Apache Flink to understand. And a streaming window allows us to divide continuous data stream into finite slices, enabling a powerful aggregation and computation that we will explore the various aspects of it. Before we dive into details, let's understand what a streaming windows are in Apache Flink a streaming window is a way to segment an infinite data stream to infinite chunks based on a specific criteria. These chunks are then processed independently allowing for aggregations, computation, and analysis. To perform windowed transformation in Flink, we need to consider three com components. The key, the window assigner, and the window function. So let's take a closer look at each one of them. First, we have the key. Key is used to create a logical keyed stream from an infinite or non-keyed stream. It provides a way to group related elements together within the window. The window assigner determines how the stream elements are divided into windows. Flink provides several pre-implemented window assigners such as tumbling windows, sliding windows, session windows and global windows. You can also create your own window assigner by extending the window assigner class. The window function is responsible for processing elements within each window. Flink offers three types of window function, the reduce function, fold function, and the window function. These functions define how the elements in the window are combined to aggregate it to a produced result. Now that we understand the key component of the windowed transformation, let's explore different types of window available in Flink. We have the global windows. To divide elements into a smaller windows, instead each element is assigned to a pre-key global window. This type of window is useful when custom trigger is specified. Tumbling window divides the stream into non-overlapping window of the specified size. For example, if we set the window size to two minutes, all elements within the two minutes time frame will be processed together as one window. We have the sliding windows, which are also fixed size, but they allow for overlapping windows. This means that an element can be assigned to multiple windows. The overlap size, called the window slide, is a user-specified parameter. We have the session windows, which is pretty ideal 
ideal when window boundaries need to be adjusted based on incoming data. Each key can have individual window start times and window end when a period of inactivity occurs. The session gap parameter determines how long to wait for a new data before considering a session as closed. So moving on, let's consider and discuss the triggers and evectors which plays, plays a crucial role in window to transformation. A trigger determines when a window is already processing. Flink provides a default trigger for each window assigner but also no, but also specifies the custom trigger. Event time trigger, processing time trigger, also the count trigger are examples of triggers available in Flink. An optional, an optional E vector can be used in conjunction with trigger. The E vector allows you to remove a specific elements from the window before processing. This is useful when we want to control elements included in the computation. So let's explore the various types of window functions available in Flink. The reduce function specifies how two values are combined from one output element. It is used for incremental aggregation with within the window. Default function adds elements from the input to an initial accumulator value. This function uses when we want to maintain the state across the elements in a window. The window function provides the highest flexibility becomes but becomes with the performance cost. It <coughs> process an interval containing all elements within the window. This allows for custom computation and access to additional window metadata. Sometimes elements in the stream might arrive late. Flink provides a mechanism to handle late data in events time when downing. So let's explore how this is handled. The allowed latency is a parameter that determines how much time element can be late and will be considered for computation. Elements arriving within the acceptable latency are included in the computation while elements are dropped while late elements are dropped. Flink automatically performs garbage collection of the state rel related to the window once the watermark passes the end of the window plus that allow latency. This ensures the efficient memory management and provides accumulation of the unnecessary state. Lastly, let's discuss non-keyed windowing in Flink. Non-keyed window are specified by omitting key by function. This turns the window to transformation into a non-parallel operation. However, non-keyed windows have performance implications that as the windows cannot be computed independently per key. So that wraps it up for this video. In conclusion of our in-depth exploration of the streaming windows in the Apache Flink. We covered the key component of the window to transformation, the different types of windows, available triggers and E vectors, window functions, handle late data and non-key windowing. With this knowledge, you can harness the power of Flink streaming windows to perform advanced computation and analysis on the continuous data stream. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Flink state management and fault tolerance. In this video we are going to focus on the state management in Apache Flink which plays a crucial role in ensuring the consistency and correctness of data processing. While fault tolerant guarantees the system resilient in the face of failures. So let's get started. Before we dive into the state State management, let's first understand what we mean by the state in the concept of Apache Flink. A state refers to the data that is stored and main maintained by a streaming application during the execution. It enables Flink to remember information from previous events or computations and uses it to make enforced decisions. A state management in Flink involves handling and manipulating 
state through the life cycle of a streaming application. Flink, Flink provides two primary approaches for managing state, which first one is operator state. The oper operator state refers to the state that is local to a particular operator in Flink job. It includes data structure variables or any other stateful information that um, an operator needs to maintain between the in invocations. Flink temporarily manages the distribution, partitioning, and consistency of this state across parallel instances of the operator. Keyed state allows Flink to maintain the state information that is associated with keys and such as the grouping keys in a a key by operation and if you don't know the key by is a method in apache flink keyed state is the is especially useful for operations that require aggregations joins or any other operations that rely on the stateful information per key flink ensures that the state consistency the state is consistently distributed and available across parallel instances even when operators are uh, scaled up or down now let's understand the estate management so estate management is a critical aspect of fault tolerant in apache flink fault tolerant ensures that the flink application continues to function correctly and reliably even if even in the presence of failures flink achieves fault tolerance through the combination of mechanism including checkpointing and state recovery. Checkpointing is the process of taking consistent snapshot of the application state at the regular interval. These snapshots, also known as the checkpoints, are stored in the reliable and durable storage system such as distributed file system or object store. Checkpointing allows Flink to recover the state of the application in case of failure, providing exactly one semantics for a stateful operations. The recovery state or state recovery in event of failure, Flink uses the stored checkpoints to recover the application state. The recovery process involves storing the state from the latest successful checkpoint and replying any missed event or computation. Flink state recovers a mechanism ensuring that the application resume resume processing from the point of failure, maintaining data integrity and consistency. Apache Flink offers several advanced techniques to enhance the statement and fault tolerant capabilities. So let's explore them. The incremental checkpointing is a crucial aspect. Instead of taking full snapshot of the state at each checkpoint, incremental checkpointing captures only the changes made since the previous checkpoint. This optimization significantly reduces the checkpointing time and storage overhead. We have the asynchronous checkpointing. Flink supports asynchronous checkpointing where the state snapshots are taken in the background while the application continues processing. This approach minimizes the impact on the processing latency and improves the overall performance. The state TTL or time to live follows allows you to define time to live for state entries after which the state is automatically expired and discarded. This failure is especially useful when dealing with data that becomes irrelevant after the certain period, reducing the memory footprint and improving the efficiency. Externalized state is another aspect. In some scenarios, it might be beneficial to store the application state externally for example in the database or key value stores flink provides a support for externalized state allowing seamless integration with external system while maintaining default tolerance to wrap this video up and summarize the state management and fault tolerant are a crucial aspect of apache flink that enables rela reliable and consistent pro consistent process processing of a streaming data by understanding efficiently and managing state and leveraging Flink 
fault tolerant machines you can build robust and resistant system for extreme processing so that's it for this video i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comment below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video about batch processing in apache flink so apache flink is a widely used software and in this video we are going to take a look at batch processing to a spe specifically we will dive into the key aspects of batch processing using apache flink and understand how it can help us handle large scale data processing efficiently so let's get us started batch processing is a data processing technique technique that involves processing a large volume of data in a directed chunks or batches. Apache Flink provides a powerful framework for performing batch processing tasks. It offers several features and optimization, especially designed to handle batch workloads. So let's explore these in the detail. Before we dive into it, let's first understand some key concepts to get familiar with it and get familiar with it. Apache Flink data set API is a primary programming interface for batch processing. It involves a high level abstraction for expressing data transformation similar to other batch processing framework. The data set API offers a rich set of operations and transformation that enable data manipulation and analysis. Data sources and sync are another key aspect. Apache Flink supports various data source and syncs for batch processing. It can read data from a wide range of file formats, databases, and message queues. Similarly, it can write to process data to a different storage system or sync, allowing seamless integration with existing data interfaces. So now let's take a look at workflow of batch processing. Now that we understood the basics, let's talk through the typical aspect of workflow involved in programming batch processing tasks in Apache Flink. First step to batch processing is the data ingestion. Apache Flink involves connectors and APIs to read data from various sources such as file databases or streaming services. We can define the source of the our source of our, our input data and configure any necessary parsing or pre-processing operations. Once the data is initiated, ingested, we can perform a series of transformation using Apache Flink data set API. These transformations include filtering, aggregation, joining, mapping, operations, among others. These transformations allow us to process the data and delve into a meaningful insight or prepare for further analysis. After applying the required transformation, we need to store our output to the processed data. Apache Flink supports various data syncs such as file, databases, and message queues. As I said before, we can configure the desired output format and define any necessary serialization formatting operations. Apache Flink incorporates the several optimization techniques to ensure the efficient batch processing. So let's explore some, some key concepts of optimization techniques employed by Flink. Operator fusion is a technique where multiple operations are used together to reduce overhead of data serialization, communication, serialization, and communication. Apache Flink automatically defines opportunities for fusion and optimization of the executed plan accordingly, resulting in an improved performance. Efficient memory management is a crucial aspect of batch processing. Flink memory management system and subsystems ensure efficient memory allocation and utilization, minimization, and unnecessary data shuffling and improving the overall performance. Fault tolerant is another aspect that I covered in the previous videos. Fault tolerant is a crucial distributed. It is critical and crucial for distributed data processing systems. Apache Flink provides a robust fault tolerant mechanism enabling the processing of large data set with a strong consistency and guarantees including the exactly one semantics and again I covered these in the previous videos. So let's understand how Flink achieves this. First we are 
gonna take a look at deployment options. Apache Flinks offers a flexible deployment option for running batch process jobs. We can execute Flink on the standalone clusters, and cloud platforms, or containers, containers, or container orchestration systems such as the Apache Mesos or Kubernetes. These deployment options allow us to scale our batch processing workloads based on our requirement. In this video, so so in summary, in this video we explore the batch processing using the Apache Flink. We cover the key concept, workflow optimization techniques, and fault tolerant and deployment option, and that wraps it up for this video. With this rich set of features and optimization, Apache Flink provides a robust framework for performing efficient and scalable batch processing task so that's it for this video i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Flink stream processing. In this video we are going to take a look at a stream processing using Apache Flink and the stream processing is a fundamental aspect of modern data processing enabling real-time ana analysis and powering a wide range of applications. So let's get us started and before we dive into details of Apache Flink stream processing let's understand what a stream processing is. A stream processing is a method of continuously processing and analyzing data records as they arrive in the real-time fashion. It involves a transformation, aggregation, and enrichment of data stream to delve meaningful insight and unlock the batch processing wall operators which operators on the static data sets. A stream processing allows us to process and react to data in, a, in motion, enabling low latency and high throughput analysis. Apache Flink is a powerful open source stream processing framework that provides developers with an undefined fault tolerant and scalable performance to build real-time applications. It offers high-level stream processing API which allows you to express complex data transformation and computation on data streams with ease. Apache Flink handles the complexities of distributed processing fault tolerant and exactly one time semantics so you can focus on the waiting writing business logic of the stream processing application to understand Apache Flink data Apache Flink stream processing model better let's explore some key concepts. the primary abstraction in Apache Flink is a data stream which represents an unbounded stream of events or records Flink stream processing involves around the concept of transformations which are operations applied to data stream to provide new streams and transformation can handle filtering mapping aggregation aggregating joining and windowing operations among others the time praise plays a crucial role in a stream processing Apache Flink supports a robust working event time and processing time the event time represents the time at which the event is occurred while processing time refers to the time at the which event is processed by the system. Flink windowing capabilities allow you to group data within the, within the specific time interval and perform computation on those windows, enabling various time-based operations such as tumbling, sliding, and a session window. Successful stream processing is another significant aspect of Apache Flink and it enables you to maintain an update state as you process the incoming data stream. Flink stateful operations allow you to store query historical data maintain session information and perform complex computation that requires maintaining context this capability is particularly useful for tasks such as fraud detection user session analysis and real-time analysis on the streaming data ensuring default tolerance and data consistency is a crucial aspect in stream processing systems Apache Flink guarantees a fault tolerance 
checkpoints by maintaining con consistent checkpoints of the application state, in this case, failure. Flink recovers the state of the continue processing from the last successful checkpoint. However, Flink provides exactly one semantics, semantics ensuring that the, each record is processed exactly once, even in the persistence of a failure. And let's now look at the integration and ecosystem. Apache Flink seamlessly integrates with various data sources and sync, making it a versatile choice for stream processing. It supports connectors for the most popular messaging system like Apache Kafka, Polestar, and RabbitMQ, as well as default system databases and many other. Flink ecosystem includes the support for complex event processing, which we are going to take a look at in the later videos. Pattern and machine learning libraries and batch processing enable a wide range of use cases. Apache Flink is designed to scale horizontally, allowing you to process massive amount of data in parallel. Flink distributed runtime automatically distributes the workload across a cluster of machine, ensuring the efficient utilization of sources. Flink can be deployed on the various infrastructure options, including the standalone clusters, cloud platforms such as Apache, Mesos, Kubernetes, and cloud providers like Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud Platform. A stream processing in Apache Flink finds application in a diverse industries. It used for real-time analysis, fraud detection, monitoring, and alerting. IoT data processing recommendation system and more. The ability to process analyze data in a real time empowers organizations to make data driven decision, gain actionable insight, and respond quickly to emerging threads or events. In this video, we covered the Apache Flink a stream processing. And to wrap this video up, Apache Flink provides key capabilities such as window, time, and a stateful stream processing, fault tolerance, integration, scaling, and deployment. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Flink Graph Processing. Apache Flink Graph Processing is a powerful technique for analyzing and manipulating in interconnected data structures. Through this course, we will explore the various aspects of graph processing and demonstrate how Apache Flink can efficiently handle large-scale graph computations. So let's get us started. Before we dive into the specifics of Apache Flink Graph Processing, capabilities, let's establish a solid foundation on understanding of what graph processing is. Graph processing involves analyzing relationships between entities responded as a vertices and the edges in the graph data structure. This type of data structure as is well suited for molding various real-world scenarios such as social network recommendation system and log logistics optimization. Apache Flink provides a powerful graph processing API that allows developers to express complex graph algorithms in a concise and scalable manner. This API leverages Flink Dataflow runtime, enabling efficient execution of fault tolerant for large-scale graph computation. Let's get a closer look at the key component of the Flink graph processing API. In Apache Flink, graphs are created using the graph API, which provides provides a method for defining vertices, edges, and their properties. Flink supports both dire directed and undirected graph versatilities and edges can associate, be associated with various attributes enabling flexible data modeling. Once the graph is created, Flink allows for a wide range of graph transformation. These transformation include filtering vertices or edge based on a certain conditions. 
applying map function to transform vertexes or edge properties vertex or edge process properties and aggregating value across vertices or edges these operations enable the manipulation of the processing of the graph data before running more complex algorithms apache flink graph processing api provides an extensive collection of graph algorithms making it easier to perform common graph computation these algorithms include the breatheth first search or bfs connected component component page rank and many more flink algorithms are designed to efficiently handle large scale graph and provide a high performance execution many graph algorithms require interactive processing where the computation interacts until a certain condition is met apache flink graph processing supports interacting graph processing through the use of interacting data flows this allows for efficient execution of algorithms that require manipulation integrations such as label propagation and graph clustering one of the key strengths of the apache flink graph processing api it is the ability to handle large graph while providing fault tolerance flink runtime systems automatically handles failures and ensures that the graph computation continues seamlessly furthermore flink leverages its distributed processing capabilities to a scale graph computation across a cluster of machine enabling processing of mass graphs graph processing has numerous applications across various domains some common use cases include the social network analyst recommendation system fraud detection and network analysis apache flink graph processing api empowers developers to track these use cases efficiently and effectively in this video we explore the world of graph processing apache flink graph processing api and we discuss the fault tolerance and scalability and real world applications so you can leverage apache flink for powerful capabilities and graph processing task to unlock the valuable insight from your data that's it for this video i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video hello and welcome to this video about apache flink data stream api and data set api these apis provide a comprehensive set of tools for processing and analyzing data streams and batch data in a distributed and fault tolerant manner so let's dive into them and first let's take a look at uh, the data stream api to better understand this this api is designed for processing continuous unbounded data stream it allows you to build sophisticated data processing pipeline that can handle large throughput and low latency requirement so let's explore this main component data stream api involves around the concept of data stream a data stream represents a stream of data elements and it supports operations such as filtering mapping aggregation and joining and it provides an abstraction for working with continuous infinite stream of data data stream transformation allows you to manipulate data stream and apply various operations some commonly used transformation include filtering mapping reducing so let's discuss them filtering data data filtering allows you to selectively process elements in a data stream based on a certain condition for example you can filter out the irrelevant data or discard discarded elements that don't meet the specific criteria filtering helps in reducing the amount of data that needs to be further processed mapping is another aspect which allows you to perform transformation on the elements of data stream from one format to another it, it is a fundamental operation that enables you to form operations like extracting fields modifying values or converting data types and mapping which provides a flexibility in manipulating the data within the stream reducing is a common operation in data processing that combines multiple elements into a single result enabling you to perform computations such as summing up values summing up values finding the max 
maximum or minimum calculating the average reducing helps in aggregating data over a stream another important concept in data stream api is the key streams a keyed stream groups elements of the data stream based on a key and allows you to perform operations on each independently keyed stream enable the stateful processing and useful for tasks like grouping windowing and stateful integration now let's shift our focus to data set api unlike the data stream api which is designed for continuous data stream data set api is tailored for processing batch data or unbounded or bounded data sets it provides a rich set of transformation and actions to manipulate and analyze batch of data efficiently in the data set api the data set represents a collection of elements that are processed as a whole and it allows you to perform distributed computation on a batch of data and supports operations such as filtering mapping grouping aggregation aggregating and let's explore this transformation in detail first we are going to take a look at filtering data sets similar to the data stream api the data set api also supports the filtering operations you can apply filter to selectively process elements in a data set based on a certain condition filtering is useful for extracting relevant data or removing noise from the data set mapping in the data set api allows you to transform the elements of the data set similar to the data stream api you can perform operations like extracting fields modifying values or converting data types mapping helps in reshaping data sets to meet your analysis requirement the grouping in the data sets is a crucial operation in data set api that ena enables you to group the elements based on a specific key or key Keys. grouping allows you to aggregate and analyze data which each have been grouped separately it is often used in conjunction with aggregation or statistical calculations aggregation in the data set api involves combining multiple elements into a single result just like the data stream api you can perform computations such as summing up values fin finding minimum or maximum or calculating the average aggregating helps in summarizing and driving insight from data so to this to wrap this video off in this video we covered the data stream api and data set api of the apache flink we learned about the key concepts such as data streams key streams and data sets we also discussed the various transformation and operations available in each api these are powerful tools for enabling you to process and analyze your your streaming of data and batch data efficiently using the apache flink so stay tuned for the next videos i hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it if you have any question put it down in the comments below thanks for watching and i will see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this video about operators and functions in Apache Flink. In this video we are going to have a deep dive into essential components of the Apache Flink data processing model. We will dive into the operation and functions which are an essential component of the Flink data processing model enabling powerful transformation and computation on a streaming and batching data. So let's begin by understanding what operations are in Apache Flink. In Flink, operators are the building block and they define the behavior of data transformation. They define how the data is processed and manipulated as it flows through the Flink data processing pipeline. The Flink provides a different type of operations to handle various data processing scenarios so let's take a closer look at each and every single one of them we have the map operators the map operator applies a user defined function to each element of the data stream or data set transferring it into another element the filter operation applies the undefined predicate user defined predicate function to each element and retain only those elements element that satisfy the condition we have also the flat map operator the flat map operator takes an input element and produces 
the zero or one or more output elements using the user defined function. It is useful for operations like splitting, tokenizing and unsetting, unnesting and we have the key by operator which is a pretty special, special and important one. The key by operator groups the elements of the data stream of the stream or data set based on the key attribute. It is typically used in conjunction with aggregations or window operations. The reduce operator applies a user defined associative and communicative function to combine elements in a stream of data set. It is often used to incremental aggregations. Now that we understood the different type of operator, let's focus on the function that are associated with these operators. So now let's understand the different type of operators and focus on the functions that are associated with these operators. In the logic that is applied to data within the operator, we the flink allows you to define custom functions to perform a specific operation on your data. These user defined functions can be classified into three main categories. The map function which takes an input element and produces a single output element. It is used to operate like the map and flat fun flat map function. We have the filter function which evaluates a pre predicate for each input element and determines whether to keep discard the element it is used with the filter operator. A reducer function defines how to combine two elements into a single element and it is used with operators like reduce and group reduce. Moving on to built-in functions alongside the user defined functions, Apache Flink provides a wide range of built-in functions that can be directly used within your dataset processing pipeline. This function covers the various data types including numeric string date and time functions as well as the triggers as well as the aggregations and window functions. And in addition to the stateless functions that we discussed earlier, Apache Flinks also supports the stateful functions which we are going to take a deeper look at in the next videos. But for now, a stateful functions can maintain and update the state across multiple events or records allowing for complex computation and event driven processing. Apache Flink provides a stateful operator such as processes, process functions and key process functions which allow you to define a custom stateful computation and handle event time processing, timers and state management. And to wrap this video off, we covered and explored the concept of operators and function in Apache Flink. We learned about different type of operators including the map filter, flat map, key by and the reduce operators. We also discussed the user defined functions and wide range of built in functions provided by the Flink. Lastly, we touched the, upon the concept of stateful functions and stateful operators. So thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about keyed streams and operators in Apache Flink. Keyed streams and operators are fundament are a fundamental concept in Apache Flink. Keyed stream enable data processing based on a specific key. Keyed operators perform operations on a keyed data stream. In this video, we are going to explore the important concept of usage and benefits of keyed streams and operators. So let's Let's understand the keyed streams. Keyed stream organizes data based on a specific key. Each stream element is associated with a key value. Keyed streams enable operations such as stateful processing, windowing, and aggregation. Keys are essential for grouping and partitioning data for parallel processing in Apache Flink. So let's consider an example where we have an stream of user events. Each event event contains a user ID and an action such as login, logout, click and we can uh, and we can key the stream by user ID to perform operations to a specific to each a specific user. Keyed operations are applied independently to each key in the keyed stream. Keyed operations maintain the 
state for each key. A stateful operations allow Flink to remember and update the information about each key. The state is crucial for maintaining the concept session of the window and aggregations. Flink provides a variety of keyed operations including the keyed transformation which applies a custom transformation to a keyed stream. We have the key windowing to which performs operations on a data within the specific time or count windows. We have the keyed aggregations which compares the aggregation, sum, average and these types of operation on grouped data. We have the keyed joins which joins a multiple stream based on a common key. The keyed transformation applies the custom operations to each key in the keyed stream. The some examples of key the transformation are the map which applies a function to each element. We have the filter which retains the element satisfying a given condition. We have the flat map which transforms the element into a zero or more element. The keyed windowing divides a keyed stream to windows based on a time or count. Flink provides a various windowing options such as tumbling windows, non over overlapping windows or fixed size and sliding windows are another aspects which and does the overlapping windows with a specific slide and session windows creates a base creates a windows based on a gap between the event and the key aggregation compute the aggregation values for each key in the keyed stream. For example, the sum computes the sum of the values for each key. The average computes the average values of each key. Min and max finds the minimum and maximum value for each key. The keyed joins combine multiple keyed stream based on a common key. And there are different types of keyed joins, which is inner join, which combines elements with the matching keys from the both stream. We have the out outer join that combines all elements including those without matching keys. We have the interval join which joins elements based on a time interval rather than the exact matching keys and the benefits of a stream of keyed a stream and operators are first the improved performance a keyed a stream enable parallel processing and partitioning data. They enhance the flexibility keyed operations allow us to customize operations for each key Key. They allow for advanced analysts, analytics, the keyed stream supports uh, stateful processing and complex aggregation and the real-time processing is another crucial aspect. The keyed stream enables processing data to achieve an ensuring low latency. So to wrap this video off, keyed stream and operators are a crucial concept of Apache Flink. They provide a powerful way to power process and analyze database on keys. The key the stream enable a stateful operation, windowing, aggregation, and join for leveraging key the operation that helps optimizing the performance and achieve real-time processing. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about complex event processing in Apache Flink or CEP for short and explore how Apache Flink enables us to efficiently process and analyze large stream of events in real time. So let's get us started. The complex event processing or CEP refers to a technique of analyzing and over correlating multiple events in a real time to identify meaningful patterns or complex event patterns. These patterns can be defined based on various conditions including their, their attributes, temporal relationship, logical operators. CEP is particularly useful scenario for when we want to extract insight from high velocity data stream and detect uh, efficient event pattern as they occur. Apache Flink provides a powerful capability for complex event processing which makes it popular choice among the 
developers and data engineers. Let's uh, take a look at some key features of ECP in Apache Flink. Apache Flink allows us to process continuous uh, stream of events in ensuring low latency, high throughput processing, and it supports event time and processing time semantics, enabling us to handle event window with their original timestamp or time that they are being processed. With Apache Flink C CEP library, we can define complex event patterns using the declarative query language. This pattern can involve various conditions such as temporal constraints, logical operator, and event attribute. Flink CEP engine efficiently matches the defined pattern against the incoming event stream in real time. Apache Flink CEP enables us to detect complex event patterns in real time by continuously processing the event stream and triggers actions or generating leaders alerts whenever a matching pattern is found. This allows us to respond swiftly to critical events or take productive measure based on the detected pattern. Apache Flink provides a built-in tolerance mechanism to ensure the reliability of the CEP application. It offers mechanisms like distributed snapshot and exactly one-time processing guarantees, which helps in maintaining consistency and resilience even in the face of failures. Now let's dive into the details of how we can work with CEP in Apache Flink. There are three main steps involved, the event stream definition, pattern, specification, and actions. In the Apache Flink, we define event stream as a data stream, which represents an unbounded sequence of events each event has a set of attributes such as event time, event, event time, and additional metadata. We can ingest events from various sources such as message queues, Apache, Kafka, or custom sources. Pattern specification is an aspect when once the event stream is defined, we can specify the complex event patterns using the Flink CEP library. The patterns are defined using the high level query language such as the Java or Scala API. We can express conditions based on event attribute time constraints, quantifiers like one or more or zero or more events and logical operators. We have the action when a complex event pattern is detected in the event stream, we can define actions to be performed. These actions can range from a generated alerts, updating external system, triggering downstream processing, or any custom logic based on application requirements. Apache Flink provides a flexible mechanism to define and execute execute these actions seamlessly. Complex event processing has numerous applications across various domains, so let's explore the notable use cases where a CEP in Apache Flink shines. The fraud detection is pretty important in a financial situation. CEP can be used to detect fragment fraudulent activities by analyzing real-time transaction and defining patterns that can indicate potential fraud fraud. Apache Flink can quickly identify suspicious behavior and trigger an appropriate action. IoT data analysis is another aspect. With the growth of Internet Things, there are a massive influx of sensor data. And remember, if you don't know, the IoT stands for Internet of Things. CEP in the Apache Flink allows us to process analyze, and analyze data in real time, establishing an NA, NA enabling application like productive maintenance, anomaly detection, and real-time monitoring. Supply chain is another part. Complex event patterns can help optimize supply chain operations by optimizing bottlenecks, delays, or abnormalities. Apache Flink CEP capabilities enable real-time tracking event and productive decision-making to improve the efficiency. We have the network monitoring CEP in Apache Flink is widely used in the network monitoring applications to detect network anomalies, security threads, threads, or performance issues. By defining patterns that indicate abnormal network behavior, Flink can pro provide a real-time insight and trigger alerts.
events. In this video, we explore the world of the complex event processing or CEP in Flink. And to wrap this up, we learned about the key features of the processing of the process of working with CEP and discovered some real world use cases where CEP can provide a valuable insight using Apache Flink and its capabilities. So that's it for this video. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this video about Apache Flink Stateful Functions. Stateful Functions allow us to build a scalable and fault tolerant application by seamlessly integrating state management into our distributed system. So without further ado, let's get us started. Before we dive into the details of Stateful Functions, let's, let's understand the core concept behind it. Apache Flink Stateful Functions provide a higher level programming model that allows us to express a stateful computation as a lightweight isolated functions. These function functions can maintain their own state of communicate with each other using the messages. A stateful functions come with several advantages. First and foremost, they simplify the development of distributed application by encapsulating state and behavior with the individual function. Developers can focus on writing logic without worrying about the complexity complexities of the distributed estate management. Secondly, the stateful functions enable fine-grained scalability. Since functions operate on a single piece of state, they can be independently scaled based on the workload. This flexibility ensures the efficient resources and utilization and improves the overall system performance. So now let's explore the stateful functions in detail. The two fundamental entities are functions and states. Functions represents the behavior we want to model while the state captures the information required for the computation. Function in stateful functions are stateful as their name suggests meaning that they maintain their own eternal state. This state can be associated and modified during the computation allowing functions to remember information across multiple invocations. It's important to note that the state is temporarily managed by Flink, providing fault tolerance and high availabil availability out of the box. And to enable communication and coordination among functions, stateful functions rely on the message. Messages are the main messages are mean by which function exchange information. They can trigger the computation, carry data, or request actions from other functions. Function. This message based computation communication model forces to lose coupling and enables building complex distributed application with ease. In addition to function state, a stateful functions provide a rich set of API for defining behavior and handling messages. So let's take a closer look at uh, some of these APIs. One of the core API is the function interface. Functions implement this interface interface to define their behavior, they can retrieve messages, modify a state, and emit the new messages as a result of the computation. Another crucial API is the state API that allows functions to manage their state by providing methods to read, write, and update the state variable. This API ensures that state functions are consistent and durable. To enable the message passing and coordination, stateful functions offer for the message API, the functions can define message handlers to specify how they react to incoming messages. They can also send messages to other functions, triggering computations and facilitating communication. Lastly, the deployment API is, a, is crucial in deploy, deploying a stateful function application. It provides means to configure and deploy functions, message functions, instances, and handle 
fa failure scenarios. This API ensures default tolerance and transparent recovery in the case of failure. Now that we covered the key component of the API, so let's see the stateful functions in action through a simple example. Uh, imagine we are building a real world fraud detection system for a large commerce platform. We can model individual users as functions each maintaining its own state such as transaction history and a suspicious acti activity. Whether a new transaction occurs, the system can send messages to corresponding user functions. The user function using its state can predefine logic and can determine if the transaction potentially fraudulent and responds accordingly, such as blocking the transaction or rising an alert. By utilizing stateful functions, we can easily scale our, fr our fraud detection system and to handle millions of users concurrently, each user function operates independently and can dynamically scale based on the workload, ensuring the efficient and responsive fraud detection. Well, that brings us to the end of this uh, video about uh, stateful functions in Apache Flink. I hope this video was informative to you and you learned something from it. If you have any question, put it down in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.